establishing tribal liaisons and all these new offices. We are um, working uh, so hard, like I said on yesterday, on training, on uh, working with these new positions, tying these folks together with our uh, internal tribal uh, energy steering committee that meets every two weeks and is sharing our meetings with tribes, our best practices, so we're communicating with each other so that you're not talking to one office and then they're asking you to report on what the other office is doing. We, we hear you on that as well. We're going to try to be more coordinated. Uh, we are going to be more coordinated uh, as DOE. And um, not only that, but also uh, working uh, interagency. And um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're making those connections too. And we have uh, some of our, our partners from Interior, from the uh, Division of Energy and Minerals um, here as well in the room somewhere. If you're here, stand. <laughs> Maybe they're out in the hallway uh, helping helping folks out, but uh, they, they're here at the conference, and so we want to make those connections. And um, you know, another example of that is our tribal energy loan guarantee program, um, and and that we're really connected in with an interagency working group <clears throat> uh, to ensure that we're ironing out the wrinkles uh, and making sure we get that direct pay money out from Treasury, uh, and, and working an interagency effort there. I had mentioned the critical minerals challenges earlier and, and, and permitting reform, and so we are engaging on some interagency working groups uh, with Interior, and I think there's going to be some really uh, important findings coming out from that interagency working group uh, in the coming months. And, uh, you know, you, you all understand this better than anyone that we need, we need to act now because there's, there's so much at stake. This is a critical moment. We have this historic investment at this time. You've heard it from all the speakers yesterday. And uh, we, we truly need to act now. And, and something I, I wanted to share, just kind of, you know, looking, looking forward, um, I just uh, came in this position. I actually started it in May, but then I went on parental leave. I just uh, welcomed my first son into the world, uh, Albert Michael. <clears throat> we'll get a picture of him up, up there later. He's adorable. Or, or ask me for baby photos. I'm, I'm, I'm about it. But... Um, as we were preparing on, on Friday night, <laughs> pardon me, I'm a big teddy bear. I'm very emotional, so you know, emotional. I never thought I'd be so happy to see a, a government paper. Um, my wife sent me a photo, and it got <clears throat> the <clears throat> sorry. <sighs> His uh, certificate of enrollment. <laughs> so we welcomed a new member into the tribe. <laughs> I knew I had to put that towards the end because otherwise I was going to derail myself here. Woo! <laughs> so we're fighting for Oliver. You have your children, your grandchildren, your youth on your reservation. The Parma Energy, we have the tables out there too where we're talking about all the opportunities for. Uh, the STEM pipeline and how we're creating jobs and having our youth come back to our communities because that is a major challenge. I hear from tribal leaders, uh, you know, we're investing in providing scholarships, but then our youth leave and don't come back. And so how do we, how do we address that challenge? Well, we have a lot of uh, opportunities for virtual internships and, uh, you know, how are we uh, solar uh, workforce opportunities? We're going to hear more about that uh, from our, our uh, gener energy jobs director, Bethany Jones, later today and all those efforts. Um, we got to invest in, in our, our future and in, in, in their dreams and making sure we're having that seven generations uh, vision. And so, we're, yeah, we're going to kind of hearkening back to yesterday, have that one mind, um, dream big together, demonstrate together. What are, what are these pilots that we can, these models that we can create and build upon that then others can learn from? Then we can deploy together and we need to continue to learn together. And so this is just the beginning. We're going to continue as we, you know, get some concrete models. We're working on very exciting things around tribal power purchase and making sure that we're getting EV infrastructure into Indian country and uh, utility scale deployment. And we know that there's uh, nations in this room that are all different stages in that. And we want to make sure that we're connecting you. And uh, this is just the first of these convenings. And we would love to continue to hear your thoughts. My door is always open to you all. I want to know about how um, 
overall the department energy and, and not just the office any energy but all those offices um, can be working better with you if someone's not being responsive if there's a better way we can coordinate things i know there's a lot coming at you because of all these opportunities so how can we be communicating that in a more streamlined way uh, welcome your thoughts there and uh, want to make sure that we're working constantly on improving and, and leaving a legacy that we're institutionalizing tribal engagement uh, across the whole agency, um, across the administrations, and uh, building it better for the long term. Um, uh, yeah, how, how can now we, we not only improve our consultation, but catalyze and assist convening the right conversations and our follow-up items from today? I definitely welcome your thoughts on that. Please share that in the workshops you're in. Um, and, and making sure that we just seize this moment. And of course, I always love to like throw some Hamilton on and get inspired and not throw away our shot. So let's not throw away our shot. Let's figure out how we can seize this moment at this critical time and do it. Um, I had one uh, immediate next step. And, and so just uh, this is for, for California folks in the room. Um, on Thursday, we're gonna be having a, a meeting uh, with uh, the California Public Utility Commission, uh, Governor's Office, some of the representatives and, at uh, uh, the Department of Energy headquarters. And so uh, we are welcoming uh, tribal governments uh, to, to join in, um, whether in person or, or virtually to that. So please, uh, if you're interested, you're from California, um, please, uh, I don't know if we have uh, Ken in the room, if Ken wants to stand up. I'm also, oh, Ken's right there in the middle. Great, so yeah, make sure you engage with Ken or myself, um, and especially if you want to be in person, uh, please try to get to us before noon so that we can uh, make sure that you have uh, building access and, and we can uh, have you involved in that, that meeting tomorrow morning at 9 to 1030. Um, so with that, uh, that, that concludes my remarks, but I, I want to uh, invite, um, uh, unfortunately, Tracy Lebeau, uh CEO and Administrator of the Western Power Administration, couldn't uh, join us in person today. But um, she's also the first director of the Indian Energy Office, and she's uh, shared a video uh, remarks uh, to share to, to welcome you all to day two. And uh, so I'll turn it over to our AV folks to share that message. Good day, everybody. I am Tracy Lebeau, and I'm a member of the Shining River Sioux Tribe, and I'm the administrator and CEO for Western Area Power Administration. For those of you a little less familiar with BAPA, we are part of the Department of Energy and are pleased to participate in this Tribal Clean Energy Summit. Many of you are our customers. Wapa markets and delivers federal hydropower and transmission services to over 700 wholesale customers across 15 western states, most of whom are municipal utilities, cities and towns, military bases, electric cooperatives, and well over 100 tribal governments and or tribal utilities. WAPA is a $1.2 billion a year utility business, but we're also a federal agency. We're comprised of professionals ranging from energy marketers to grid operators to line and communications engineers and a plethora of other professionals who work tirelessly 24 7 365 to keep the lights on for over 40 million Americans in the West. I mention all of this to put into context the operational environment in which we exist as we own and operate and we maintain over 17,000 miles of high voltage transmission. We're the backbone of the Western grid with hundreds of miles of transmission infrastructure running through the Indian country. We operate every day in close collaboration with tribal governments and particularly tribal environmental and historic preservation officers with whom we partner to do things such as responding to emergencies, to plan routes and construction projects, and provide our high-level technical views on interconnections when requested. As a utility business, we get historically around 7% of our operating budget from Congress through appropriations. So we depend on our customers, including many of you, through rates for the rest of our budget. So many like you, we are tracking on this incredible once-in-generation opportunity to expand infrastructure for the future and are actively discussing our future role and plans with customers and stakeholders. Imagining what our future looks like to leverage opportunities, but to also operationally calibrate 
to this incredible amount of clean energy coming on to our grid. We are also in the midst of extreme weather. From wildfire to drought to extreme storms, we are planning and exploring ways to harden our grid, to make it more resilient to climate change and keep the lights on. Like you, we get how sustainable economies need to be built on a foundation of infrastructure to succeed having access to low-cost energy, adequate broadband, water and wastewater systems, and transportation systems are all a cornerstone for any community to grow and thrive. We get it because the customers we serve are largely rural and small communities, and we live and our families live in the communities we serve. This once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, once-in-a-generation opportunity to begin arranging these building blocks is now for many of you. Over the course of this summit, I would encourage you to explore the resources and technical systems available to you through DOE offices like the new Grid Deployment Office, Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, Office of Electricity, Green Resilience Programs, and funding our national labs just to name a few. This is an optimal time to begin exploring partnerships with each other and also the department's wealth of technical expertise and explore best practices. Speaking of which, I wanted to share with you all today, I am announcing that after 45 years, WAPA is establishing a tribal intergovernmental affairs office. We will be advertising this senior position through our normal channels, but I also wanted to explore the possibilities that perhaps our best candidate to lead this new function as we start down this path together might be an opportunity to bring in tribal employees as a detail through intergovernmental personnel agreements or something similar. This is an idea that came to me through our friend Peter Pitt, the general manager for the Shanghai Bands and the Utility. Perhaps there is a way to be found to detail a tribal employee in to help us, and they can in turn get to know the utility business. So please keep an eye out for our website for that future opportunity. And I want to end by amplifying what Director Johns and her fabulous team at Indian Energy are highlighting at this event. That together we have come a long way, and this is a once-a-generation moment that could be the culmination of many tribal energy dreams. This special moment in history calls upon all of us to build bridges to meet our common climate challenges with current new tools. At the same time, we must find ways to accelerate innovation in Indian country and Alaska. We can only do this by increasing our knowledge and building new partnerships. I want to thank you again for allowing me to join you today and for allowing us to serve so many of your communities with reliable, affordable, and sustainable hydropower. It is an honor and privilege we are grateful for and government to government and customer relationship we treasure. So thank you. <laughs> Another person on my team to work with, yes, <laughs> not alone. Uh, so uh, before we uh, head into a break here and, and kick off our, our 9 a.m. Uh, program, uh, for those of you who didn't know, I was a University of Wisconsin cheerleader. I would do a cartwheel, but I gained a little weight and these pants might split. So we're not going to do that for you. But in lieu of that, all right, I need this half of the room. Give me an N. N. The middle half. Er. This half of the room, G. G. N, er, G. N, er, G. N, er, G. N, er, G. Woo! Let's do it. Let's have a great summit day two, folks. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go a little break and then we'll get kicked off at 9 a.m. Tribal leaders will be in the session over there and then we'll have a, a public track presentation. Uh, we'll have a great uh, round table for you uh, here uh, this morning uh, with uh, Karen Skelton, the Aspen Institute, and uh, a tribal colleges, colleges and universities representatives. So uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.
Good morning. I'd like to invite our uh, speakers to, to join us up on the stage or join me on the stage. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Conrad. I'm the Deputy Director for the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs and also an Osage citizen. And the Osage Nation is in Northeast Oklahoma. Originally, uh, Osage territory. Uh, was quite expansive, but you could say um, it was located in Missouri, uh, one of the ancient uh, largest uh, urban centers in North America is very uh, closely related to um, ancient Osage uh, society, and that's Cahokia in Southern Illinois, just across the river from uh, Missouri, I mean, from St. Louis. And, Gary Davis at the National Center used to bring up Cahokia because it was an inspiration uh, to um, businesses and entrepreneurs to show that there was a vast uh, continental wide trade network that existed and that that uh, proud heritage is something that we can um, uh, claim and um, uh, strive to uh, perhaps replicate in a modern era with new technologies and um, new thoughts, but staying true to many of the uh, uh, cultural lessons and, and histories that we have today. So I just thought I'd mention, mention that as an interesting uh, side note, because this, this panel is a little bit different than the other panels. Uh, a lot of the other panels are about uh, offices at the Department of Energy uh, Resources and Technology Deployment. And this one is a little bit of a, a pause to say and to ask the question and engender a dialogue after the presentations about what, is, what does this mean? Where are we in this inflection point that Ali Zaidi mentioned early in his speech? And he also mentioned uh, it's not just about uh, power on electric transmission lines, but it's power amongst people. And that's also another important aspect of the panel that's going to be uh, discussing issues here today associated with everything that's going on. So you, you see all of the um, manifestations of the legislation in the Department of Energy and ourselves organizing around that to do our uh, duty to implement the law faithfully. But we're, we're, it's undeniable that we're having an impact on society as well as we do that. So. Um, we didn't want to have a tribal energy summit that just uh, ignored that uh, or didn't um, mention that or uh, offer an opportunity for people to think about that as well. So um, on the panel, um, we have uh, everybody has the bios in, in their packets so they can read the whole, the whole bios, but um, everybody is very familiar with uh, Derek. Um, he has been 
uh, leading the di dialogue um, so far uh, in this in this track. Um, but uh, to show how interesting the Department of Energy is, I, I met Derek the first time when he was serving as the tribal liaison for the, uh, the Clinton administration at the Department of Energy. And we've maintained the connection and contact throughout the years and, and partnered on many things. And when we we're designing this, um, uh, th this summit, it seemed uh, a natural fit that Derek uh, play an integral role again um, in this uh, in this summit. So Derek is a connection through the Department of Energy. Uh, Greg Gershuni, I met Greg uh, in the Obama administration, and um, he's currently working at the Aspen Institute as Executive Director for Energy in, a, in the Environment Program. And he was uh, Chief of Staff for the U.S. Department of Energy's um, Policy and Systems Analysis Office under Secretary Moniz and Melanie Kinderdine. And that was a new office. That was an attempt at innovation and I think another attempt at helping explain and analyze the why and, and where and what uh, is going on and not just uh, the technical aspects of, of things. They uh, were responsible for the Quadrennial Energy Review uh, which was an uh, enormous undertaking. I also met um, Adam Cohen um, at the Department of Energy. He was, um, I would say, uh, at the time when I was acting, he was um, uh, in, the, in my chain of command as uh, a supervisor. But we've uh, main, maintained uh, contact, and he was the Deputy Undersecretary for Science and Energy at the Department of Energy under the Obama administration. So again, another connection that we've maintained um, post um, Obama years and um, in, an, in and out and around uh, the Department of Energy, it's kind of a beehive of uh, connections. And that's the other thing that I'd like to point out is that um, this summit is uh, engendering uh, these connections and they're as valuable as the information that you're receiving. So. Uh, respect them and and uh, cherish them and maintain them, care for them because um, as Tracy mentioned, um, to rise to the occasion, to up our game, it's gonna take leveraging uh, new resources and building new partnerships. You can't do more if you're already doing everything you can by just doing it harder. You know, you really need partners and surround yourselves with smart people and, uh, and their connections and their networks to learn more and to be able to raise your game and to rise to this occasion. It really challenges all of us to um, achieve new heights uh, with these resources and this opportunity and the challenge that we have. And then we also have um, Karen Skelton, who I've just recently met at the Department of Energy and she's with the Secretary's Office and is um, involved in um, uh, some very interesting and unique uh, projects, uh, including uh, the new Energy Foundation and um, uh, some other things that she will uh, uh, be talking about in her presentation. So with that, I just wanted to um, say that, you know, we are at uh, in the inflection point that Ali mentioned in his opening remarks. Um, and with leveraging the resources and and uh, making these connections, um, the inflection point is also somewhat like a bifurcation point. We can go from hot water to boiling if we take advantage of these opportunities and leverage the connections and build these partnerships. We can change the game uh, through the human connection and capacity building that we're doing here, investing in the so in the social capital. So. Um, uh, people are going to uh, discuss the work that they're doing in this space, and then we're inviting um, some dialogue between panelists and the audience as well. So it's not really just, um, you know, how do I qualify? Am I eligible? You know, where do I apply? Uh, it's really about um, what is going on? What does this mean? Uh, where are the strategic connections? What do I need to understand uh, to successfully navigate this in a way that keeps our communities together um, and and builds that wealth and, and jobs and prosperity for all of us. So 
Um, with that, I will um, turn it over to uh, Karen Skelton, who is going to lead us off. Thank you. Very much. Oh my gosh! Look how tall he is. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to uh, tell you how humbled I am to have been invited by my good friend, Director Wahela Johns, to be here today. And how about that, um, Matt uh, Dannenberg? I mean, my gosh. He is one of the most joyful uh, presences at the Department of Energy. So I am I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I, and I want to say, since I'm so moved by hearing um, everybody's tribal affiliation, um, that I feel that my spiritual tie to your land and your, and you, and your sovereign nations is my uh, spiritual relationship to the Sierras. I'm from uh, California. I live in Sacramento, and I've spent a lot of time uh, in, in that area, and I feel um, that my passion for climate change has been derived from there. So I, I just wanted to share that about myself. This is my second tour of duty in the federal government. I worked in the uh, eight years in the Clinton-Gore administration. I was a prosecutor at the Department of Justice um, and worked in environmental enforcement. I was um, also at the White House for four years as a political director to both Al Gore, where I learned a lot about uh, environmental issues and climate change, and then I was a political director to President Clinton, and I ended up at the Department of Transportation as the chief counsel of the Federal Highway Administration. Um, and so now I'm back working with my good friend and the great leader, Secretary Granholm, who told me that she loved being here yesterday, that she learned so much from the conversation that you had, uh, that, that the tribal leaders had with her. And as Matt said earlier, we are going to follow up and we do hear you. So um, having said all of that, I wanna tell you that I'm gonna speak a little bit about the scaffolding that the federal government has set up around energy communities and climate uh, change. So let's go to the first, let's, oh, I'm, the, I'm moving this. How funny is that? Okay, here we go. Here we go. So the first point uh, uh, of uh, interaction that this presidency has had with climate change happened in the first month of the president's tenure when he signed the executive order uh, 14008, which established both the um, Justice 40 program and also established an interagency working group on what we call energy communities. It was a group that um, was convened by his direction to uh, identify all resources in the federal government that could come to bear in communities where coal and power plants and oil and gas were the basis of the economic activity in those places. And the directive was leave no one behind as we transition to a clean energy economy. And so my first assignment in the federal government in January of 2021 was to work with the National Economic Council, um, the Office of Climate Policy, which now Ali Zaidi heads up, and uh, under the direction of Secretary Granholm to stand up this working group um, and to uh, figure out how to work with all communities that were defined as energy communities um, and bring resources to them uh, so that they could develop economic uh, vitality and, 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 um, and sustainability. So here is a map of these uh, energy communities. And my biggest point here is that many energy communities as we define them are also tribal nations. Um, we identified 25 priority energy communities. They were defined by communities that were, um, uh, whose a percentage of jobs were um, based on coal, uh, the coal economy, either recently or currently, 
and that definition is planned to be expanded to oil and gas communities as well. Um, you can see where they are circled on the map, the Northern Rocky Mountains, the um, Four Corners, the Mid-Continental uh, Gulf Coast, the Illinois Basin, Appalachia, and of course, Alaska. Um, in, in, um, in, in conjunction with identifying these places, um, and these places have, there's 25 priority energy communities, there's 75 counties, um, and in addition, we identified a clearinghouse. We established and stood up a clearinghouse um, to uh, capture funding oppor opportunities associated with them. I'm going to show you another map here, which is really interesting. This is a map that shows energy communities overlapped with tribal lands. So if you look at the places that are purple, hash, hash marked in purple, those are all the tribal lands in the uh, country. And if you look at the purple hash marks on anything that's green or colored, those are energy communities. So where there is an overlap, uh, there is an overlap. <laughs> the energy communities and your nations um, overlap and therefore qualify for much of the funding that is identified out of the, uh, the IRA and the bill and the uh, rescue plan that has recently been passed by Congress. So here is just a snapshot of the clearinghouse and what it contains. And by the way, the, uh, the website for this is energycommunities.gov. Um, there's almost $200 billion uh, identified in funding that qualifies uh, for deployment into these energy communities, 188 planned opportunities, which are, you know, FOAs and those kinds of things that you know about. Um, 12 agencies are involved, so this is not just a DOE thing, obviously, DOI, EPA, DOL, Treasury, Commerce, there, there are many agencies um, contributing to this, and there, um, and as you can see at the bottom, at the, almost the very bottom, $250 billion in IRA Act money is coming uh, to this clearinghouse soon as we identify the different um, uh, programs on which it can be spent. So just this gives you a, just a quick look at some of the things that I'm talking about here um, that come from the, the credits and the loans. This is the, again, the scaffolding for which um, the programs in uh, climate will be funded uh, on in energy communities. So $250 billion for redeveloping and repurposing um, infrastructure, the word repurposing is really important in everything that we're doing right now at the Department of Energy because we're looking at assets, infrastructure, like like you you know about that you have depended on. They can be, um, you know, refineries, they can be uh, coal mines, they can be roads, um, things that uh, are now going to be used in the new energy economy, and there's funding to help you to, to help you transition their use. Um, the tax credits, of course, these clean energy projects that are being run out of Treasury, the four billion dollars in clean energy manufacturing tax credits. This has a huge carve out for energy communities and, in particular, coal communities. Um, and just quickly going through that there's a black lung disability trust fund that labor's running eight billion dollar green bank for energy communities uh 2.8 billion dollar in grants for energy communities run by epa and then 145 million tribal electrification program which i'm sure you've already heard a lot about i just want to spend a moment on this slide because i think it's really important um because and I, somebody mentioned it earlier, but how are communities, how are your nations going to thrive while we also transition? I mean, it's, it's the most important question. How do you let go of an industry that you have so depended on and still be successful as you transition into a new economy? And um, here are some of the things that we are working with communities on 
um, and hearing from uh, communities and nations about what is uh, what the elements of success are. So first of all, this idea about repurposing for, no, for new industries. As you know, and, and, and as we're working with industries across the world who are now excited about coming to the United States and investing here, um, and even not excited, but we're trying to excite to come to the United States and invest and invest in, in your nations. Um, the existing infrastructure is critically important. Transportation, for example, access to roads, rail, ports, and waterways. And if you don't have that, um, how can you get it to, uh, to attract or keep industry? Um, transmission, of course, pre-existing pre direct grid connection at the power plants, water and existing access and water rights permits. Some of the existing infrastructure that attracts the um, new industry, clean energy industry. And then, you know, I, th I think of this next piece, this options for evolution, like the uh, like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Every room you walk into is a, ma a magical new place where new jobs can be created under the right circumstances with nuclear, hydrogen, battery and energy storage, solar and wind, thermal, carbon storage. I mean, the, the menagerie of technologies that are poised to create the next economy are, are here. Um, and we're funding them in, at, at the Department of Energy. I just want to kind of end on this, I, this uh, case study that I've been working really hard on with the White House and, and uh, members of Congress, the state of California, um, and most importantly, um, the tribes and the, uh, and the local elected officials in the Imperial County region. I don't know if anybody here is from this, is anybody here from the Salton Sea area? Hi. Yeah, <laughs> I can hardly see you, but you'll you'll know here, and you correct me if I'm wrong on this. But you know, this is a place that has um, a, a, a enormous amount of potential to create uh, to produce lithium, um, and the department is studying it right now at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory to see just how much lithium is there, what the quality of it is, and and how it can be. Um, uh, extracted, processed locally, kept in the United States, and turned into critical minerals for battery production. Um, it could hold enough lithium to, to uh, supply the entire world's um, battery uh, production and America's domestic battery needs. And, when, and together what we did with this community is we helped pass a piece of legislation in California this year that it imposed an excise tax on the companies for extracting the lithium and requires a percentage of that tax to go back to the community for community benefits that will be defined by the community, including the tribes. So this is a very complicated, as you know, all of these kinds of projects are a set of interests from the federal, the state, the tribes, the communities, the industries, but we're moving forward on it. And I, and I wanted to just throw it out as an example of something that's working and uh, that we're working with tribes on um, in this new uh, framework of energy economies within the clean uh, energy uh, transition. So that is it. I want to say here's sharing information, as David said. Um, energycommunities.gov will get you to the clearinghouse. Follow us on social media. Uh, call anytime. And I want to just thank you so much for um, inviting this presentation and let you know, again, how grateful I am to be here on behalf of the Secretary Granholm. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, and now we're going to have uh, Adam Cohen uh, talk a little bit about uh, his work in critical minerals as well. So. All right, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I really appreciate it. So let me start by saying I have a concern. 
we have opportunities, and here's what we're doing about it. So that's basically the summary of my speech. So I have a concern. So we heard a lot about the need for critical minerals. Without question, we need more critical minerals. If we intend to transition through the green energy process, whether it's lithium for batteries, whether it's copper for transmission, whether it's steel for new rail and new roads, we need the critical minerals. So that's, I don't think is anybody would have a question about that. The concern I have is that if we extract the minerals and we process them using the same processes that we did use, we're just gonna end up in the same place that we've been in the past. Environmental issues, other issues, determining where capacity might be, offshoring, et cetera. And my concern is that unless we really focus on making the most of the opportunity, we're going to miss the opportunity. So that's the concern. So what do we do about this? Where's my, oh, there we go. Uh, the opportunities are now, you know, so clearly there is a national and economic security issue because we need more minerals. And I would submit that if we can do this cleanly, clean mining, clean processing, clean uh, distribution, clean recycling, then actually that can enable our national and economic security, but it can also drive the capacity that we want. And I think the key here is through innovation. So that's the second point, the opportunities for innovation to drive this economy and workforce development are there. And I think the opportunities are certainly ripe for the tribes to drive this collaboration. So how do I do this? So let me start by going a little more in detail about this. National and economic security. So minerals, whether it's primary metals, copper, iron, aluminum, whether it's the so-called critical minerals, lithium, rare earths, et cetera, they're needed. So in terms of energy security, as I said, the green energy transition requires more minerals. National security. Clearly, there's a question about where the sourcing of these materials will come from. We saw this in terms of the supply chain. We see this not just in terms of where the minerals are, but where they get processed and how they get shipped. You know, every bit of that adds to not just a national security concern, but it also adds emissions into the system, such that you know, by the time you buy an electric vehicle, for example, that battery has traveled many, many miles and has caused lots of emissions even before you drive it off the lot. So that's a, a national security concern. Economic drivers. The idea of leveraging materials to get economic benefit, including workforce benefit, it is certainly something we've been living with and, and enjoying throughout the whole history of this country. However, what I would submit is we need to do this better. And better needs to be defined to include more equitable, more just, more environmentally benign, and more equal in terms of the opportunity. So I have no problem with saying we need to do things better, but we, this is what I think better needs to include. Without question, we need to embrace and really exploit what's called the circular economy. So the whole idea of let's recycle more, let's keep putting that back into the system. 100% agree, there is no question. The problem is that, at least I don't think, not mining, is not an option if we are going to maintain our path on this very aggressive timeline to green the economy and get to net zero emissions. So I, I think it's right that we absolutely should recycle. And part of this is let's recycle without causing emissions, without using excess water, without generating excess waste from even the recycling. But let's not ignore that we also intelligently need to get minerals out of the ground. So innovation, we, we've heard a lot about infrastructure. I think infrastructure is incredibly important. What I don't think is often appreciated is that infrastructure, rails, road, wires for transmission, infrastructure should also include an innovation ecosystem. An innovation ecosystem that actually drives the combination of economic development and workforce development and takes advantage of the resources in an, a region, in a, an ecosystem that actually is a very important part of infrastructure. And if we do that, then we'll actually end up with capacity in that region 
to continue to grow that local region, whatever the local might happen to be. It could be the Salton Sea, it could be a state, it could be a, a broader area, it could be a major part of Indian country. But that to me is an important aspect. So on the, on the left, you see the technology readiness levels. I'm not gonna go into the details here. You saw a little bit about this yesterday. Suffice to say that if you think about how you take an innovation from an idea to a commodity or a marketable service that is available to actually result in both revenue for a company as well as changing the paradigm, reducing emissions, reducing water use, et cetera, then it has to go through some kind of cycle like this. So TRL 1 through 9 was originally defined by NASA. Uh, you don't have to go into the details, but if you look at the top of the chart, 1, 2, 3, maybe into 4, is what we would consider the early stage, maybe up until a lab scale innovation. So you got an idea, you create a product, you make it on the bench scale, it works. You'd say, okay, well, now I got to scale it up. Now I want to deploy it. So then you get to technology running this level nine. Companies are very interested in things that work at that level because their risk is known. They know what the market might be. They know how to deploy it. They know how to get it out there. So that's great. The problem is between say four and a half, which is like the end of the university strength, to nine, maybe eight and a half, there's a gap. And this gap is either called the valley of death in research or the mountain of opportunity if you are an optimist. So in either case, the innovation system is designed to take those lab scale ideas and get them to the point where they're in engineering scale so they can be deployed. So that to me is the focus of say a regional innovation ecosystem. How do you do that intelligently? How do you evaluate the risks? How do you make sure that you're bridging these gaps between them? And on the right, it's just a graph to show that the reason companies are very interested in, in the later stage in deployment is because that's when they get their revenue. There's a revenue sink if you are at the early stage of development because you're not getting anything from it. And so that's why they would love to have things handed to them and say, okay, yes, we want to deploy it. So we have an opportunity generally, collectively, to focus on making that innovation ecosystem generate stuff that already meets the criteria we want. And again, if I go back to better being defined as more efficient, more effective, reduce waste, reduce water use, but also more equitable, more just, et cetera, then we're giving a solution that can be deployed and meet all the criteria that we want. So that's a general premise. So I think there's a great opportunity Yes, I think there's a great opportunity. And let me just tell you a little bit about what we're doing to try to capture the whole idea of how do we push the clean upstream, meaning how do we get to clean mining, reduced emissions, reduced water, reduced waste, so that everybody can have the minerals that they need to drive the green energy revolution without causing further impact. So, I want to focus on the bottom four bullets. And AUI is a nonprofit private contractor. So you can look in the bio. AUI originally stood for Associated Universities Inc. It was stood up in 1946. Uh, we are not an association. We don't have any universities that are involved in this. Let's just say it's a poorly named nonprofit. But it's <laughs> AUI is a contractor. We've been a contractor for the federal government since 1946. So we established four activities. So the first one, the Center for Greening the Supply Chain, this is generally just our framework for how we're thinking about how do we green the supply chain all the way back to the mineral resource. Let me skip to the third because I think that's gonna help frame the second and the fourth. The Instituto Chileno de Tecnologias Limpia. So this is a proposal that we submitted in Chile to stand up a regional innovation ecosystem in the northern part of Chile. So let me see if this rings familiar. Chile, if you've ever been there, you probably know this, but the northern part of Chile is the highest, driest desert in the world. It has a tremendous resource for lithium. It is the world's largest supplier of copper. It has indigenous tribes, the, the Mapuchen and others, it has very disparate economic development. Lots of development in Santiago, which is the capital, very little development in the northern part of the area. So they also have a tremendous resource of solar. They have solar incidence that is you know, 
like the canonical metaphor, is the Saudi Arabia of solar for the world. They have the largest solar incidence on the planet. How can you take that opportunity, solar in the north, use the direct electric heat and generation of clean fuels, hydrogen, ammonia, et cetera, use that to reduce emissions from mining such that Chile can have more lithium, more copper to provide not just for their own needs, but also for the rest of the world, do so and drive their economic development, including the workforce development in the north. That's the challenge. That's what we put in a proposal for, and we won. And then there were legal challenges, and so now we're going through a whole process to determine that we actually did win. So put that aside, but that model, that concept, my first thought when I was writing this proposal is, why aren't we doing this in the US? Why isn't there a US clean mining institute? I spent a lot of years, I spent close to 30 years in the Department of Energy labs and the Department of Energy. I have nothing but the highest respect for this enterprise, 100% without question. But they can't do everything and they don't do everything. And so I thought, here's a gap where if we could do something, we might be able to fill that gap and actually get to clean mining for this country for the benefit of all the green energy. So the US Center for Mining Extraction, our concept was, can we make this a privately driven public-private partnership? Companies getting together, there's strength in numbers, there's strength in scale. So let's go and find out how we can collect the risk such that you can drive these innovations up the TRL scale and get them deployed. And the last one is an opportunity that I think you should know about. It's the National Science Foundation has something called a Regional Innovation Engines Opportunity. The idea is pick a region and focus on a discipline and use that as an engine to drive economic development and workforce development in that region. So we chose the Southwest. We're working with the University of Arizona, University of Utah, Navajo Technical University, and several others. We chose clean mining so that we can focus on the mineral extraction, but also the processing and the recycling and the use, and use that to drive innovation in the Southwest through clean, well, clean mining or clean materials. That of, uh, opportunity is available and it's open now and we're putting in a proposal in January. So if you have interest in either the US Center for Mining and Extraction or the NSF Regional Innovation Engine proposal we're pursuing, please talk to us. We, are, we would welcome it. We wanna make this a strong engine. We wanna make it a robust opportunity. So Matt Schaub, who is on my team, is here. He will be here and please reach out, but also the email is on the first page. And lastly, I'll end with, so who is AUI? As I said, we're a poorly named contractor, but we are a contractor that runs federally funded research development centers for the National Science Foundation. We ran Brookhaven National Lab for 50 years. We run large scale radio astronomy facilities. We are the best in class in this country in the world for radio astronomy. We produce the best facilities and we provide the best information for astronomers to look at the universe from the radio spectrum. So what does this have to do with innovation and ecosystem? Very simply, I look at it as we are in a very real sense taking an idea from a cocktail napkin stage, designing, building, operating and maintaining facilities that can produce data and drive training opportunities and workforce development for astronomers. So translate that to, it doesn't have to be an astronomy observatory, it could be a high bay that generates scale up of materials. It doesn't have to be graduate students for astronomy, it could be technicians for uh, other opportunities in clean energy. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And uh, Greg, I'm just gonna turn it over to you, so please welcome Greg Gershini. All right, um, let's get our slides up. There we go. I'm Greg Gershuni. I'm the executive director of the Energy and Environment Program at the Aspen Institute. Uh, I'm also a uh, recovering Department of Energy employee, as David mentioned, um, and a former Obama White House staffer, um, where I was for seven years uh, during during the Obama administration. I want to thank David for uh, inviting me and um, letting me be part of this. So. My program at the Aspen Institute works with people, organizations, and governments to take greater action on climate change. That's our mission. 
the Aspen Institute's an education organization. We um, have prod programs on uh, ranging from criminal justice reform to education to financial security. And so the energy and environment program is one piece of that. Um, I wanna recognize uh, my colleague, Nikki Petrie, who's here. She's the executive director for the Center for Native American Youth. And last week she was named uh, Goodwill Ambassador for the UN Mountain Partnership, where she's gonna advise the UN uh, on sustainable mountain communities. Congratulations, Nikki. Um, we, we all know a few things. Increased greenhouse gas pollution is warming the planet. It's threatening people and culture and ecosystems, um, as well as geopolitical stability. And today we're seeing mega fires in the West and rapidly intensifying hurricanes in the Gulf and an unprecedented drought in the Colorado River Basin. We need a worldwide transition to clean, safe, accessible, affordable, and reliable energy. And this is complex and requires steady and staged progress. Um, too often, the challenges um, are kind of pitted against each other um, and they're slow by divisions between nations and governments at all levels, as well as the private sector, nonprofits, and advocates. Um, at risk are the people and the communities that, who need the solutions now. So the Aspen Institute works on these problems across the board um, and the impacts on the communities as a result of climate change has become one of our main priorities as an organization. Now, my program's work revolves around three main areas, greenhouse gas mitigation and energy policy, adaptation and community resilience, and building relationships for cooperation. Um, the way we think about it is, if the 90s and 2000s were about climate science and whether humans were causing global warming, the 2010s were about governments making long-term goals and big commitments to taking action, punctuated by the Paris Agreement and the Glasgow Climate Conference. But the 2020s and the 2030s are going to be about building those solutions. It's going to be about turning our gaze towards the future, and moving towards a more sustainable way of living, starting with clean electricity. Um, and so what I want to talk about are three things that are either going to be enablers or barriers to the clean energy transition. The first is the speed and scale um, at which we deploy the solutions. The second is critical minerals. I think um, we've already heard a lot about that this morning. Um, and then the final one is about building relationships for cooperation and how to build the trust um, to get where we're going. So the clean energy transitions on its way just since 2005 we've doubled the production of renewable energy in the US from 8.8% to 20%. The costs of technologies have come down dramatically 90% in solar PV 72% um, in onshore wind and a lot of this is due to the investments by DOE in technology innovation, as well as scaling up production and deployment over the last decade. Now, especially with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the build out of the last decade is gonna look like a blip on the map um, in the history of energy production. Um, I'm sure um, we've already heard a lot about the IRA, so I just wanna reinforce the historic moment um, that this is. And if implemented well, it's gonna spark a rapid shift towards clean energy. Um, so overall modeling by Princeton's Zero Lab shows that the IRA is going to decrease emissions by about 40% um, by 2030, which is about a 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but that's not enough. Our goal that we took to Glasgow was a 50% reduction by 2030. So and what that leaves is that we still need to do more. Um, and whether that's in electricity or transportation or industrial decarbonization is very to be determined but we need to find another 10% of emissions before the end of the decade. Um, and what the actual build out of the IRA looks like depends on a lot of things. It can range from a huge amount of solar uh, and onshore wind um, over the next 13 years to a much more limited build out. And so these are two scenarios um, depending on transmission expansion um, that Princeton put together that shows the um, the different scenarios that we uh, that we can see between the two, um, and it's a it's a pretty huge difference. It's between you know 450 gigawatts of solar um, over the next 13 years compared to only 200, which is still a lot compared to the 130 that we have now. It's 188 more gigawatts of wind compared to 54, um, and so where how we build this out, the speed and the scale is going to matter a lot. 
there's going to be other surprises that pop up um, and change the direction of where we're going and change the speed. Some of this is going to be additional technology, R&D, Adam mentioned some of those things. Um, advanced nuclear, CCS, hydrogen um, are all going to be competing to get to cost parity with uh, other technologies that uh, to be competitive. Communities are best positioned to make the decisions on the solutions for their issues and have to be empowered to develop projects in their own backyards, including developers um, locally to help build clean energy infrastructure can enable a new more and diverse workforce to foster community wealth creation. So the other primary benefit of the transition is going to be jobs. This is some modeling again by Princeton on um, jobs that the IRA adds to the US between now and 2035. And so we're looking at 2.3 million additional jobs um, that would be created if not for this law. There's going to be largely in grid, solar and wind. Um, and this is a tremendous boon for the economy. And many of these jobs are going to be distributed in the communities um, around, across the country where these new resources are being deployed and developed. And so it'll do more to benefit the communities. So the second area I want to talk about is critical minerals. Um, this is going to largely depend, uh, d determine the success or failure of the clean energy transition. Um, meeting, meeting the IEA's net zero goals by 2050 is going to require an enormous amount of these minerals. Critical minerals as a share of global energy related trade, it's going to increase from 10% today to 50% of all trade by 2050. And disruption for a lot of these materials um, are anticipated by 2030 and probably sooner. They're used by numerous technologies in the energy sector, and there's competition for them in other sectors like for phones and other high tech products. And even within the clean energy sector, competition, competition is going to be fierce. For example, EVs competing with renewables, um, as well as uh, uh, other technologies competing with each other. Um, here you see large amounts of critical minerals needed for clean tech like offshore wind, um, onshore wind, solar, nuclear. Copper, zinc, silicon, and rare earths are going to be in demand over the coming years. And over the last couple of decades, and the, one of the reasons that DOE was set up like it is, is because we've spent a lot of time worrying about a few countries that control a relatively small amount of oil around the world. Um, this work by Columbia University shows that the top three countries in oil and gas control less than half the world's supply of those fossil fuels. And so for many of the critical minerals, um, the top three countries control a much higher proportion of the markets. And some are in problematic areas that are ripe for human rights issues, such as China and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, the, and the processing of these materials is similarly concentrated in just a few countries, and especially in China. So we need to think about this and get ahead of these issues. Um, we're seeing demand in the US for many of these, but there's a lot of disagreements about the best path forward on critical minerals. Adam talked a little bit about this and the need for better technologies and processes for mining and processing uh, critical minerals. Um, and we're gonna have to come up with um, a, a strategy uh, for the nation um, that balances the need of clean energy transition with environmental concerns and community concerns. The push to secure critical minerals for the transition is going to raise a lot of questions around these issues um, over the coming years. Um, one of the things that we're going to have to deal with is we're operating under a mining law that was written in 1872 and hasn't really been reformed since then. Um, and that has led the metals um, industry to become one of the largest sources of toxic pollution in the US and the communities that suffer most are rural low income um, and Native American and so the vast majority of US reserves needed for batteries um, are close to Native American land and uh, uh, I think Karen showed the the slide of the overlap between the um, energy areas um, and the tribal land and so I think we need to um, work on the the poor political conditions related to permitting and consultation the same old extraction processes business models and governance frameworks that got us into this mess aren't going to be the ones to get us out so um, i want to turn to the last thing which is building relationships for cooperation um, this is the foundation of all the work that we do um, in my program and um, one of our participants last year 
uh, said the phrase, progress moves at the speed of trust. And I want to echo that here. Mm -hmm. When parties sit down for the first time, trust isn't automatic. And in a lot of situations, um, there's a trust deficit from the beginning because of previous bad actions. In the energy space, we know this well. There's a lot of companies who just plainly haven't been good actors throughout their history. So to build up to the point where two groups or many groups can come to a consensus, trust has to be built between those groups. Um, but groups and organizations don't have feelings, right? Only people do. And so when I say building relationships for cooperation, it's really about those one-to-one -one relationships, getting to know someone um, as, as a person, rehumanizing and building very, very slowly the trust that has been absent previously. That's a really hard thing to do. And so in a lot of cases, and in a lot of cases, it's just not gonna happen. So um, I guess the one thing that I wanna um, take away is that we need to work on this. It's gonna be really hard, but building that trust is the only way that we're gonna solve the climate crisis. Um, and working with each other, putting in the time, putting in the effort, um, it's, it's, that's the way we can turn a corner as a species and start working with each other instead of against, um, if we wanna save ourselves from this crisis that we've created. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Craig. It's very uh, enlightening. I mean, the, the, the amount of information, the analysis that you've been able to bring forward is terrific. So I hope everybody's appreciating it. And also the, um, the, it, the live stream and the recording is going to be available not only to everybody here, but to uh, the tribal leader track as well. So if you know people over there that are missing this, encourage them to see the live stream and get a hold of the slides. So thank you for that. Now, uh, Derek, to um, not sum it up, but to bring in an additional perspective about um, energy, economy, jobs, and uh, strengthening the middle class on reservations and keeping communities together. So thank you. Thank you, David. And Yat A. Abine, good morning in Navajo. Um, I'm going to talk, as David said, about economies, uh, development in any country. And you know, one, one of the things that I've been hearing for the last couple of days is a lot of data. Uh, but when you get to any country and you start looking at data, data is very limited. And there's been a lot of discussion as to why um, a lot of information, you know, flows through the states, the counties. But when you look at a lot of the, the, the data sets out there, when you hit those reservation boundaries, there's a black hole. And so, so a lot of the information I'll talk to today is from, from my experience um, as, a, as a former a DOE alumni, um, as a former banker, I did a lot of commercial banking in any country, um, had the great opportunity of running a casino. Um, and then also, I'm the chairman of the board for the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development. And the National Center, uh, our, our goal has been to improve, enhance, and expand and build tribal economies. And so uh, when, when you look out in any country, um, we're still, in my opinion, behind. I've seen statistics and reports and those things that say Indian country is at least 20 years behind when it comes to things that you see in, you know, U.S. America, um, infrastructure, buildings, going down the street, you know, having access to you know, convenience stores, gas stations, malls, and I think everybody's dream on reservations to get a Walmart or a Target. I hear that, you know, all over Indian country. That's, that's our goal because, um, because um, a lot of us are used to going to town. For those of you from the reservation, you know, town is a big thing. And, and I think we see that in, in rural America. Uh, in any country, uh, we, we basically have very limited economic opportunities. And so some of the things that, that I've been hearing, is, for example, is economic leakage. And so I, I'm, I'm ecstatic and I am happy to see, you know, billions of dollars potentially will flow to any country. Um, but unfortunately, 
in my opinion, because we have limited infrastructures, we have limited economic development, most of those opportunities and the economic multiplier behind that is going to flow off reservations. Uh, there's stats that, that say that economic leakage in any country is more than 90%. So every dollar that is spent on a reservation leaves, you know, almost in a matter of minutes. So when you look at a lot of reservations around this country and you look at the nearby border towns, the dollars that flow to any country almost immediately impact and enhance and grow the border towns. In my area, on Navajo, Gallup, New Mexico, Flagstaff, Arizona, Page, Arizona, Farmington, New Mexico, they benefit and they will benefit from many of these dollars that are gonna flow to Navajo and other parts of any country. So what does that mean? You know, what, what do we do as tribal leaders, as business leaders, um, as government? Uh, one thing that, that I've noticed is that when we talk about economic development, I think sometimes we miss that. What is economic development? You know, what is development? And so David asked me to talk about, you know, what is the middle class? I'm not sure we have a middle class in Indian country. You know, uh, yeah, we, don't, we don't have it. So we have folks that are, when you look at the averages, in Indian country, the average medium salary income, it's low, you know, less than 18,000 a year. You know, average family size, six members, average household size, 20 per house. So we have a lot of shortages. We have, you know, in Indian country, the need for thousands of homes. In Indian country, we have the need for, because we have a huge energy deficit. Many homes on reservations um, have no access to water, no access to electricity. COVID highlighted many, many of these deficiencies. That's why in Indian country, we had high levels on a per capita basis of COVID because we didn't have access to running water. We didn't have access to electricity. We were unable, you know, to deploy the health curricula or the health um, uh, uh, solutions so that we won't get COVID. And so in any country, I think one of the things that, that I, I see and that we try to talk about through the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development is what is economic development? So in my opinion, in my humble opinion from what I've been seeing in the last couple of decades is, you know, economic development in any country is we need to figure out how to induce and, and increase private investment. In any country right now, I think most of them know that the principal and primary industries are the tribes, the tribal enterprises, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and Indian Health Service. And yeah, you might have a you know, small gas station, maybe a McDonald's, maybe a trading post. We have a lot of those you know, old trading posts. We still have that. Um, a couple of fast foods and a gas station convenience store. Some of us have casinos. But the ones that have casinos are actually near population centers. So in general, and I'm generalizing, in general, most of any country has a very, very limited private sector uh, industry area. So economic development, we, need, we certainly need private investment. We hear quite a bit about jobs in any country. It varies, but the average, if you look at the average unemployment level in any country is about 50%. And it gets back to the limitations of industry. Um, in any country, we don't have generally a tax base. A county, a state, they have the luxury of, of employing property taxes. That's how all the schools are funded. They have luxury of income taxes. For the most part, a tribe, tribes do not have an income tax. So when you create a job in any country, who benefits is obviously the federal government because everybody, including natives, I'll, I'll, I'll you know dis dispatch with I'll dispatch with the notion that Indians don't pay taxes. We do, we do. We have to pay the federal income tax, and so I hear that quite a bit. Oh, you're Indian, you don't have to pay taxes. That's not true, and so so. But tribes don't have a tax base, and that's how a lot of 
other governments grow. That's how they enhance their ability to provide services. So Indian country does not have a tax base. With all that, it's really challenging to create wealth, not only for the tribe, but for individuals, the middle class. It's very hard to create wealth. And so economic development, obviously the goal is to create and improve our quality of life and to improve the standard of living, which I'm hoping that over time we'll have some exact data to really present to you what we're dealing with. But um, some of the things that I've been talking about just in, in my presentations, what is economic development? Um, I, here's, here's kind of a little process that, that I've been you know, uh, preaching, if you will. Uh, what we're trying to do is increase private investment. Well, first, I think government has a big role, especially in the country, with economic development. The tools uh, improve, reduce regulations, the capital. That is flowed through private investment. It creates jobs. Hopefully, it, it lowers unemployment. It reduces poverty and increases our personal income. That then increases the demand for goods and services, and then we have the employment multiplier. We don't have that generally in any country. Every dollar that's sent to any country goes off. I think the average, they call it leakage, economic leakage. It's, it used to be 98%, it's probably about 95%. So for every dollar that's invested in any country, almost 95%, and this is, mind you, disposable dollars, goes off the reservation. A lot of tribes are going to benefit tremendously from the CARES, the ARPRA, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, but many of those are going to hire contractors, folks who are off reservation. Those contractors, those partners, they're obviously there to produce a profit. That profit is going to be spent in their off reservation location. So, you know, suffice to say, yes, we're going to get you know, the, the projects done, but it's not going to really induce economic development. So what do we do? You know, where do we go? Um, I think, in my opinion, our tribal governments and the U.S. government, not only, you know, the Department of Energy, but the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Department of Interior, the Small Business Administration, you know, we have to figure out how to provide incentives for our business sector. And that includes tribal enterprises. How do we empower them to develop locally? We need to create a positive business environment. I think we also, and yesterday I think there was discussion with the tribal leaders you know, about strategic planning. I think we need strategic planning for business and economic development in any country with the goal of providing quality services and amenities. That's what I believe our tribal governments and the U.S. government, if you will, and, and I'll throw this up because of the trust responsibilities. You know, we need to you know, look at that to help enhance our tribal economies, our tribal partners. So some of the things that, that I think are important as a result of economic development is that, you know, we need to figure out how to improve the rules, regulations, and laws. Right now, because we're trust lands to develop, we have to follow the NEPA process. And that belabors takes time. The land acquisition process is 10 times longer than, if you, than land acquisition off in off reservations. Uh, we need resources, which we have. Uh, we need energy. We need human resources. I've been hearing that. You know, one of the challenges that any country is facing is that we have, we don't have enough grant writers, people to help tribes put in the applications for all these grants that are out there. And of course, we need a favorable tribal setting. Um, you know, I think that's probably one of the things that, that we as natives had to work on. You know, we welcome, we want to create jobs. We want you. We want our fellow brothers and sisters to be entrepreneurs, to be business people, so that we can all share the wealth, so that we all, you know, keep things home. One thing that I saw, and this is striking, in the 2020 census for any country, the 2020 census says, basically, I think the, the, the stat that I saw is that over 60% of our natives are now living off reservation. And that has shifted from roughly a 50-50 to a 
70-30, from 2010 to 2020. To me, that's, that's alarming. I think many of us go home on the weekends, but we maybe are, are domiciled off reservation. If that trend continues, I think we're gonna see very, very little limit folks back home on our reservations. Uh, I hope we don't get there. So all of us here, in my opinion, including myself, is how do we improve um, home, motherland? You know, many of us, I know Navajos, you know, the Nepkea, you know, home, that's, that's us. So when you ask a native, well, where are you from? Well, we don't say, well, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. We say originally where we were born or where our family's from, family of origin. I always say I'm from Navajo, New Mexico. You know, even though I've, I've had opportunities to work around the country, where are you from? I always say Navajo, New Mexico. And I think many of us natives feel that way because we have this close affiliation, affinity to our homeland. So we all have to protect our reservations so that we think of, I think I heard earlier, seven generations, our kids, grandkids, great grandkids. That's what it's all about. So, uh, and so the work that I do as president of, of my company, um, you know, these are things that I want to talk about. But I'm going to put a plug in here. Uh, I also want to invite you, and, and it's basically a continuation of what we do, to the, our Reservation Economic Summit 2023. This will be in uh, Las Vegas. Mind you, this is going to be our 35th conference. We've been doing this conference for 35 years, and it's an economic development trade show for Indian country, economic development and development. So I want to say thank you for your time, which means thank you. And I look forward to some great questions. So thank you, everybody. So I think we're going to try to take questions um, from the table instead of having to go re return to the podium make it more conversational in style. Does, uh, have any of the presentations uh, engendered any, any questions? Please uh, walk up to the, to the mic and um, st state your name and maybe who you're representing or where you're from. Hi there, my name is Shelby Stoltz and I work with an organization called Advanced Energy Economy. Um, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and work on a legislative and regulatory policy in Arizona and New Mexico and Utah. My question is, um, there's a lot of focus on uh, plant infrastructure and repurposing. However, there isn't really a one-size-fits-all plan for repurposing, and many communities experiencing or that have experienced fossil fuel cl plant closure particularly in the Southwest, don't have many of the same attributes of other case studies that are often used by the interagency working groups. What is DOE and the other interagency working groups doing to identify and assist how tribal and rural communities and water restricted low population density areas in the Intermountain West and Southwest, um, what, are, what are these agencies doing to help these communities create their own model for infrastructure and facilities repurposing. I found that this is a really hard gap or opportunity to suggest to state policymakers at both state legislatures and public utility commissions to take specific actions on this issue, and I'd appreciate any insight that you might have. I can, I can start on that. I mean, that is exactly, Shelby, the the way we look at this, no one size fits all. Every single place is different. Um, the interagency working group on power plant and coal uh, communities, which I know most about, has just finished, wrapped up a, um, a convening in the Four Corners uh, area. Um, you know, the secretary has been there three times. Um, the last convening in the Four Corners area um, looked at uh, and, and, it, and it was attended by you know Secretary Holland, Brian Deese from the Economic Council, Ali Zaidi, who was here to listen to rural communities about what it is that um, what are the barriers and the challenges. And so part of the answer to your question is listening and um, being available to um, hear. Um, we're doing another convening in the south um, 
in the southern part of the United States in oil and gas communities, so away from coal communities. We'll do that in December. We've done convenings in um, Appalachia, in Wyoming. Um, so we're trying to be uh, available to learn uh, about what is unique about a place that, um, that gives it the opportunity to repurpose whatever infrastructure it has, um, given the kinds of technologies that are available that attach to that uh, infrastructure differently in different places. So, I, I mean, that's a long winded way to say, let us know uh, how we can access you and learn from you, and we will do that. Um, I'd also add uh, from our work at the Office of Indian Energy uh, Policy and Programs that um, we participate in the White House Council on Native American Affairs. Uh, it's a, a White House uh, uh, created organization that uh, collaborates, um, draws uh, upon the cabinet members of many of the agencies and um, uh, we're coordinating amongst uh, the tribal uh, programs between multiple agencies uh, to work with uh, many of the uh, coal transition communities in particular. So um, there'll be some additional developments there, but we've uh, convened and uh, have a lot of support uh, for working directly with those tribes uh, and their particular uh, identified and uh, strategic needs. If I could add. Also, David, uh, I think one of the things that, that folks only recognize in any country that most of the assets that are out there are actually not owned by the tribe. Tribes have been landlords for, for many, many years. And so uh, with these assets that are now uh, probably obsolete, um, I think more, more discussions with the tribe as to how the tribes could perhaps be partners with it. So tribes for many, many years have basically done land leases and allowed for these power plants, these energy production facilities to take place. And so tribes have been living off the royalties. I think many tribes are now looking for ownership positions in clean energy facilities. And so uh, inviting uh, government agencies and the states and the energy arena to bring in tribes as partners, um, I think that's that's a discussion that should take place and needs to take place to allow for you know the repurposing of, of uh, that particular facility. I think we also saw that there's a lot of minerals and a lot of um, activity in any country where Indian country can be great partners with uh, moving forward. Uh, good morning. I just had uh, one thought that came out of listening to Greg's presentation about critical minerals and building trust is that we can't lose sight of the fact that some of the projects to to get critical minerals may have impacts harmful impacts on tribes and uh, a good example and I, I'm not trying to be negative about the company, but Perpetua Company in Idaho wants to reopen a gold mine to, to mine antimony, which is a critical mineral for batteries, et cetera, et cetera. And China and Russia are the ones, the only countries that control antimony. Well, Perpetua wants to mine the antimony. And it could have a negative effect on the Nez Perce fisheries. And I know there's, there's, there's people here from Nez Perce who know about this. They're in the, in the room, in the meeting. But the term, the word I heard just now, listening, that is so important. And there's an executive order that wasn't thrown under the bus by the Trump administration on consultation with tribes. And you have to, a federal agency, in this case, the Forest Service, issued a draft supplemental impact statement on the Perpetua mine. But 
Besides the environmental impact statement, the Forest Service would have a responsibility to consult with the tribes. And it's not just listening to them as another member of the public. It's really consulting with them. So I just wanted to raise that point. I mean, all of this that we're talking about, very important, but we can't lose sight of trying to figure out how to reduce any environmental impacts on the tribes. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, Adam, one of his main points was uh, how to do that um, in a way that minimizes those impacts because we can't do it the same way that we've always done it before um, and repeat the same mistakes or compound them because we're at a, such an accelerated pace. And, and there's no excuse to do it that way. I mean, we know that uh, today, so. Sir. Uh, David Wilcox, Reach Scale. Um, we could flip this and ask the question what does the Biden administration and what does the Department of Energy and the other administrations most need? And Greg showed a slide which answers that question. It was two energy scenarios it was the business as usual energy scenario. And it was the, we massively figure out how to scale an injury scenario. So what the administration and the country and all of us most need is scale. We need to figure out how to get to that scaled scenario that would be real success versus the business as usual scenario. Now, Derek talked about how business as usual works. And he gave us a great picture. So we don't wanna do that. So, Every scale success story we've looked at, and we've looked at 300 around the world, did a couple of things. They found massively underutilized resources, multiple pools of massively underutilized resources, often people, often talent, often abilities that weren't being used, but also ability to get guarantees, ability to get credit worthiness, ability to get all of these resources through the programs of the DOE. But they did not access those resources in the business as usual way. They accessed them through networks. And if you want to build trust, it try to do it through partnerships, that's way too slow. You will be stuck on the business as usual curve if you're trying to do your trust part of the deal through partnerships. You've got to use networks to build trust and then deploy the partnerships from the trust built networks. That's what the top 10 scale examples in India did. And 10 of the top 20 in the world are in India. Um, and we studied those to understand how that happens. So I think you have with this panel kind of laid out what it is that needs to happen. And it happened with wind and solar when they moved off the project curve. So 20 years ago, they were all stuck on the project curve and we weren't anywhere. And every article you've seen about wind and solar, solar was written because they moved off the project. Curve. They figured out how to manufacture a significant portion of each product, each project, so that only 10 or 20 percent or 30 percent was actually project. So Indian country could be the place that we move off the project curve for all of these technologies in the US. And if you did that, you'd create an example that would attract resources to Indian country, that would attract people to Indian country, that would cause the Indian owners of the Indian businesses to employ other uh, people. And they would move not to the central areas, they would move to the next round of scale activities for, so from the reservations that do the best job first, then you go to the next round, then you go to the next round. So, you're taking that talent and you're manufacturing those projects again and again and again. So you've, we've got the opportunity to do that. And I've suggested earlier in this session that there's a funding source for doing that in addition to the DOE funding, and that's carbon credits. And if you could build this mechanism such that you get that scale to reach Greg's big numbers, then you can go to, to the global corporations and say, this is the best place to put your carbon credit money. That's how you could achieve Derek's objectives. Thank you. Uh, did anybody want to respond or? I'll make a comment. 
So I think in a very real sense, you've just captured the whole idea of what the National Science Foundation wants to do with the regional innovation engines. That is, get a network in a region rallied around you know, one topic, one you know, being a very broad topic, and bringing all of those network powers to scale, but also, and I think this is often forgotten, it's not just about innovation and plunking new innovation into a region. It also has to be taking advantage of the insights that only exist in that region. So the antimony example is a great one. The folks who are likely going to have the most insight as to what solution is going to be beneficial for that area are likely the ones who are going to suffer the consequences if that innovation is not developed. And those are the ones who locally live with it. Those are the ones who see it. Those are the ones who are going to hold to task to make sure that the solution actually is balanced and doesn't have adverse environmental impacts. And so I think that is, in a very real sense, the whole idea of an innovation ecosystem, generally speaking. But that's the opportunity that I think we should all pursue in the different regions around, certainly the ones that encompass Indian country. A question, yes, or a comment? Yeah, um, my name is Alyssa from World Resources Institute. Um, this question is for Greg, but welcome any other responses as well. Um, when considering what you are speaking on with building relationships, how are you reconciling um, the urgency behind what you um, were discussing with speed and scale while building those relationships um, moving at the speed of trust? Um, I was wondering like, how you reconcile that and also if you have any examples or strategy you can share. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's kind of the primary tension here with, with solving the climate crisis is we've got to move fast and we've got to move big, but we've also have to, um, we have to work with communities, um, get, meet communities where they are uh, to, to be able to do that. Otherwise, we kind of get into, um, uh, you know, a situation where we can't do anything. Um, I mean, I think one good example, so one of the projects that we work on actually with World Resources Institute is the US-India Track 2 Dialogue. Um, and so we've been working for over 12 years um, between the US um, and India at a non-governmental level where we work to kind of grease the skids of progress, basically, and kind of figure out things that the two countries can work on together. Um, and then feed those up into our respective governments, into the White House, into the Prime Minister's office. And it took a, it took a long time, but um, over time, we were able to make a lot of really good progress that led to a lot of the commitments that the US and India have made um, over the last couple of years, including net zero goals. Um, it, but, it, but it takes time. Uh, but if we don't put in that effort into building that trust, then we're not going to make any of that progress at all. And so I think we've got to move at a speed that's sustainable, um, working with other people, because if we try to just bulldoze things, it's never going to work. I, I would just add to this. Um, this tension is, is really tricky because there, there's an adage in business um, that is to, to, uh, to go fast, you have to start slow. And I think it goes to this question of trust. Um, and so you got to get it right first early. And um, one of the projects that we've been working on at the Department of Energy is to attract private sector investment into energy communities, which I talked a little bit, a bit about. And one of the places we've done that well is in West Virginia and, and some parts of Appalachia. And the way that that has happened in part is by using um, relying on, of course, you have to start from the ground up. You cannot start from Washington down. I mean, that's a total disaster. But in starting from the ground up, looking for academic institutions and uh, philanthropy to help um, build capacity to do the kinds of convenings and conversations and trust building that requires in the beginning of a project. Um, and I think that, you know, those are just some elements that have been working to bring private companies to the table in a way that um, makes sense. Thank you both. Yes. Um, hi, so um, I'm not sure if I'm repeating from yesterday, but I, I'm from 20 years in the mining industry, I'm actually still a board member of a 
Apollo Silver, which is a um, exploration mining company based in Vancouver, but we got some proje projects in um, California. But now I'm in the renewable energy industry. But I'm, what I'm recognizing after coming, or being still in the mining industry and coming into the renewable industry, we're having these conversations about each other, but not with each other. So um, I'm also on the uh, subcommittee of the American Exploration Mining Association. Um, we just started a committee about Native American relations. So I could tell you that the mining industry is wanting to reach out, build those relationships, build trust because of the historical traumas and um, you know the conversations about tribes don't just want to talk about cultural resources. They want to talk about um, the environmental impacts, the holistic economic, social economic impacts of these projects. But I think would it be helpful is DOE, DOI, all the, the government agencies help facilitate having those deeper conversations. Um, like I said, we have interagency working groups. So the mining industry, we've submitted lots of comments about how we can do better um, with consultation, but I think it would be great for, would the government consider inter-industry, facilitating inter-industry conversations? Um, is that something that might be useful? I guess I'm, I'm the government here today. Um, <laughs> yes, is the answer to that. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and for mining, you know, the time is now. So if you want to contact me afterwards, I can help you navigate the department in a place where we can follow up on that. Yes, sir. My name is Carl Darge. I come from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, when Senator Granholm was still in diapers and uh, learning how to walk, I started working for my father in the heating business. And uh, over the years, and I uh, went to college, uh, took a couple of semesters and dropped out because I ended up teaching the course. And I said, I don't need to go to college to learn when, it, when I can teach it. And that is why I'm standing here. I'm making an offer to all of the Indian tribes in the United States. And my offer is you need training heating and cooling on a uh, basis of what you are talking about your tribal lands your homes your small businesses is very easy to teach i said i'm from detroit we have the same problem as the whole nation does there's not enough people in our business right now there's a 16-week course that uh, you can go to and become certified uh, not certified to install or anything, you're just certified that you know something. And the people who are going through that course are taken right from it. They don't look for a job, they're already got one. And they're starting pay, are you ready for this? $80,000 a year plus benefits immediately. I don't think you can you're talking about economic development. You're talking about something for these tribal people. I think that's a no-brainer. It, you can train people in 16 weeks to do this. And once you train one, you get a helper, and it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. Okay. Thank you. So I would make that offer. Uh, anybody wants to, I have cards. I will uh, um, come to any. We appreciate, the, we appreciate the offer. We have three minutes and we have two, two more people standing. Um, can we go to this uh, side quickly? Sorry. Thank you. My name is Tom Harris. Um, I mentioned that I'm from the Tantaquan tribe of the Tlingit Nation. We are the Tongass people. We are the grandchildren of the Diné. We can count years back to when the oceans were 110 meters lower than they are right now. Some scientists estimate that that was 14,000 years ago. We know the Diné were old then, or older. So this is where this comment comes from. As Alaska natives, we welcomed ANCSA. We gave up our aboriginal rights 
for land and citizen rights. And those citizen rights were delivered in part, but incomplete. We are now being asked to make our land available for energy development, resource development. And yet uh, we have the highest energy costs, the highest um, food cost in the nation. And we are looking for that opportunity for completing interest. We know that there always has been, there always will be opportunity for those who are prepared. There never has been, there never will be opportunity for those who are not. We are looking for completing interest, understanding. Our nation is built on competing interest. Tribal people are built on completing interest. We need the right to feed ourselves from our own land. And that right is denied Alaska today. 44 million acres. We don't have the right to feed ourselves. We encourage the agency to look at our completing interest. Alaska has all of the energy resources needed to feed this nation. We need the resources to feed ourselves. So I would ask you as an agency, please visit with Department of Agriculture, Department of Law. Let's get this resolved. Let Alaska join the rest of the nation in being able to feed ourselves from our own lands. I look for your guidance and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Manahu, that's good morning. Hello and Mono. I'm from Norfolk Rancheria, I'm Mono Indian, and we're in the exact center of California. Uh, I believe this uh, statement and also question is for both federal and state governments. I understand you're federal, but there are some state uh, folks here. As a federal and federal and state governments write policy, it seems to be more of a blanket policy that doesn't necessarily fit tribes. So it's square peg, round hole. And that's because of the unique challenges that tribes face. And what's happening today in California as um, clean energy development uh, advances, I believe that it's the new gold rush. And that last gold rush didn't work out so well for tribes. <laughs> and uh, I believe this time we have um, an opportunity as tribes to be more proactive, to ensure that we're included ensure collaboration includes uh, to be more inclusive and in sustainability while protecting our sovereignty, creating workforce and economic development. And it's important that state, federal and tribal governments all work together. And that's what this is about today and, and what is happening yesterday. State and tribes need to work together in order to make this happen. On the federal side, this trickles down to states and it's the state governments that need to ensure this happens. So this question is for state and federal, how can Native American leaders become, have the seat at the table and more? I, I think this administration and also uh, California's administration we have more appointments, but there's still, we have a long way to go. We need that seat at the table. We've created our own seats and there's even more work that needs to be done within our leadership within the states. But how can we encourage both federal and state governments to have more appointed roles so uh, with um, native leaders so that there's more collaboration and more understanding? Are, are you with uh, a California tribe? Yes, I'm from Norfolk Rancheria, Mono. Okay, great. And, and I also have a clean energy company. Um, well, I, I know Ken. Okay, <laughs> I, so I was going to say. Ken's great, th but we need more we're, we're, have, we're having a first ever meeting be between the CPUC, California tribes, and DOE mm -hmm. Thursday. That's great. And I, this comes, that question comes from experience. I, I served as deputy secretary at the California Department of Veterans Affairs, Governor Brown, he, he made sure that we had a lot of native rights within our state. Governor Newsom added on to that, adding more appointments. But the truth is, when I served in 2019 and 18, I was one of two out of a thousand 
California natives that were appointed. Yeah. So that's where that comment comes from. Yeah. Thank you. Final comment or question? Yay. Yeah. I know it's break time, so I'll be quick. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the panel for the comments that you said today. Um, our concern is, um, um, again, I'll tell you, my, my name is Cheryl McDade, and I am a representative of the Moab Band of Paiutes. Uh, we are on the I-15 corridor north of Las Vegas. <clears throat> if you know anything about the, the Moab Band, you know that they were the first tribe to do their large-scale solar utility land lease. Um, what our concern is, is to invite you out, well, not a, a concern, but an invitation to come to the community as Moapa has been faced with the coal ash issues. Our tribal leaders are here and we encourage you to come. What we are hearing and what we are concerned with is that the larger scale tribes, the larger land-based tribes, I mean, we are a land-based tribe, but if you focus on one area of tribes and not hit the smaller tribes, then we get bypassed. So I wanna make sure that you hear us today. That's why we're here. We're here advocating in good faith and hoping that everything that is going to be beneficial to us. We are proactive. We don't need the training. We need the encouragement and the help and the cooperation. There are a lot of good tribal people that work hard every day. We have a good team, a good network, and we're ready to continue moving forward. So um, we send it a thank you with a positive message and encourage you to come to the Moapa Band of Paiutes. Again, um, seeing the people firsthand is what opens your eyes. And we have a, a lot of great opportunity and, and we're hopeful. So yeah, thank you. We'd, we'd love to. Yes. Love to visit. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're at time, a, a little bit past time, so we've eaten into your break time. And um, thank you for joining us. And uh, please enjoy the break. But I reach and smell. Okay. Okay. For you. Yeah, let me give you parts as well.
Speaking on this panel, right? I am yes. Mike Weissmiller. Mike Weissmiller, cool. I think Derek, once he's sort of done over there, well, he's kind of emceeing everything, okay. so he'll make an announcement. Everyone else will come up. This is to run your slides. Okay. Um, so they should be loaded up. You'll see it down there with the timer. Um, you have about 20 minutes. Okay. Um, I'll yeah, also be kind of uh, keeping time, and I'll be sitting right here. Okay. Um, I'll have like little cards that'll give you a countdown. Um, and then if you have any sort of questions or issues, just flag me down and I'll come help. Yeah, uh, originally Tori and I were supposed to share like 15 minutes, so okay. I probably only have like seven or eight minutes worth of material. That's fine. But um, yeah. as you can, as, I don't know if you were in here for the last panel, but everyone's been asking a lot of questions. So okay. less time is more time for questions or more time for lunch break. So okay. we'll be all right. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. 
<laughs> well, I was in, I, I, when I was uh, in high school, I was in a school bus accident. And like we had a, we had a, you know, it was a passenger car. And that car was completely smashed. And the bus, like, we got a couple of guys that both had. So they are built. Well, I don't know. The thing says 1045, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we had. <laughs> hey, Mike Weissmiller. I mean, we've met on teams, you know, but. Uh, I figured I'd come up uh, when we started to start the And our first and the present third is going to be virtual. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing it different in the other room. They, they're yeah. Really yeah. So, Mike, Grant, Podium, either way, either way. Yeah. whatever works for you. I'll be able to see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's get started here. Uh, we will begin in one minute, and we are going to continue our discussion. And the next panel is going to be talking about national clean energy infrastructure planning and deployment. So let's all take your, our seats so that we can continue. So James, James, do we have, um, Tori is, is ready to yeah, go once we announce, once we announce. okay, all right.
Okay, well, I'm not going to do any cheers. I think we already got that covered. So thank you, Matt, <laughs> for, for doing that. So um, let's, let's move on to this next, next section here. Um, and, and as I said earlier, this is uh, the National Clean Energy Infrastructure Planning and, and Deployment. And so uh, we have uh, four great speakers here. We're going to talk about electric vehicles, EV, and then transmission. And so we're scheduled to uh, move into, I think, 12, 15, and then we'll have our lunch. And so uh, we're going to talk about electric vehicles. We have Tory Lyons, the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation Office. We have uh, Mike Weismiller, Program Manager, uh, Electrification R&D, Vehicle Technologies. And then covering transmission, we'll have Dylan Reed, which you heard um, yesterday, he's the senior advisor for grid deployment office. And then rounding out our panel on critical mineral supply chain is we'll have Dr. Grant uh, Bromel, acting director of mineral sustainability division, fossil energy and carbon management. And so to kick it off, we have Tori Lyons uh, who will be presenting via online, right? So Tori? We, well, there he is. All right. Can you all hear me? Okay. You, Tori. We'll turn it over to you. Welcome. All right. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Tori Lyons. I'm with the we joint office. Volume. Can you all hear me? Okay. We, we barely hear you, Tori. Let's okay. We are working on it. They say, okay. <laughs> I will just keep checking in. How's this? How's this sounding? Baby face. <laughs> yeah. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay. Go Great. ahead. Thank you. Sorry about the technical difficulties. It's uh amazing that I can call in from Southern Utah, but it's also a challenge. So um, my, my name is Tori Lyons. I'm with the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. I'm on detail from the Idaho National Laboratory. And uh, this morning, I'm going to be talking to you about how the Joint Office has been incorporating equity and Justice 40 into the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, as well as some of the other programs that we're working on as well. So I will advance to the next slide, hopefully. Here we go. Um, so I'm gonna start by covering the, the office, the joint office mission and vision. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna do that to, um, to bring home the point that equity is baked into everything that we're doing in the joint office and it has been from the start and it's even um, come straight out of uh, the legislation from the bipartisan infrastructure law. So the, the mission of the joint office is to accelerate an electrified transportation system that is affordable, convenient, equitable, reliable, and safe. Um, and our vision is a future where everyone can ride and drive electric. So the, the immediate term priorities that, that the joint office has been working on, um, to, to start, we've been focused on the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Formula Program. Um, so I'm, I'll probably refer to that from here on in as the as the NEVI program. Um, but the 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 NEVI program provides five billion dollars for states to build out a national EV charging network along alternative fuel corridors and interstates. Um, so that is, we've been working feverishly to to get that underway. We've actually now certified 52 state plans and the first uh the first two years of funding funding have been um allocated to states in order for them to get started on on implementation of of the the national charging network uh the next the next program that we're going to be working on in the joint office is the national electric vehicle infrastructure discretionary program so that in, includes two different grant programs the the corridor charging grant program and the community charging grant program. There's two and a half billion dollars in funding for, for those grant programs. 
um, and they focus on EV charging as well as other clean fuels like hydrogen, natural gas, and propane fueling infrastructure. And then uh, on top of on top of those NEVI programs, the joint office is collaborating with USDOT and the US EPA on um, the USDOT's low no emission grants program for transit, which provides five point six billion dollars in support for low and no emission transit bus deployments. And then the clean school bus program with the US EPA, which provides $5 billion in support for electric school bus deployments. So this is just a gra graphical representation of what, um, what the start of the, the national charging network is going to look like. It's along the, inter uh, the US interstate system as well as our alternative fuel corridors. Um, and the the vision for this system is to is uh, to connect regions and ensure uh, that the EV charging network is convenient, accessible, reliable, and and equitable. And and that that last portion is what I'm going to be focusing on in the rest of my time here. Um, so again, I, I just want to to point out the fact that um, that equity is is baked into everything that we're doing in the joint office. Um, and so I'm going to offer a, a little selection from from our program guidance, which was uh, published back in in February of this year, um, which says that to be effective, the EV charging infrastructure deployed under this program must provide a seamless customer experience for all users through a convenient, reliable, affordable, and equitable national EV charging network. So again, equity is is really important to to the vision of the joint office. Um, some additional guidance on equity, um, and this relates to the state plans. So as I mentioned, there were 52 state plans that were recently certified by the Federal Highways Administration. Um, and those state plans are what was required of states in order for them to receive the, the formula funding dollars. Um, and so it was really helping states to, uh, we were providing guidance and technical assistance to states in their development of, of their plans. And that's the way that we really work to ensure um, an equitable network in the states and, and nationwide. Um, but again, from, from the guidance, we, we directed states that their plan should be developed through engagement with rural, underserved, and disadvantaged communities and stakeholders, including relevant suppliers and contractors, and describe how the plan reflects that engagement. So not only are we requiring that are we requiring community engagement with with disadvantaged and, and rural communities, but we're also uh, requiring that um, that states report and and report on how their plan is actually reflecting that engagement. So that's a really critical piece. Um, and then also the state plan should explain how the state will deliver projects under the NEVI formula program that consistent with executive order 14008, which I will talk about in a little bit, um, and the interim justice 40 guidance issued by the White House, target at least 40% of the benefits toward disadvantaged communities. Um, so th that 40% of benefits to dis disadvantaged communities is um, that comes from the Justice 40 initiative. Uh, and the Justice 40 initiative was part of an executive order issued by the White House early on in this administration that was focused on environmental justice. And one of one of the elements of that um, of that executive order was the Justice 40 initiative, which requires that among covered programs, um, of which NEVI is one, uh, that uh, that federal funding recipients, so in this case states, um, demonstrate that 40% of the benefits of that program are accruing to disadvantaged communities. So this, in this slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've identified disadvantaged communities um, for the NEVI program. Um, uh, again, the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation is a, is a very unique um, situation in government where we sit between between two federal um, departments, so the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation, um, and having having that unique opportunity, we were able to collaborate with both of those those departments to create a um, a joint definition of disadvantage that think that considers transportation disadvantaged communities as well as energy disadvantaged communities um, to to create a, a definition which we we believe is. Um, best suited for identifying disadvantaged communities as it relates to EV charging infrastructure. Um, so the, our, our definition includes publicly available data sets that capture um, indicators such as vulnerable populations, health, 
transportation access and burden, energy burden, fossil fuel dependence, resilience, and environmental and climate ha hazards. So all of those, all of those different indicators go into uh, into identifying our disadvantaged communities, and then on top of disadvantaged communities that were identified using those um, indicators, we have also included um, tribal lands and U.S. territories. So um, that's important because the way that that this map is used and, and the, these definitions of disadvantaged communities are used is for focusing efforts for states in into where to allocate that funding. So remember, we were talking about the Justice 40 initiative um, requires that 40 percent of benefits accrue to disadvantaged communities. Um, it's these communities that are the focus um, of that reporting for Justice 40. And so I, I, I bring that up to highlight the fact that that tribal lands are, are included in, in those priority areas. Um, some additional notes on, on guidance related to the NEVI program and, um, and tribal lands and governments. Um, public there there was a, there's a requirement for public engagement with tribes that was written in the program guidance as well um, and so I'll, I'll read that to you it says this includes community outreach and participation including with rural tribal and disadvantaged communities to facilitate equitable access um, and deployment of EV charging infrastructure um, we are also directing states to consider uh, tribal lands and disadvantaged communities um, in the siting of their electric vehicle infrastructure um, in a way that provides benefits and access uh, to disadvantaged communities and tribes. And then the way that that states will be held accountable to that is through um, Justice 40 benefits tracking. So again, we're, we're, we will be requiring um, states to report on, on how those benefits are accruing to disadvantaged communities and how that compares to the rest of their populations. Um, so, so I mentioned access and uh, and the siting of the infrastructure, but that that those are just um, that's really just one way that benefits can accrue uh, to communities through the development of this infrastructure. Um, other ways are are economic opportunities, like through contracting with disadvantaged businesses, um, clean transportation access that's that's been covered, energy resilience. Um, decreasing transportation cost burden, re reducing transportation emissions, um, jobs, jobs creation and community participation. And those, and those are just some of the benefits that, um, that we predict can, can be accrued to communities through the development of this infrastructure. Um, but another, another thing that we have been communicating to states is the need for them to have to use community engagement with disadvantaged communities to identify the priorities of those communities. So not we're not explicitly saying states, these are the things that you need to track, but rather we're saying, go out and, and um, have conversations and engagement with disadvantaged communities to identify what their priorities are and, and which, um, which potential impacts they're, they're hoping to avoid. Um, so, so I've been covering this, this NEVI formula program, um, which to a certain degree is limited in its, in its geographic scope. The, the chargers have to be located along interstates and alternative fuel corridors. Um, but we are, are working currently on a, another program called the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Discretionary Program, which has two and a half billion dollars in discretionary grants. Um, that's divided into two different programs. There's the corridor charging program um, and the community grants charging program. Um, and the, a, a priority for these is, in, is to support rural charging, uh, building resilient infrastructure um, and promoting EV charging access in underserved and overburdened communities. Um, so again, we have the corridor, corridor charging grant program, the community charging grant program, the community charging grant program is the the next one on um, on the priority list for the joint office, and we're currently working on developing uh, developing that program and uh, seeking input on that. And so I'm I'm happy to talk about that further, possibly in the the, the question and answer section. And uh, that that concludes what I have for you all today. 
Um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I'm not sure if we're doing questions um, with the entire panel afterwards or if, if I'm gonna take questions now, but hopefully the moderator can answer that. And thank you very much for having me. It's my, um, my honor to be here and I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Tori. We're gonna do questions at the end of the panel. So just Great. Hang, hang tight there and we'll get to you. Okay, Let's thank get, you. You're welcome. Let's, let's move on to Mike Weismiller, Program Manager, Electrification R&D Vehicle Technologies Office. So, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Mike Weissmiller. I'm here representing the Vehicle Technologies Office in the DOE Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And uh, my position is a program manager of electrification R&D, but I'm, I'm going to uh, try to speak to the activities um, throughout the whole office. So here's a, a bit of a snapshot of the um, vehicle technologies office. Um, we really have um, four different uh, research development and demonstration areas. And then we have um, a program that's called uh, technology integration and deployment. Um, so the um, research and development areas, uh, largest one being batteries and electrification. Uh, this is really all about bringing down the cost of, of electric vehicles, um, as well as the power electronics, motors, um, and, and uh, charging infrastructure that goes along with it. Uh, materials technology is, is focused on uh, breakthroughs in terms of lightweighting vehicles um, and, and other um, high strength materials uh, that can um, benefit the EV transition. And then uh, our mobility systems program is, is looking at uh, connected and automated vehicles and, and how that really influences the uh, energy and uh, emissions coming from our transportation sector. Uh, and then we also have a whole program that is dedicated. Uh, all those are really focused on the uh, on-road transportation area. Uh, we also have a whole program that's focused on uh, decarbonizing off-road air, marine, and rail. Um, and, and this is looking at a variety of approaches, which, which do include uh, biofuels and, and using hydrogen. Um, as I mentioned, I, I'm um, in the uh, electrification area here. Uh, so um, I, I will give um, a slide uh, um, talking about our R&D goals there. But I really want to spend most of the time focusing on the technology integration deployment area. Um, this is the program that, that really looks at uh, not only deploying technology, but really taking the learnings from from those deployments and feeding back into the technology programs and, and really informing the direction of our program and help try to help inform our stakeholders um, on how to best uh, adopt the technologies. Uh, so the uh, batteries and electrification program. Um, so v VTO is uh, looking at probably being about a $500 million um, office in, in this fiscal year. Batteries and electrification is, is a little bit uh, less than, than half of that um, overall budget. And, and really, uh, the biggest goal for the program is reducing the cost of electric vehicle batteries, uh, with the current goal uh, being less than 100 kilowatt, uh, $100 per kilowatt hour, um, and at the same time, decreasing the charge time to 15 minutes or less uh, is, is really um, important, but um, a very tough a challenge uh, and, and the ultimate goal is to, to get down to $75 per kilowatt hour uh, for the battery pack. Uh, at the same time, uh, on the electrification side, we're looking to facil facilitate development and harmonization of a robust, interoperable, economically vibrant, resilient, cyber secure EV charging infrastructure um, that is integrated with the, the modern grid, uh, which you know, as we have more and more renewables coming on the grid uh, presents uh, increasing challenges in terms of uh, balancing uh, load and demand. Uh, and then we are also uh, looking at the um, other aspects of the electric vehicle beyond the battery. Uh, so focusing on, on getting a high power density uh, electric traction drive system at, at a low cost with our target being $6 per kilowatt. Um, so the um, technology integration program um, is, is one that um, this, is, this is probably about uh, one quarter of that overall budget that we have in, in uh, vehicle technologies. 
And uh, compared to the, you know, things like in the uh, infrastructure law, uh, it is, you know, a more modest investment in terms of deployment. But really, there's, um, again, a lot of focus on collecting data, um, helping stakeholders, uh, training, uh, along with that financial assistance uh, for deployment. Um, so the goal is to provide objective data, uh, real world lessons um, in, to inform our future research needs, uh, support local decision making uh, uh, to advance affordable domestic transportation uh, and energy saving technologies. Um, and there's, there's five core elements to this program. Uh, those are the uh, Clean Cities Coalitions, um, information and uh, tools, uh, which you know, includes you know, information gathering and, and, and um, publishing, publishing them on the internet. Um, technical assistance, uh, training, outreach, and partnerships, uh, as well as uh, financial assistance, which typically comes out in our um, yearly um, request for proposals. Uh, we do also have uh, regulatory activities uh, working with uh, states uh, to implement the alt fuels uh, program as well as the um, advanced vehicle technologies uh, competitions program uh, this uh, the flagship program there is called ecocar and, and that's um, an opportunity for universities to um, uh, help train the, the next generation of um, engineers and scientists for clean uh, transportation technologies Oop. Um, so a, a little bit uh, more about those um, key elements to our technology integration strategies. Um, real, really, the goal is to work closely with our nationwide network of local clean cities coalitions uh, to support local decision making. Um, providing them unbiased resources, uh, robust technical assistance, and, and partnerships at the national, state, and local level uh, to help uh, stakeholders evaluate their transportation needs and energy choices. Um, and, and some of those goals uh, really are um, shifting to uh, domestic transportation energy sources, improving fuel efficiency, reducing harmful emissions, uh, demonstrating new mobility choices and i should add to this you know wrapping everything up is is really taking the the learnings from deployment um, of the different technologies and, and understanding how to do it uh, in an equitable way um, and, and understanding the the challenges that communities face uh, in, in doing that uh, making sure that new technologies are helping communities and and not hurting um, so this map here shows um, our um, over 75 clean cities coalitions, um, thousands of stakeholders, and um, the map does cover 80% uh, of the uh, US population. Um, and again, the, the goal of these coalitions is to work in communities across the country uh, to implement uh, alternative fuels, uh, uh, specifically electrification. Uh, and new new mobility choices that are emerging. Um, a big another flagship of the program is uh, technical assistance. So um, there there is actually um, a service uh, where you can uh, contact seasoned experts to help find uh, technical um, answers to technical questions, um, including. Uh, deploying uh, new electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging, um, fuel economy improvements, idle reduction, uh, and other uh, clean uh, transportation technologies. Um, there is a um, email and, and, and phone number both. And um, if, you, if you have questions in these areas, um, uh, someone from the technical response service will get you a, a timely and thorough response. Um, so um, that's all the material I have here on the um, uh, vehicle technologies office. Um, I do also want to provide a few um, uh, resources here. There's there's my email, uh, and I'm happy to be a, a point of contact for um, uh, any inquiries about the office. Uh, we have our um, office uh, website, 
And this is um, an important one because any um, future funding opportunities will uh, be posted on, um, on our website uh, and publicly available. Uh, we have our uh, Clean Cities uh, webpage um, to, to get more information about uh, your local Clean Cities coalitions. And two websites that, that we do um, manage is the Alternative Fuels Data Center, uh, afdc.energy.gov, uh, as well as um, what, what ends up being one of the most uh, popular government websites is fueleconomy.gov, which can provide you um, uh, information about um, the fuel economy uh, and, and ability to compare um, a variety of different vehicles and uh, better understand your, your choices in terms of purchasing. So uh, with that, um, thank you for your time. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you, Mike, appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to, um, and this will, this will round out our panel and we'll discuss critical mineral supply and Dr. Grant Romo, acting director <clears throat> at the FECM office. Um, I think I got the acronym name, so floor is yours and welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and let's see if this, great. So I just wanted to help set the stage a little bit in terms of our history uh, with critical minerals uh, in the United States. Um, so in the past 40 years ago, uh, we produced, we, we mined and we produced and processed uh, more than just about anyone. And if you look uh, over time, uh, that's changed quite a bit. We've offshored uh, most, of the, most of the work done in the critical mineral space to other countries, especially uh, China. And so as we as we look towards all of the renewable energy technologies, the electric vehicles, the solar power, the wind, uh, et cetera, um, they're going to rely and need us to really beef up uh, our uh, ability to uh, extract uh, critical minerals from, from the earth uh, and, uh, and do it in a way that's sustainable. And so that's what uh, our, uh, our division and our, our office is is about doing uh, right now. So back in February, uh, the Department of Energy produced several supply chain uh, reports. This is uh, information, there are 14 of these on different technologies, and it showed sort of the future vulnerabilities associated with these different supply chains. So that includes energy storage, uh, the electric, what's needed for the electric grid, uh, solar, nuclear, wind, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and so in those, we, we got a better handle on what we expect we're going to need in the future. And we identified uh, what, are the, what are the critical minerals of, of greatest uh, importance uh, through that. And so here are some of the, the key things that we identified as needed in order to it, uh, enable uh, the clean energy technology when it comes to supply chains. We need to increase, obviously, we need to increase the, the raw materials that are available. Um, we need to create clear market signals to support deployment. Now, some of that has come uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act and the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the, and the incentives that are associated there. But one of the things that's really important, uh, and I think is an opportunity here for all of us, is building the workforce to support the energy transition. And so just to give you uh, a sense, um, if we look at uh, one university in China uh, generates more than a hundred times of the peop of the uh, degree uh, uh, people with a degree uh, in mineral processing than all of the universities in the United States combined right now. So just to give you a sense, that's something. If we go back to that, you know, to this figure uh, in the in the uh, bottom left. Uh, that, that shows you that we really have a ways to go, but it also shows you there's really an opportunity to get in now to understand what's needed in order to uh, support uh, this new clean energy industry. There's a lot in mineral processing 
that that needs to be done. There's a, we need a lot of people who who know how to do that uh, to uh, to learn that in the U.S. Um, so what is DOE doing in this space? Well, across the the department, we're focusing on a, a few main things: trying to diversify supply. So trying to so there's conventional mining. That's one thing that's going to continue. Uh, but we're looking at other sources. We're looking at at recycling uh, electronics waste. And we're, we're also looking at taking waste from other uh, industries and especially the mining industry. And that's what uh, my group focuses on mainly is to diversify that supply by looking at unconventional and secondary uh, resources. And I'll tell you a little bit about what, what that is. But we're also working on developing substitutes. So we don't need as much of these critical minerals in order to, uh, in order to, um, get to the the solar and the and the wind uh, resources that we need in the future and then in general we're trying to create a circular economy opportunity uh, where we minimize the waste where we uh, reuse as much of the materials that come out of that as possible so uh, getting into what what we do the program that i run the division that i run uh, started looking at um, capturing and extracting and processing rare earth elements from coal about eight years ago. And at that time, so I, I've, at, at that time, um, you, when you went out and asked some, we told somebody, well, we're going to extract rare earth elements from coal. The, their response would be, you're going to extract rare earth elements from coal with the subtext of, are you crazy? Um, you know, associated with that. Uh, and and uh, not only from coal, but also from coal waste, from coal ash, from acid mine drainage, and and that that was the response we got eight years ago. You know, thanks to the people, and I've just joined this division in the last uh, couple of years. But thanks to the people that were running that, we've taken the response when we tell them that from that response to, oh, I heard you're you're extracting rare earth elements from coal. That's really interesting. We've done the work to show that this is possible. This slide is to give you a sense of what the resources are out there. There are millions of tons of rare earth elements in the known coal reserves. And if we look back at the waste that are out there, there are billions of tons of waste lying around uh, uh, in the US today that have come from the last 150 plus years of coal mining. And we're looking to do what we can to clean that up and to create the opportunity to create value out of that at the same time. Uh, so between uh, coal ash, coal waste, and acid mine drainage, there are lots of opportunities. That, that top figure shows all of those. If we look at the bottom figure, that shows a lot of the, not coal mine, but the other mines uh, that have been around the U.S. over the years. We're looking at how can we go back to the, that mine waste, the mine waste that's sitting there that may be leaching minerals out uh, and harming the environment, can we go out and, uh, and uh, process that, clean that up, remediate it, and extract critical minerals from that as well? So that's what we're focusing on. We have right now 13 regional coalitions. It's called our Core CM Initiative, our Core Critical Minerals. Uh, there are 13 regional coalitions. They uh, involve universities. In some cases, there, there are tribal uh, organizations that are involved, tribal nations that are involved. Um, but these, the, the goal of these organizations is to look at what's in their region, what's in that area, and how can we best assess what's there. So you, in the, some of the discussions that I heard yesterday, uh, there may be a coal ash impoundment uh, and maybe there's an opportunity to collect the critical minerals that, but we don't know. We don't know what's there. And so, so there could be an opportunities working through our core CM initiative to help get a better understanding of what, uh, what to characterize those, uh, those uh, impoundments uh, or gob piles or, or waste uh, tailings piles. Um, and uh, how can we assess that? We're also looking, the core CM initiative is also looking at uh, what are the workforce uh, uh, availability in those regions as we tr especially as we uh, move from more heavily fossil energy to more heavily renewable 
uh, energy uh, jobs? What are the opportunities um, to, to, to capture some of those jobs for the critical minerals? Uh, and so, as I mentioned, over the last eight years, we've done a lot of work in technology development. We have uh, first of a kind small scale projects. I'll show you those in just a minute. Uh, and we're moving forward, uh, taking uh, from, from those to uh, larger scale demonstration facilities to show that we can do this at a scale that is needed uh, to compete uh, with the uh, you internationally on the on the market for for rare earth elements and critical minerals. And so here there are four on this slide there are four of these small scale pilots. So these are ones where we've taken tons of this waste material and we processes process them into kilograms of mixed rare earth oxides. Uh, we have one for uh, coal, for uh, low-grade lignite coal. We have one for uh, coal ash. We have another one for acid mine drainage, uh, and and uh, a fourth from coal refuse or or gob piles. We also have one uh, not quite yet built, working on with one of our national labs uh, in the in the state of Wyoming, looking at uh, looking at taking um, acid mine drainage and processing that as well. So there's a lot that we've learned. We're taking that and using that information to help us design uh, what is needed in a larger scale facility uh, to do this. Uh, there are several of these projects looking at looking at opportunities all across the U.S. Um, for uh, for processing these materials into critical minerals. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to skip through this slide just just except for the point to say that. Graphite is one of those critical minerals that's needed for batteries. It's, we're expected to need 25 times uh, in the next 20 years what we use uh, today. Uh, and so for, for some of these coal feedstocks, taking the carbon, turning it into graphite, there's a real opportunity there. I did want to make the point that a real focus of what we're trying to do is to ensure waste minimization and create the opportunity for circularity. So there are um, all of these secondary and unconventional resources that we can find that we have an opportunity to clean up, especially ones that are negatively impacting the environment now. That's what we want to, to try to. First, we need to, we need to locate those. We need to characterize those so we can understand what the, what the impacts and what the opportunities are, and then how do we move forward on those. And so uh, we want to, so when it, when it comes to this, so just so you understand, the critical minerals portions of these feedstocks is only a small percentage of the actual material that's in those. So there's still a lot of materials left. So we're looking at how do we use, let's say, the, the rest of the carbon to make graphite, or can we use uh, the coal ash, uh, a large portion of that, to go to cement manufacturing? Uh, there may be other similar materials from coal waste that you can use in the agriculture uh, industry as fertilizer, and these are all uh, opportunities that have been identified and in some cases are being used right now we're looking at how can we maximize the the uh, value of that material and how can we minimize the waste uh, associated with it uh, and so here are just some of the examples of how we might be able to use that carbon for higher value products to improve the economics uh, and the environmental nature uh, of all of those uh, opportunities and then i wanted to talk about a little bit more about our, our core CM initiative. So each of these are really coalitions of a broad uh, group of organizations. Most of them are led by universities, um, uh, but they involve industry, involve NGOs, involve uh, many, many different types of state governments. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a real opportunity and please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any interest in learning more about this. Uh, we have uh, a website resources that I can point you to as well. There's also uh, our LEAP uh, program. So this is uh, technical, these are technical assistance opportunities. So we put one out uh, last year, late last year, um, and we, we didn't get as high a response as we would have liked. I expect another one will go out uh, in the future. Uh, this is for if a community or a, or a tribal nation is interested in having their um, waste resources better characterized to understand what the opportunities are for um, 
uh, critical mineral processing there, uh, then then uh, the the DOE, uh, if that's awarded, will pay uh, one of our organizations, the National Lab, perhaps, or another organization, to help gather that information and work with the tribes uh, to to do that. Um, and so that, uh, so, and then I did want to end, uh, and you'll, I think in the afternoon, there's another, there's a talk by someone else who will talk more about some of these things to you. That's on the manufacturing energy supply chains. Um, but right now we have an open uh, FOA for our rare earth element demonstration facility. This is to uh, a large scale facility to take waste materials from all kinds of mining waste or other similar waste materials. Uh, that could be uh, it, where rare earth can be extracted, turned into oxides, and then turned into rare earth metals. So we're 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 helping to build uh, that supply chain from domestic uh, waste sources. So that foe is out there uh, right now. It's for 156 million dollars. Um, there are a number of other uh, uh, provisions that on critical materials uh, innovation and uh, supply chain R and D. I think probably this group, uh, there's the uh, battery material processing grants. Um, so these are, uh, we, we just finished one set of solicitations on this, but these are for building uh, in the US demonstration, uh, commercial scale, or renovating existing commercial scale facilities uh, for uh, battery material processing. There's also uh, a few billion, three billion dollars for battery manufacturing uh, grants as well, uh, and you can find out about those um, in the uh, in the. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure the MESC representative will be talking about those in the afternoon today. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll end here and thank you very much for your attention and uh, invite any any questions that we have. Thanks. We have one more panelist who's going to join us, and he was with us yesterday. Welcome again. Um, covering transmission, um, we'll be, we will have Dylan Reed, Senior Advisor for Grid Deployment Office, so I'll turn it over to you. All right, good morning, folks. Good to see you again. I think yesterday, these slides came up a day early, so I'm excited to give this presentation uh, uh, today. So um, here to give just an overview uh, of the grid deployment office as it relates specifically to uh, our transmission division and uh, the various opportunities available through GDO. I know yesterday, for those who were here, I covered a little bit of the financing angle of that, so I'll go into a little bit more detail around some of the financing opportunities, but wanted to contextualize uh, all of the opportunities uh, within this. Uh, so first, before we get into the into the details, did want to provide uh, a little bit of context or context around what we're looking at when it comes to today's grid. Um, so you can see this very uh, well. Yeah, you can pretty much see it. Uh, the grid uh, showing all of the various uh, transmission lines across our country uh, and where they're connecting. Uh, as context to that, it is uh, about 70% of our transmission and power transformers are over 25 years old, and in some cases much older than that. Uh, so there is a need to, uh, to upgrade this. Uh, what we have seen uh, overall from a recent analysis by, the de by our department uh, is showing that in order to meet our clean energy goals, we do need to expand capacity, our existing uh, transmission capacity by 60% by 2030 and may need to triple it by 2050. So there is a significant need for these uh, investments to take place over the coming decades. And we also know with the increasing frequency of extreme weather events, um, as we have seen uh, just within the last month, but, but as well uh, over the last few years, that as we get these uh, extreme weather events, we know that these assets are threatened and could be taken down through uh, natural disasters that, uh, that threaten the overall reliability uh, of the grid. Um, and I do want to, uh, as as we kind of dive into the details, I 
contextualizing this, I know we can provide these big lofty goals of, of we need to expand by 60% by 2030 and triple by 2050, but fundamentally what we are talking about and where we would like engagement from everyone in this room uh, and across the country is, is when we're talking about building this infrastructure, it is going to whether it's uh, a power line or underground or underground, it is coming through land. And we recognize that in order to do that effectively, it takes engagement at the local and state level to make sure that we're doing that in an appropriate way. So we can build this infrastructure and do it rapidly. Um, as we say, deploy, deploy, deploy. Uh, but that does take engagement here. So we do have a number of opportunities that we wanna work with all of you um, across the country to make sure we, we get that right. Recognizing uh, uh, all the investments we need to make uh, and the opportunities within in the department. Earlier this year, uh, the Department of Energy uh, it, uh, began the Building a Better Grid initiative, which is aimed at ensuring that we can build at scale and rapidly uh, our transmission and distribution systems across across the country. And so this initiative is really aimed at uh, focusing the various opportunities that we have across the department. Uh, I'll walk through each of these in a little bit more detail to, to see how that is, but you can see the kind of the five pillars that we're working off of our engagement and collaboration with tribal nations, as well as all state, uh, state local and uh, industry and environmental partners. Uh, we are doing enhanced transmission planning across a number of studies and engagement uh, to make sure we know what we need and where that needs to go. We have a number of federal financing tools that are now available to us as part of, uh, as part of uh, both the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. That particular vertical there references um, a number of other more grid uh, grid resilience funding that I mentioned yesterday. Today, I'm really just going to be focusing on uh, that top uh, program round on financing. Uh, and we also have a number of uh, permitting processes that we're working on to make sure that we can efficiently coordinate across federal agencies to ensure that, that permits are done uh, effectively uh, and, and efficiently as a part of that. So first, the transmission facilitation program. Uh, this was a, uh, I believe I covered this yesterday for those who are here uh, quickly, but as for those who weren't, this is a, a program that was created through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, a $2.5 billion revolving fund to facilitate the construction of uh, transmission lines and related facilities. Uh, this specifically is aimed at facilities that uh, need the financial support. Uh, to build transmission lines. Uh, so without the existence of, of the funding through TFP, these, li uh, these lines wouldn't get built. Uh, the legislation did allow for DOE to engage uh, with, with eligible entities through three separate uh, financing opportunities. Uh, the first of which uh, is capacity contracts or the anchor tenant provision, uh, which is more commonly known as so the department can buy up to 50% of a planned uh, project for commercial capacity. Uh, as we have released uh, the funding or beginning to release the funding for this, we will have the first solicitation for, for this program going out this fall. The first version of this program will focus specifically on the capacity contracts and the, the, the anchor tenant provision. Going into next spring is when uh, we will put out an additional solicitation uh, on the public-private partnerships and loan, uh, loan program uh, eligibility as, as a part of that. Just a, a little details around what specific projects we're, we're talking about as a part of that. Uh, it is very specific within the legislation around the eligible project that can, that can get this financing. So this is the construction of a new or replacement of a transmission line of at least 1,000 megawatts, an upgrading of an existing transmission line, uh, but that must be at least 500 megawatts. And it also has, um, I, know there are some, I know there are some folks from Alaska here um, that this was written in that it also allows for the connection of an isolated microgrid to an existing uh, transmission infrastructure located within Alaska, Hawaii, or, or a US territory as well. So those are the three eligible projects that, that are uh, for this. Um, and our prioritization as a, as a part of this, is, as you can see, is using technology that enhances uh, the transmission uh, system, including use of advanced technology, improving the resilience and reliability of the system, facilitating interregional uh, transfer capacity is, is incredibly important, 
Um, and obviously, uh, we would like uh, to make sure that these uh, are also contributing to the broader national goals of, of lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And as I said, we will start phase one as the capacity contracts moving into phase two uh, on, on uh, uh, capacity contracts, loans, and public-private partnerships. First phase going in this fall, uh, phase two going into fall 2023. So that was really the, the main financing tool. There are a couple additional financing uh, opportunities through the Inflation Reduction Act that we're in the process of standing up. Uh, uh, so that will be coming more uh, probably later this year or early next year uh, as we are developing those, those programs um, specific to additional uh, direct loan authority as well as uh, $760 million to help with permitting uh, at the local and state level. Uh, which can help provide technical assistance, modeling, as well as economic development. Um, so those are a couple additional authorities allowed through the Inflation Reduction Act. What I'd next like to cover within the Grid Deployment Office, we are uh, either directly over overseeing or collaborating with other offices uh, with, um, within, within DOE around three major transmission planning opportunities. So the first one I'll cover is the National Transmission Planning Study. Uh, the second one is what we call the Transmission Needs Study. Uh, and lastly is our offshore, uh, offshore transmission need uh, convenings as, as, as well as studies. So we'll tick through those one by one. Uh, first is the National Transmission Planning Study. Uh, this is being uh, conducted in a joint effort um, between NREL and, and uh, uh, the Pacific Northwest National uh, laboratory uh, working on this. This study uh, builds on past projects and the expertise at the, at the national labs with the support of uh, the Office of Electricity as well as the Grid Deployment Office. Fundamentally, what this project is, uh, what this study is looking at is more of the long-term transmission uh, needs across, um, across the country, looking out across 2050 uh, and working as a part of that. We're doing a number of uh, convenings and engagement with uh, stakeholders now. If you'd like to be a part of that process, please find me or, or another member of the team. We can certainly uh, work on, on finding opportunities for that. Um, but those, those uh, convenings and engagement will continue through into next year with an anticipated release of the study uh, heading into uh, fall of 2023. So still another year as we develop uh, that opportunity. The objectives of this one though, identifying interregional and national strategies as we seek to decarbonize uh, the, the electric sector as well as uh, maintaining system reliability. This should help inform uh, regional and interregional transmission planning, particularly by engaging stakeholders. As I said, we are actively trying to, to engage as a part of this, um, as well as identifying viable and, and efficient uh, transmission options. On the second point, I do also wanna note that just our team is trying to actively engage and look at who is engaging and finding opportunities of, you know, we're really missing this aspect and getting, getting feedback from this particular aspect, including, including tribes. So again, I'll continue to say that if you're interested in participating in this, please, please let us know. Uh, our desired outcomes as a part of this is prior prioritizing future DOE funding for transmission support through the additional financing opportunities that we have over the long run, finding where there are existing gaps in the system, and then being able to potentially target financing as a part of this. Um, and it provides a framework for stakeholders uh, to discuss what the outcomes and, and potential barriers could be in, in, in reaching those outcomes. Second is our transmission needs study. Uh, this overall is really reviewing uh, current and anticipated future needs of the grid and what those needs mean of, of all the emails I get with needs and, and quotes, uh, is focusing on reliability and resilience, congestion, transfer capacity limits, and new generation delivery. What that essentially means is looking out over the next 10 years, what does our country need? Um, uh, for transmission development and identifying those high priority areas and projects that that may need to move uh, in, uh, in order to move forward on that. We are in, a, in the process of moving quite uh, 
quickly on, uh, as a part of this, as you can see in the, the bright red box there, uh, the draft, a draft will be released for comment likely at the end of this month. Um, so for folks looking to engage as a, as a part of that, we are doing a series of webinars as a, as a part of that release. So for a lot of folks, you should be on an email distribution uh, that, that uh, if you've engaged with the office as a part of that. If you haven't, again, please let us know. Uh, we're happy to get you uh, in, included as a part of this. Um, you can see all of the variety of analysis that we take into account on that, but the short story on that is really over the next 10 years, what are, what are our needs on a transmission capacity uh, uh, side of things. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this is uh, our off offshore wind transmission engagement. Uh, providing a quick uh, overview of where we're where we're looking at as as it relates to this, uh, the administration has put a goal of 30 gigawatts by 2034 offshore wind deployment, um, and transmission constraints were identified as um, as a central uh, potential impediment to uh, to reaching this goal. Um, to that end, the White House has uh, requested the DOE as well as uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to develop a plan for addressing these challenges. Uh, thus far, we have focused on the Atlantic coast, but we do expect uh, to, to uh, extend uh, that work into the, into the West Coast later this year, um, and then to be followed by the, the Great Lakes region as a part of that. So you can see uh, our coordinated effort uh, that we have as a part of the tran transmission development. I would look at this in two parts, really. There's the aspect that uh, GDO uh, is leading on, then as well as uh, where, where BOEM is taking more of a, a lead on this, uh, on this engagement. From the grid deployment office, where we're focusing on is uh, hosting all of the convening workshops as a part of this. I believe there are nine, does I have a list in there? No, I, I believe we have, uh, yes, nine workshops are planned, uh, six of which are already complete. Our seventh one is, is, is coming up, but this is doing active outreach uh, to folks along the Atlantic coast to help inform our, our outreach as a part of our, our offshore wind uh, analysis. Uh, as a part of this, we also did a scoping and gap, gaps analysis uh, on our team. You can see uh, tribes that tribal nations that we have included as a part of that. Uh, thank you to those who have. If there are others who would like to be a part of that process, please, we are always looking for additional engagement. I can speak personally to the staff running this, that they are always happy to work with folks um, uh, as, as a part of this. Uh, we we're also doing analysis as a part of this too to model exactly uh, specifically uh, what we need uh, in a comprehensive analysis uh, for what transmission build out is needed and running several scenarios um, as a part of that. And at the end of this comes together a recommendations report on what specifically uh, we, we need at the end of this. On the wind transmission study, the lead office with this is not uh, the grid deployment office, but did want to call it out as, as our coordinated effort here uh, with the wind energy technologies office, who's working in a partnership with our national labs on, on pulling that together. But the purpose of this is conducting uh, a transmission analysis, comparing cost and benefits of transmission build out scenarios across um, all of this uh, with the objectives of really looking at regional and interregional um, transmission needs uh, for offshore wind to meet the administration's goal uh, by 2030 and, uh, and beyond. That was, I don't think that was my slide, but uh, so uh, if you have any additional questions, obviously uh, I will be, uh, be happy to take uh, questions as you do that. I know these are very uh, technical financing and everything, but do wanna use the Q&A portion here to answer specific questions that folks may have um, as, a, as a part of our engagement here. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Great, and, and lots of information. <clears throat> so we're open now for questions and comments. Over here, go ahead. Thanks so much. Tom Harris with uh, Cape Fox Corporation and Kinnikot New. Uh, questions regarding cold bed methane uh, harvest of rare earth minerals. So particularly interested in whether or uh, not geothermal harvest as well is being used. There's uh, quite a resource up there. On the transportation electrical side, uh, is HVDC being considered for uh, the grid uh, for in that in particular um, high voltage uh, transmission 
uh, on, UT on railroad corridors. So gas first and transportation second, thank you. Hello. There, oh, we go. there we go. All right. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So on the, it's a great question on the on the uh, methane. Um, so when it comes to oil and gas uh, meth or 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 uh, coal mine methane, coal bed methane, um, if there's critical minerals that are going to be available, it's likely going to be in associated produced waters, so that they won't come up with the gas. And so the the question then becomes. Um, do you have a, a sufficient quantity of rare earths associated with with that scene? So you ha that has to be tested, but it's something that we can definitely test for. And when it comes to waters from oil and gas, um, in addition to um, rare earth elements, I think we should be looking for lithium and cobalt, and nickel, and other other critical minerals like that. Those are those may be better opportunities for 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 fluids that are coming up. And um, uh, when it when it comes to um, let's see, you had asked about not just coal bed methane, but uh, but oh fracking, yeah, yeah. So so the same kind of thing will be true from uh, from you know fluids associated with with oil and gas recovery and fracking. So it, it needs to be tested, and we need to determine if there's enough resources. Oh, you mentioned also geothermal, and so you know in geothermal uh, they are. You know the geothermal program. It's a different office than I'm in, but I, do, I am familiar with what they're doing. They're looking at uh, brines that come up in, in geothermal, and it, it's a very there. There are a lot of similarities there. So yeah, I'd be happy to be happy to talk more about uh, about that with you. I guess the rail ones for me. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Um, yeah, in terms of decarbonizing rail, um, you know we certainly are looking at electrification and and. Certainly lots of other countries use, um, you know, catenary electrification for, for freight transport. Um, you know, we're uh, like uh, in that effort, we are focused on uh, the R&D side and um, really focusing on the situations where that type of solution um, is not economical. Um, so w there are a number of freight routes in the country where um, you know where our stakeholders have said like this is there's not an economic case for necessarily that uh type of electrification so you know we're looking at um can they have a um, battery electric locomotive on the train that that can you know potentially it can recover some of the energy when braking you can maybe switch to all battery when you're um you know in a community so you're not um emitting um harmful emissions and then of course we you know we are looking at um biofuels and um, hydrogen as well as a, as a potential solution for for decarbonizing some of those um, longer freight routes that um, are, are really hard to electrify. Uh, what I meant was the bulk of the national grid is AC. We have wind power, but we don't have a much uh, mm -hmm. transcontinental HVDC lines. We have a transcontinental rail line. And if, we, if that HVDC line is embedded or part, made part of that rail line, quarter is already there. Uh, the question is, uh, is the current funding source allowing for the creation of high voltage DC inverted to AC that would transport, provide power for the uh, rail lines, but also provide power for the communities and provide a highway for uh, wind power and other uh, intermittent generation like solar to be part of the grid. So. Um, I don't know who the last question. speaker was, but that's, that's yeah. So ex use of existing rights of way and and getting exactly. at that. Yes. So uh, the administration has uh, been looking at this because we recognize that the part of infrastructure uh, uh, infrastructure development overall that there's a lot of new build taking place. Like for example, at the same time that we're talking about transmission build out, we're also doing quite a bit of broadband development on that. So there is the the quote dig once principle. If we can okay. do that that type of engagement, so. What we are doing is coordinating across agencies to do the best that we can to help uh, use existing rights of way uh, as uh, as that development comes for transmission and, and looking at ways uh, along rail railways as well. Right, and and for Alaska, what it means is uh, we have the rail line from Anchorage to Fairbanks, mm -hmm. but that rail line also has the utility corridor 
that utility corridor can only handle 25 megawatts. Mm -hmm. The need is much greater. If that line were converted to HVDC, now we can have three or four times that mm -hmm. amount of power and not have to build another generation plant up there. Yeah. So. Yes, I, I can say there are a lot of opportunities where we're talking about this uh, of looking at existing lines and where those can be uh, upgraded, modernized, reconducted uh, to, to look at these opportunities. So working with folks uh, actively on that. So more than happy to chat in more detail uh, as we can to, to talk about opportunities specific to, to what you're looking at. Thank you. Good, good question. One more question here. Hi, uh, Roseanne Ritkevich, California Public Utilities Commission. I have a two questions, but uh, one uh, somewhat like what he was talking about. Um, in our consultation with some of our Cal Southern California tribes, they have transmission lines that are running either right next to or right through their lands, but actually don't, don't power their lands. So in the development and expansion of the capacity of transmission, are you considering those sub-transmission lines that actually power the communities that it runs through? That's question number one. Second question is, you had some uh, figures about 60% uh, increased capacity and then tripling that by 2050. Does that take into consideration a high DER future? Because that's also what we've been talking about this whole time is the increase of DERs that, of generation that serves local capacity or local load. All right, let me just, okay. Uh, first, first side of that, uh, yes, we are, we are taking applications that are looking at this exact issue that you're talking about of localizing benefits and all applications that we're looking across, not just across our transmission investments, but more along the grid resilience uh, side of things that we talked about yesterday is trying to focus on that creative way of looking at both transmission and distribution infrastructure and how that benefits regional and community benefits as a part of that. Uh, so as a part of all applications and our engagement with industry that are that are looking at, at these investments, as well as with uh, all public, uh, the public side of things, uh, encouraging uh, folks to look at this creatively. Um, and, and so would love to talk more specifically about that. And if there are ideas on, on how to do that, love to think collaboratively around that um, and creatively of, of, of how that can provide benefits around that. So short answer is, is yes, uh, but, but obviously uh, we're working through uh, the, act, the solicitation process around that. So until we get application is a little hard to, to see what, what, what will come together. Um, on the DER uh, side of around this, yes, I, I do know when the Building a Better Grid initiative came out, it, uh, I think all of our logos had a bunch of transmission towers and there was a lot of thought that uh, we were doing 99% of our work on just transmission. Uh, can confirm that distribution and uh, upgrades are, are a part of that as well. Um, we are working actively around uh, opportunities that, um, that take that into account. The specific numbers that I was citing as, as a part of that study comes from a report that I'm not specifically familiar with of all the scenarios that are uh, accounted for as a part of that. That's really just trying to show uh, the scope of the, the challenge that we have that we know we do need to make these large investments uh, rapidly um, over the next 10 to, to 30 years to meet the, the clean energy future that we need. That does not mean that we are ignoring other opportunities within the distributed energy uh, side of things. Thank you for that question. One more. All right, Come I have on. three questions, one Ooh. for each of the three. Let me okay. start with Tori. Um, how many tribes are covered by the Nevi plan? I saw your map, but I didn't see the overlay of Indian country on it. So how many tribes are explicitly included and how many stations are included um, for Indian country in the state plan? Um, and then relatedly, tribal consultation was in the guidance. Um, I have tribes, I have clients in six states. None of those states consulted with the tribes. So, uh, and, and I've reviewed three of those plans and there's some lip service to Indian country in their plans. So at least for purposes of follow-up, what is the department gonna do, transportation and DOE to ensure that as these state plans get rolled out, um, if they have in fact avoided Indian country, and in many states it looks like they have, um, how are we gonna make sure that every 50 miles includes in Indian country and not on one side of the reservation and then on the next side of the reservation? So that's for Tori. For Mike, 
materials battery. The BIL has a prioritization that projects for battery materials um, should be given priority if they include Indian tribes or battery uh, materials and manufacturing on Indian lands. So what are you guys doing to ensure that there is more cooperation and discussion with tribes around battery manufacturing on tribal lands uh, per the statute? And then lastly, with transmission, substations included, or is it just power lines? Because power lines are, you know, they crisscross Indian country. Tribes, most tribes don't own the substations. They're owned by their own utilities. For tribes that have massive renewable resources, Part of the stranding of the asset is not only lack of transmission, but lack of being able to get it on existing lines. So does the transmission project even include assisting tribes with building out substations where they can own their own interconnection and effect into the grid? So one for each. Sorry, uh, Grant, we're gonna talk later about coal ash. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Let's start with Tori. Uh, great, thank you so much for those questions. Uh, they they're they're good and difficult to answer as as most good questions are um your first was how many tribes are covered in the the national the national network of chargers uh i don't don't have an answer to that question off um offhand i think we could we could do an analysis of that to to and the analysis would require looking at where there's an intersection between um, interstates and alternative fuel corridors. So I'm just going to reiterate the um, some of the geographic constraints of the of the NEVI program. So the NEVI program focuses um, formula funding dollars on interstates and alternative fuel corridors. Those alternative fuel corridors are um, were designated by states during. Um, uh, there, there's been six rounds of of identifying alternative fuel corridors. So the the question of of allocating those resources specifically to tribes is kind of a matter of the specific geography of that state. Um, now states are required to, as I mentioned in my presentation, states are required to demonstrate that 40% of benefits are, are, are accruing to disadvantaged communities. Tribes are included in the definition of disadvantaged communities. So there is, there is some direction there to states to, to focus some of those efforts um, potentially to tribes. Um, however, it, it, that's really only feasible within the constraints of the NEVI formula program um, if, those, if those tribes lie along either interstates or alternative fuel corridors. Um, the, the joint office is not, is not directing states to, um, to, we're not telling states where they need to put their, their NEVI charging stations, except for um, specific criteria of the program, which uh, you mentioned, I, I, I didn't even mention this. So you, you've done uh, your, your homework on the NEVI program that these charging stations have to be every 50 miles along corridors um, and they need to be within one mile of, of the interstate or alternative fuel uh, corridor. So, there, there really is uh, sometimes like a geographic constraint when it comes to the NEVI program in terms of getting charging stations onto onto tribal lands. Now, I will I will mention that that we're, what I'm talking about and focusing on here are geographic constraints of the NEVI program of the formula program, but it's not that those constraints will not be there when we talk about discussion discretionary grant funding um and that that i believe is really will be an opportunity for for tribal lands to um to get in on some of this funding and 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 receive some more of those benefits if they if they don't in fact um if they're not in fact along these interstates and corridors um the you that, that's my best answer for your first question. Your second question is, is how are states held accountable in their engagement with, with tribes? And I'm going to include tribes and, and, and disadvantaged communities. So the way that they're held accountable is, is through the certification of the state plans. And you mentioned that you had, you had reviewed three of them and, and were, were relatively unsatisfied with their commitment to engaging with tribes. And uh, I, I really appreciate that, that input. And um, the as we as we move along in the program, so this was the the first year. Um, 
guidance came out in in February and, and continued to come out until state plans were due August 1st. So states kind of had a, had, had a very limited amount of time to, to produce the, that first year plan. Um, and so we, we did our best to give as much technical assistance to those states as we possibly could to hold them to account um, to a reasonable degree. But that level of accountability um, will be increasing at, from year as, as the as the program progresses and the states have more time to actually um, take in our guidance and our technical assistance. So um, my, my answer is there, there will be more accountability with respect to engagement with tribes going forward into year two, three and, uh, and four plans. So um, the, the standard was, was, was possibly a little bit less this year as states only had a couple months to put their plans together. And that's probably not enough time to do meaningful engagement, but in, in years two, three, and four, uh, we will be holding states to, to a higher account. Thank you, Tori. I'm sure the tribes will be looking forward to that. So let's go on to Mike for the second question. Sure. Um, and first I'll, I'll just acknowledge actually the battery um, processing and manufacturing grants are, are being handled out of our manufacturing and energy supply chain office. Um, so if there's anyone here from that office, feel free to come and correct me. But uh, I was involved with, with um, the uh, start of, the, of those programs. So I, I do know a few ways that, um, uh, that uh, we did think about uh, prioritizing um, partnering with tribes. Um, uh, one is we did we did have a, a, a workshop with stakeholders uh, early on and um, uh, invited uh, a number of uh, um, stakeholders from from tribes to, to get involved there. And when we published the solicitation, we put out a, a teaming list and uh, recognizing that these were very big grants, um, you know, hundred million dollar cost share grants. Um, it was really important to, to have a, a venue for for people to um, be able to put their contact information in and and to form form up uh, on teams and um, i think that that worked pretty well and, and that's a, a practice that we're going to continue um, uh, another thing is that um you know in, in the solicitation we, you know we did require um a community benefits plan and and how they would engage with uh, uh local communities um and um, I believe we, we also uh, did have a um, program policy factor to um, uh, give select the selection official um, you know, the ability to select a, a project that even if it had a lower score, but it had um, you know, a very um, exemplary um, partnership with underserved communities and, um, uh, or, or tribes um, that they could uh, select that award. So uh, I wasn't again, I was involved in, in sort of the, the beginnings of those grants um, and um, uh, a little bit less involved with the uh, decision making um, uh, and, and um, uh, evaluation of those proposals. Okay, Dylan. Yeah, uh, and <clears throat> wherever sorry i lost you uh, <laughs> agreed yes the substation needs as a part of transmission development are uh, very important or a part of uh, eligible technologies as we're looking across the entire uh, segment of funding uh, available to this so i know presentation was kind of talking about it in the aggregate uh, but we do within the grid deployment office have a number of financing opportunities uh, that are inclusive of, of kind of everywhere from distribution um, up to the transmission need and finding again focusing around those local benefits and who uh, who stands to benefit so and, and substations too Does yeah you... yeah sorry if yeah. that was the main point of the question sorry yeah. I thought I mentioned that yes that is <laughs> yes that is part of it <laughs> okay well let's give a round of applause Thanks. for our panelists here okay our lunch speaker will start at what time again 12 12 35 so lunch is out there enjoy your lunch bring it back in and network and so thank you very much for <laughs> participating this morning and and have a great lunch thank you everybody
Yeah, we. Here, why don't I come down? Okay.
Hey everybody, hope you're enjoying your lunches. We'll get started with the lunch program in about three minutes. All right, thank you. All right, we're going to get started. Start to close your conversations. I know there's a lot. 
a lot of amazing dialogue happening. Um, <clears throat> I'm Wahila Johns, and if I haven't met you yet, I'm the director of the Office of Indian Energy and have been working closely with um, Congressional Intergovernmental Affairs at DOE to put this two-day gathering on. Um, I just want to give thanks also to all of the people that provided the food and um, provide the service for the food and everyone that works here um, to be able, I mean, I already had a discussion with somebody about, um, he made a comment about the being grateful for today and the rain and um, all that is that we have an abundance of, of joy and health. And so that was nice to hear a staff member here have that dialogue. So, and that um, reminds me of just the energy that we can build um, if we come together. And so thank you for those comments. And uh, today for lunch, we have a guest speaker. His name is Jeremiah Brown Bauman. He is the Chief of Staff of the Under Secretary for Inter Infrastructure. He was previously the DOE Deputy Chief of Staff. Prior to DOE, he was the Director of the Federal Policy at Energy Innovation, where he worked to build an equitable and just clean energy economy. He previously led efforts focused on state clean energy policies at Bloomberg Philanthropies and served as a legislative director for Senator Jeff Merkley, where he supported the senator on the creation of the Rural Energy Savings Program and worked with Oregon and California tribes, farmers and ranchers on water and energy management in the Klamath River Basin. Originally from Montana and a, mem a member of the LGBTQ plus community, Bauman holds a BA from Yale University. Let's all welcome Jeremiah. Great, thank you, Wahela. Um, and for everybody who has gotten to work with Wahela and the Office of Indian Energy, um, how about Wahela and the Office of Indian Energy and this great event? Um, it's been, um, having been fortunate enough to work a little bit on uh, mostly rural energy issues in the West in terms of my own um, experience working with tribal nations, it's been a real honor to get to work at DOE with Wahela and the Office of Indian Energy, especially with an administration and a secretary who are so committed to figuring out how to improve on the past and build all these new programs and resources in a way that will work better um, for tribal nations across the country. Um, so as Wahela explained, I'm the chief of staff at the, for the Undersecretary for Infrastructure. The uh, non-DOE speak way to say that is probably that most of DOE's bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act programs are housed in the Office of the Undersecretary for Infrastructure. So we're coordinating the standing up and building of all these new programs and policies. Um, I imagine um, if all of you are anything like we are, it's a little overwhelming. Uh, DOE got 72 programs under the bipartisan infrastructure law, another 12, I think, in the Inflation Reduction Act, and all except for 10 are new programs that we have to design from scratch. So we've got a lot to put together, but what part of what we're trying to figure out is how to best help people like you and partners that we want to work with and support across the country understand the opportunities. And so I thought what I would do with just a few minutes here is actually sort of just walk through to kind of connect some of the dots between the offices you're hearing about yesterday and today, the programs you're hearing about, where do these things actually all sit and how do you sort of navigate it at DOE. Um, so I have a couple of slides just to kind of show you how we are set up um, and how DOE is sort of aligned to best support um, the tribal nations and other partners in building a new clean energy economy. So on the first slide, um, is a very simple uh, org chart, I think. Do I, oh, I probably need to advance these slides myself. Look at that. It's like superpowers up here. Um, this is like the most basic way at the highest level that the DOE is organized. And the point of this is to explain sort of, I think a little bit about where we're at, not just as the Department of Energy, but where we kind of think, see ourselves at as a, as a country um, and as a planet which is if you look at those middle two boxes there, we've traditionally had an undersecretary that does the, um, the nuclear security part of Department of Energy. And we've had a security, uh, a secretary that does the um, non-nuclear security, the rest of the energy world, basically the energy for society part of it. Um, 
And so that is what we've actually made a change to implement all this funding and to be better partners to communities across the country by launching this new Undersecretary for Infrastructure. And the idea is that 80% of the Department of Energy's funding historically on energy work has been for research and development, pretty early stage work to develop new energy technologies, working in labs, working with our own, we have 17 national labs, we work with universities across the country. But where are we at in terms of solving climate change? You all know as well as I think anyone, we have the technology for most of the problem now. Not only, not only do we have wind and solar and battery storage that are working and being deployed, they're actually cheaper than a lot of traditional energy technologies. And for most states and communities, the faster you can deploy that clean stuff, the um, faster we're going to solve climate change. Um, and not only that, you're going to actually reduce bills because it's cheaper. It's cheaper to stop doing what we've been doing and switch to this new system. So we know that deploying that technology is actually the biggest challenge facing most communities. How do you just get that clean energy built in your community to get those benefits? Similarly, we know there's another wave of technologies that's going to be critical to full decarbonization, like hydrogen, like carbon management, next generation energy storage. Those really need not just more lab research, they need that too, but they actually just need real world trial runs, what we call commercial demonstrations to show how they work. And so this new Undersecretary for Infrastructure is all about that, uh, deploying the technology that we've got and then commercializing and demonstrating the next wave of technology to help not just investors and companies that might build it or use it figure it out, but to help communities where these kind of technologies might get cited, understand the technologies, understand the ups and downs. So this is a high level is kind of what, what it means um, to, to do this reorganization, to focus on how do we actually work with communities to deploy these energy technologies. First, on the kind of left half there, under the Undersecretary for Science and Innovation, which is the part of DOE that's, that's the longstanding part people probably know well, that's where you see our technology offices, right? Energy efficiency and renewable energy, fossil energy and carbon management. They're organized by technology and they really do that so kind of starting with research and development all the way up through the first kind of pilots and demonstrating how technologies might work. And then what happens basically is the idea is essentially they hand it off to the Undersecretary for Infrastructure Offices to figure out the more community and public facing big scale demonstration like let's go out and build an actual real world hydrogen hub to see how this works when really all the different parts of community and the private sector have to work together and how do we just help deploy things so the biggest th difference you'll see is that that new undersecretary for infrastructure is not organized by technology there's not a different office from renewable energy than there is from nuclear energy it's really organized in a lot of ways around the um who basically we are trying to work with and how we're trying to get these technologies deployed. So that's why we've got an office of state and community energy programs. States and communities have so many policy levers, um, just like a lot of tribal nations do, to help get more clean energy deployed in their communities, especially with it as cheap as it is now. How can we do a better job um, uh, supporting them in that? Similarly, you've got the office, uh, the grid deployment office, which is doing all the work with transmission owners and operators and the funds that go to upgrading and modernizing the grid. The Office of Indian Energy Policies and Programs has now moved into this new undersecretary's office. So that they are, have, um, are, are right there side by side with states and communities of manufacturing, with the loan program office, with all of it. And so what you'll see here is that each of these offices basically focuses on different types of ways to demonstrate or deploy clean energy. Um, including some new offices and some existing offices. This then is just the our Undersecretary for Infrastructure offices to give you a little bit richer sense of what these offices actually do and the basic categories of funding that these offices have to give you a better sense of um, who you want to be engaging with on what kinds of projects, what kinds of energy opportunities. Um, I'll say one thing as a starting point. Number one, as you all know, the Office of Indian Energy is always a great starting point including to help navigate um, across all these other opportunities. So the whole idea is not memorize the slide and don't ask us for help again, quite the opposite. This is a little bit of a roadmap, but let us know how we can better help you find the right opportunities for your uh, nation as you're pursuing this. But I'll just very quickly highlight a few things. As I said, grid deployment does the transmission and distribution grid. They also do the programs that Congress gave us that focus on how to maintain and enhance existing clean generation out there. So I know I've talked to a few tribal leaders who are very interested in upgrades and improvements to hydroelectric facilities. That is in the grid deployment office. 
Um, and then I know there's also issues around some of the existing civilian nuclear power plants. The program that Congress wrote that is funding to keep those power plants operating if they are safe and reliable is also in that office. Manufacturing energy supply chains is what it sounds like. It's all about building up manufacturing and production capacity so that we don't become dependent on foreign countries um, for critical energy technologies or that we reduce our dependence in cases where we already are. So there's a lot of funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law for battery manufacturing and all flags. I know some tribal nations are concerned about some of the impacts around some critical minerals issues. They do also have funding for critical minerals production, um, not for the actual mining or extraction, but for I think two interesting opportunities. One, just processing the material. So a lot of our dependence on countries like China is not that we don't have the minerals, we are actually producing the minerals, but we're sending them to China to get processed and sent back to us. So building that processing capacity here. The other one, all, all flags, I know a lot of tribal nations have um, nearby either coal power plant or other fossil fuel kind of waste material, mining waste contamination issues. Um, the DOE labs have developed ways to extract those critical minerals from that waste material in the course of cleaning up a site. So you can both get industrial level jobs and get critical minerals that we need for batteries, for wind turbines, et cetera, in the course of actually cleaning up that waste from old coal mining or coal ash burning um, or mining. So that's another big opportunity there. State and community energy programs is what it sounds like. They're kind of a one-stop shop for states and local communities. Um, you'll see on the list there, some of the um, existing programs like state energy program and weatherization uh, move over into that office, as well as the new funding for programs like electrification and home efficiency rebates um, will all be in that um, office. You'll know the Office of Indian Energy Policies and Programs. Congress unfortunately did not include a huge increase for that office in the two new laws, but we did in appropriations uh, this last cycle get a big increase in the regular funding for Indian Energy Office, and we're asking for another one. Um, so they will continue to be a critical element of the team here, of course. Clean energy demonstrations is really that kind of next wave technologies that need more commercialization, more kicking the tires to help the private sector and states and communities and tribal nations understand what these technologies are to understand how they feel about um, the job opportunity, whether they want those cited nearby. And you can see the range of technologies there, but a lot on hydrogen and carbon management, but as, as well as energy storage and a few other key areas. The loan programs office, of course, has the big tribal energy loan guarantee program. So that's a bit that's our single biggest funded program that is specifically for tribal nations. The in general, you'll see their funding is pretty open ended. It's generally large advanced energy projects and infrastructure from manufacturing to transportation infrastructure to uh, just large energy projects. And then finally, I'll just flag cybersecurity and emergency response. Um, are also in that office, as well as the Federal Energy Management Program, uh, which does really critical work working with, all, working with all of our federal agency partners on how they decarbonize, how they reduce building energy use or electrify their vehicle fleets. And oftentimes, I think people think that as that is sort of a very DC thing, but keep in mind there are federal buildings and probably most of the communities that you engage with. And so there's opportunities there for them to create local economic activity by doing building retrofits or um, vehicle work in their communities. That's really all I wanted to cover here. I just wanted to kind of give everybody a little bit of a roadmap. Why don't I take uh, whatever remaining time while Hale and Matt tell me we have to see what questions people have on any of this on the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or Inflation Reduction Act generally. Good, how are you? Good, I just have uh, one question. When it comes to the, um, the funding for these energy projects that you guys have available, now, uh, what's the size of these projects? But what I'm seeing right now, there's a lot of uh, grants that are available for some of these projects, but because the matching funds are are not may not be in place, can they use a portion of the lending from your department to offset that since you can go to third party funding? So this is a great question. Um, the answer, uh, there's a couple of answers for you. Number one, uh, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, divided all, divided all this funding into 80 separate pots of money that each has their own rules. <laughs> so it's hard to answer universally. Um, in general, and, and the grant sizes, though, vary quite widely. So hydrogen hubs, for example, could literally have some single projects that are getting a billion dollars of federal. That's how Congress designed that particular program. All the way down to energy efficiency conservation block grants, 
um, which go by formula out to a lot of communities, local communities, including tribal nations, Congress gave us way less funding than in the Recovery Act, but they didn't change the formula. So those grants could be as small as tens of thousands of dollars when that actually happens. So a couple of things there, there are a couple of challenges around this that I'll just highlight. One is the matching opportunity. You can't, across the board in general, you cannot use the loan program office as part of the match. It has to be completely non-federal. The only, there is some quote unquote double dipping allowed, and that's only that the same project can benefit from a tax credit and also from a DOE grant or loan. So the tax credits are allowed on top of DOE funding, but not multiple kinds of DOE funding, basically. Okay, so the other question is, there, there is certain situations, especially for uh, federal agencies that we understand you can't do, you know, f funding or something from multiple federal agencies, but I thought there was also a situation that if they can get a request from a federal facility that they might opt out to say, oh yeah, since this is a request and this is a, a situation that we might need the funding, they have the ability to do that. Is that correct? I think in terms of getting two different federal grants for the same project, mm -hmm. I mean, the ultimate answer should come from the specific program in question because said so there are a couple of exceptions, but Congress wrote in a thing that sort of just said you can't get two grants for the same project. So it's pretty hard to do that version of it. Now on the cost share side, agencies do have some discretion. So we're really trying to figure out, especially someone flagged yesterday, there's one of these grid programs, there's actually a double match because the funding goes by formula to the state. And if they then partner with a tribal nation, whoever they give it to also has a cost share. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to look at like how broad is our authority to just reduce or, or waive cost share in certain circumstances is one thing we're doing. And then for the smaller grants, one thing that we're really exploring right now, which we'd love any feedback people have on is, you know, I'm assuming just based on what we've heard from a lot of you, if you're getting a $20,000, $30,000, $80,000 grant, it may not even be worth what it costs to apply and do the reporting and all that. So we're looking at what kinds of creative solutions, like could you choose to say, instead of getting the grant that you could get, could you get like a voucher basically that you can use to go procure that much service for technical assistance to plan projects mm -hmm. for engineering and lawyering, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at creative solutions like that as well. Okay, so is the, a grant, of sorrow, a grant and loan is two different type of funding. Correct. That's right. So you guys consider, so not just giving it, I'm with 3M and we're doing a project in a very poor community. We're thinking, uh, we're talking about 20, by putting uh, energy savings in, tw in almost 5,000 poor schools. And that project is about $25 million. Now we don't know if there's going to be a, a, a matching grant because it haven't came out yet, but we're, we're considering there's going to be some type of offset. So if that project is to say is $28 million, and there's a, and this is a poor community, so we're talking about the Justice for the Initiative, so that comes out to be maybe 90% if that, that the federal government pay for, and, and then the community have to come up with the additional 10% if that's how it normally looks right now. So that portion of the 10% would not be granted, that's more of a loan if you go through your, your organization. So it's not, it's not like a loaning, it's not like a grant and then a grant, it's a, it's a grant plus a loan. Would that qualify at that point? We'll have to talk about details, probably specific to that project, okay. that program. All right, all yeah. right, just trying to figure out the, <laughs> yeah. the demographics behind all that, how that, how that links in. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. Is you over here? I usually try to take my microphone away <laughs> from me, so I'm used to that. But thank you for the batteries. Uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to congratulate you for providing that top down approach. Yesterday, we heard about some amazing department programs, okay? Many, many programs, but it was hard for me, and I know hard for some people I talk to, to really try to figure out where do I go in for something that I want to try to do. And, and uh, Mr. Castro, gave a little guidance about there is a site on the DOE site where there's 68 or whatever things. But this type of top down would have been very useful at the beginning. And I know it's hard to, to manage an agenda, but uh, thank you very much for doing it. Sure, and we can get it circulated to everybody as well to make sure that that's available. Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Ashish Goel. I'm with a company called Intech Energy. Um, uh, actually, I really do want to second that comment. It was really very helpful to just get a holistic view 
of what parts are where and uh, so, so, so thank you. Uh, just a second comment. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed across the theme, you know, energy efficiency, energy management, those sort of things have not sort of risen up to the top in general. I'm in California and one of the first things they say is, hey, reduce energy use and then do all these other things. And uh, we, we do energy, I've done energy efficiency all my life, does you know, energy monitoring, energy management, all of those components, and now as well as indoor air quality monitoring and management. But that was a, just a component that, you know, just, you know, stuck out to me. And I just wanted to, you know, ask, it does show up in, in the SCEP part of it as a small piece, but it would be nice if sort of folks understood who are not really you know, you know, like, you know, like the tribes, etc. that it would be helpful to have that as a primary number as a lead in, and then do all the other components just so that you optimize how you size your solar or battery or whatever. Anyway, just to talk. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a basic part of any kind of energy project planning. And it's that's certainly an approach that is infused throughout these offices, in addition to some of the specific ones like the state and community programs and some of the industrial programs that will, I think, particularly focus on efficiency. Over here. David Wilcox, Reach Scale. Um, this is a, a question that I don't think would normally be asked. Um, the whole conference has been totally domestically focused, which is totally appropriate, and totally agree with that focus. How do the bigger global issues get dealt with, both with respect to the value that's being created in the US that needs to be used elsewhere in the world? And also with respect to the fact that there are dozens of other countries who are attempting to do similar things and creating solutions that we may not be aware of that could come here. And then even bigger issues like uh, the EU has recently decided to support something we've been recommending for several years, which is to move the China supply chains to India and Africa. That movement would require all of the aspects of the American government if it decided to support it. And many of the projects that would be created out of that would also be appropriate for Indian country. The same projects could literally go to all three places. And you could put them, many of them here, because of you eliminating the transportation costs. So how does that kind of multi-department, uh, multi-ministry, multi-country set of policies get dealt with? Who deals with it? How does it get implemented? I know USAID as a whole set of activities in these areas. How does that get coordinated with across the government? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of, first of all, in terms of um, building up clean energy manufacturing and supply chain opportunities, um, and that this kind of manufacturing job creation in Indian country, wherever tribal nations want that, that's certainly a big focus for this Office of Manufacturing Energy Supply Chains. Um, uh, I'll answer your international coordination question briefly, and then come back to one other point you reminded me that that would be good to make sure everyone understands on the international coordination the oe has a whole um, international affairs department that works closely with state department um and it, there's a lot of parallel initiatives coordinating with other countries to commercialize these new technologies but to be clear we're definitely trying to get the manufacturing jobs here wherever we can um the last thing i will say though because i think it does kind of get at this notion of sort of how do tribal nations engage with us for all of those programs listed you know and that was just a summary of them that are literally um almost 100 programs one thing that we're doing, even the ones that, you know, to great frustration, a lot of them don't have separate carve outs from Congress for tribal nations to apply in a, in a more conducive process. So number one, we are looking for every place where we might be allowed to do that. Even if then Congress didn't explicitly tell us to do that. So we've, that's one piece of feedback we've heard. The other thing is that we are doing this program, which you might've heard in other sessions called the community benefits plan to help fulfill the president's commitments on and protect, especially Justice 40, but also to good jobs and high labor standards. Um, what we're doing is requiring every applicant to all these infrastructure programs to describe what their plan is for creating not just any jobs, but good jobs for addressing diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and for what they're doing to get 40% of the benefits of that project into disadvantaged communities, including Indian country. 
And so literally, and then they get scored on that. So literally every applicant for DOE funds gets scored on whether they're partnering with disadvantaged communities and actually creating real value there. So that's the other thing I think is you're seeing, especially if you're seeing like companies or states apply for projects that are near or affecting you, know that they're being asked by us how they're engaging with your community and what kind of benefits they're creating. Um, and we wanna make sure that's actually happening. So feel free to uh, approach us with any uh, issues around any of that. Should we do one more, Dottie? Thank you, Jeremiah. So good to see you. Dottie Lee from Trans-Pacific Communications. I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but just um, so that I could get some kind of clear indication and answer from, from the leadership right here. Um, you mentioned DEIA, which is uh, the Presidential EO 13985, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility. That is music to to my ears. Um, I'm going to focus on the A, which is accessibility. And uh, as you already know, my company, Trans-Pacific Communications, provides translation in 200 plus languages that include uh, tribal and, and indigenous languages. So it is about providing language access and, and language justice, as we discussed uh, quite a few weeks ago, and it's also in supporting the Justice Week. I um, wanted to get a sense from you, from the department, what is your vision in making sure that tribal languages are included in your messaging, in your announcements, RFIs and grants announcements and statement of work and so on and so forth. So, you know, I'd like to hear, hear that uh, and could you shed some light so that we could be of support and, and of service. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thanks, Tati. Yeah, I know the, the commit to accessibility is incredibly important. And of course that includes language accessibility. Um, I don't know that there is sort of a comprehensive approach in the federal government for how you approach which, where to prioritize tribal language translation services, but which is something that we should be talking about um, and would welcome any feedback on kind of, kind of which indigenous language are highest priority to get translation uh, to make sure that accessibility is there. Over here. Yeah, it's Ken Hibben from the Small Business Office. Um, quite frequently, um, people are, it's useful to remind folks that we're the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. So if um, anyone here is looking for a, a landing site or a starting point, um, my colleagues and I in the OSDABU, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization are at your service. So just uh, a plug. That's an excellent plug. And to that point, one of the, one of the ways that applicants for DOE funding actually get um, points in these community benefits plan is by partnering directly with uh, minority owned or disadvantaged businesses in a way that's creating real economic value, creating wealth um, in, the, in communities. So that's another um, opportunity here, hopefully. Should we move on? All right, thanks everybody. So I think that concludes this time. Uh, when 1.30, we're convening back in here. All right.
Welcome back. Yeah, let's um, make our way to our seats so that we can continue with our next session. And this is going to cover workforce development, transition, and capacity. So um, I think everybody's here that wants to be here, needs to be here. Um, our next session is actually going to be all virtual, so you'll you'll see their name tags here, but but <laughs> but they're going to be virtual. So you know, technology and the sign of times. And so um, we will hear about this. So today we're going to talk about in this, in this session STEM education, workforce transition and retention workforce development to support energy transition, and then community benefits agreements. So as I said earlier, our, our speakers are all virtual. Uh, we're gonna hear from Betty jo uh, Batoni Jones, Director, Office of Energy Jobs. Uh, we also have, uh, and my apologies for the pronunciation, Sonrisa Lucero, Special Advisor, Stakeholder Engagement, and then we'll have uh, Christy uh, Jackie Wicks, my, my apologies, Chief for the Minority Education Institution Division. So um, can we see their faces on, how do we do that? Can we see them? Okay. Okay, so we're gonna start with uh, Batoni Jones, Director, Office of Energy Jobs. So. Take it away, Batoni. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. You okay. Can Go ahead. I'm having some audio, some audio issues. So I think you can hear me. So. First of all, it's so exciting to be here and thank you for having us and thank you for accommodating the virtual, the all virtual session right after lunch. I know that can be challenging 
Um, the run of show here is that my colleague Sonrisa and I are going to talk about how DOE is uh, is incorporating workforce and equity issues through an integrated approach and what we're asking for in applications for funding, how we're leaning into these priorities. And then uh, we'll hand it over. So there will be a little back and forth in this first presentation. And then we'll hand it over to our colleague, Christy, uh, to talk about the, um, the MSI engagement. So to start with, let's figure out how to advance. Okay. There we go. Uh, how is DOE addressing workforce and equity goals and funding opportunities? There's, uh, and it, I guess we should start with what are those goals in the first place? So here's four goals that we've identified uh, that are sort of intersecting and overlapping. One is to prioritize benefits to disadvantaged communities. The second one is to ensure equitable access to the wealth building opportunities that are created from the implementation of our program. Number three is to ensure that the jobs we're creating are good family sustaining jobs with career track training that will create a skilled workforce necessary to meet our, our energy goals. Uh, and four, uh, to ensure that impacted workers and communities have a voice throughout the process of from design to implementation uh, throughout the process of implementing these projects. The way that we're addressing these goals is through something that we're calling the Community Benefits Plan. And the Community Benefit Plan has four priorities, which reflect the goals on the previous slide. First, Justice 40. Uh, just the goal of the Justice 40 initiative is to meet or exceed the objective that 40% of the benefits of the implementation of these programs will accrue to disadvantaged communities. Second, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, ensuring access to wealth building opportunities, everything from the composition of the team that is applying for funding, access to the jobs that are created from the implementation of the funding, business and contracting opportunities for underrepresented and disadvantaged uh, business owners. Um, third, creating good quality jobs. So creating, retaining high quality jobs, attracting, retaining, and training a skilled workforce. Go into a little bit more detail on all of these later. And then workforce and community engagement that leads to formal agreements with labor partners and community partners, particularly uh, those representing disadvantaged communities. How can we ensure accountability in the implementation of this project, the accountability to tribal communities, to disadvantaged communities, to impacted workers? In most cases with our funding opportunities, particularly in the bipartisan infrastructure bill law, uh, these plans equate to 20% of the technical merit points. So 20% of the scoring of proposals that we uh, receive are, are, is weighted across these four priorities. So our, our perspective is that 20% is too big for funding applicants to ignore. They really do need to develop plans for how they will meet and address these goals. Um, so, <coughs> Excuse me. To go into a little bit more detail, these goals intersect and overlap. We're not siloing Justice 40 and siloing diversity, equity, and inclusion and siloing good jobs. We need to ensure that there's integration across these things so that from a Justice 40 perspective, that the benefits we're creating don't just stop at access to jobs, but that we're really ensuring good quality, family-sustaining jobs that we don't just aim to achieve diversity without equity, right? That, that, uh, that equity in the, DEIA, um, in the DEIA realm includes access to the wealth building opportunities. Uh, and then finally, good jobs. It's great to ensure that we're creating good quality jobs, but if they're not correcting for historic racism and sexism in the labor market, then we're not fully achieving our goals. So none of these can be siloed. They're all important and they intersect. 
And the accountability to each of these goals really comes in the form of workforce and community agreement, which means that we are asking funding applicants to engage with and negotiate agreements committing to sharing benefits and addressing burdens in the communities in which these projects are located. We're not interested in stakeholder engagement as a box checking exercise. We really want it to lead to something where the community is involved throughout the process and there's some accountability, not just to DOE, but to the community impacted and the workers as well. So to provide the, the overview of how this is getting baked in to our funding opportunities, um, these plans must include something measurable. We need specific SMART milestones. SMART, SMART stands for specific, measurable, assignable, realistic, and time-based. We don't want vague, vague promises or vague ideas about how these things could be addressed. We really want applicants to think very concretely about how to bake in these priorities to the implementation, the design and implementation of their projects. Um, second, as I already mentioned, in most cases, these plans will be evaluated and account for 20% of the score of a project. These are evaluated by subject matter experts and we are on a constant mission to recruit more subject matter experts who can adequately review and score these uh, community benefits plans. Um, if the project is selected, then these commitments that are made voluntarily in the application process and scored become contractual obligations. So they get put into the, the, funding, the funding agreement and, <clears throat> and over the life of the execution of the project, here we will evaluate progress including points where there's no go, no go decision. So we're really thinking upfront about how to ensure accountability across these plans and the implementation of them. I'm gonna hand it over now to Sonrisa to talk about specifically provide more detail on the Justice 40 initiative and the DEIA elements of these plans. Thank you, Bethany. I appreciate that. And hello, everybody. I'm Sandrita Lucero in our Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. And I'm, uh, it's a real honor to be here with you all today. Um, the, for the Justice 40 Initiative, the first time in our nation, for the first time in our nation's history, the federal government made a goal that 40% of the overall benefit of certain federal investments, and those are listed here, so climate change, clean energy, energy efficiency, clean transit, affordable and sustainable housing, training and workforce development, the remediation and reduction of legacy pollution and the development of clean water infrastructure must flow to underserved and overburdened communities uh, by pollution. And President Biden made this historic commitment when he signed Executive Order 14008 within the first few days of taking office. So as a part of the, of the Community Benefits Plan, applicants for DOE funding are required to submit a Justice 40 initiative plan, which would provide an overview of the benefits that can be supported by measurable metrics and describe the benefits to disadvantaged communities. So applicants must provide an overview of the benefits to disadvantaged communities that the project can deliver, supported by measurable milestones, as Bethany had mentioned. And so that Justice 40 initiative section has to include four different areas, which are the identification of applicable disadvantaged communities to which the anticipated project benefits will flow, the identification of applicable benefits that are quantifiable, measurable, trackable, and including at a minimum, a discussion of the relevance of each of the eight DOE Justice 40 initiative benefits, which I'm gonna talk about in another slide or two. Uh, also a description of how and when anticipated benefits are expected to flow to disadvantaged communities. And, uh, and then finally, a discussion of anticipated negative and cumulative environmental impacts on disadvantaged communities. And for some of these, we want people to really think about what, what are the benefits that are gonna be provided directly within the disadvantaged communities? How are they, ident and identify them in this Justice 40 initiative section? 
And then also, are there are, are they going to be benefiting those communities directly, or are they flowing in some other way? We want the applicants to describe that. We want to make sure that the projects are going to be flowing during the project development or after its completion. And then also to know how the applicant is going to be tracking those benefits that are delivered. Other questions that we want them to ask themselves are there are, are there anticipated negative or positive environmental impacts associated with the project? Will the applicant mitigate any negative impacts that do occur? And within the context of cumulative impacts, those that are created over time at that end that are also created by the project, will the app the applicants should be using the Environmental and Protection Agency's EJ screen tool or to quantitatively discuss the existing environmental impacts within that project area. And then, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the section of the plan, the, this community benefits plan, is going to be incorporated into the final award contract and memorialized uh, that way, but also we hope that they'll be incorporated through this mechanism that we're describing as a community benefits agreement or similar document that will be included uh, within uh, the final award contract. And that contract should also include the appropriate milestone uh, for the benefit uh, delivery. Um, and I did not say next slide a couple of times there, Bethany, so if you don't mind, um, go ahead and hover on the next slide just for a moment. So people can take a quick look at that one and then yeah we can go to the next one there we go so a question that is is pretty relevant to all of this is what is a disadvantaged community and there's two ways that it's being defined both by a definition that doe is using uh and so we have our own metric or, or method of using it that use 36 different indicators such as energy burden, housing burden, park access, power outages, cancer incidents, and so on, to determine a level of disadvantagedness. And then also um, compare this, uh, so this is at the census tract level, and then compare this at uh, state by state. And the top 20% communities that are deemed disadvantaged are, are the uh, around that level, that scale of disadvantage, are the ones that are the disadvantaged communities and qualify under uh, this this um, program. But I also I want to know as is here on the slide that all tribal lands are included in the disadvantaged community definition. And so automatically they are part of the Justice 40 uh, initiative and included in that area. Um, next slide, please. So then I want to now I want to talk a little bit about what a qualifying benefit is and, and how they have to be outlined within the community benefits plan. And so, uh, and again, this section of the plan is going to be incorporated into the award and memorialized, hopefully through an enforceable community benefits agreement or a similar document, but at least in the contract award or the uh, award contract. And so uh, we have eight different areas, policy priority areas within the Justice 40 initiative. Two of them are for decreasing harms, so decreasing energy burden, decreasing the environmental exposure and burdens. And then we have six of them that are about increasing the good, increasing the positivity in the in the disadvantaged community. So increasing parity in clean energy technology and access, increasing access to low cost capital, increasing clean energy enterprise creation in disadvantaged communities, increasing good clean energy jobs and job training for individuals from DACs, increasing energy resiliency and increasing energy democracy. And then again, all of these benefits must be measurable. They can be direct or indirect, and then they must flow to one of the dis qualifying disadvantaged communities. Uh, next slide, please. So now I want to talk about another one of the buckets that we uh, that Bethany introduced, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Executive Order 13985, Advancing Racial Equity and Support for Underserved Communities Through the Federal Government, and Executive Order 11246, uh, which require, require all federally assisted contractors to make good faith efforts to meet the goals that 6.9% of construction project hours are performed by women and a certain percentage of construction work hours, depending on the geography, are performed by people of color. And so in keeping with the spirit of these executive orders, 
applicants for DOE funding must submit diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility plans describing how uh, these objectives will be incorporated into their projects. And then as part of a whole of government approach to advancing equity, DOE's funding opportunities seek to encourage the participation of underserved communities and underrepresented groups and ensure equitable access to business opportunities, good paying jobs, career track training, and other economic opportunities. And so in order to do this, uh, the community benefits plan must describe uh, and detail how the project teams will partner with underrepresented businesses, educational institutions, training organizations that serve workers who face barriers to accepting quality jobs, and other uh, and other types of uh, partners that help address DEIA. And again, uh, we need to make sure that there's a SMART goal associated uh, per budget period. And then another element that's incredibly important in this section too, is that we include we encourage the inclusion of letters of support from historically excluded geographies, uh, racial minorities, and women as a part of the applicant proposals. Next slide, please. All right, and then finally here, um, there's some, we do wanted to provide just a few examples uh, or just a couple of examples of how to a project team can incorporate DEIA and what that might look like. So it could be identifying minority business enterprises, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, veteran owned businesses, to solicit as vendors and subcontractors for bids on supply services and equipment, um, it could be um, to fill open positions and so actually contracting uh, for the DOE funded project and partner with workforce training organizations that serve underrepresented communities or those facing systemat systemic barriers to quality and employment, such as those with disabilities, returning citizens, opportunity youth, and veterans. And with that, I will turn it back over to Bethany to round us out for the rest of the presentation. I am so sorry about that. Okay, I'll start over. Uh, so leaning into the opportunities to create good jobs, uh, we're asking funding applicants to detail commitments and plans across four different parameters. One is the commitment to pay above average wages and benefits for both construction and importantly, the ongoing operations or production jobs. For most of the bipartisan infrastructure law construction activities, uh, prevailing wage, Davis-Bacon prevailing wage requirements kick in, uh, but those wages vary significantly by region and they don't apply to the ongoing operations jobs. So we're trying to make sure that this supports improved job quality in both phases. Second, we're asking uh, applicants how they are going to ensure that workers have a free and fair chance to form or join a union. A bit more on that in the next slide. Uh, third, we're asking how uh, funding applicants plan to invest in workforce training to support the development of a skilled workforce and provide pathways to advancement for workers. So a lot of people ask us where the workforce development money is in the bipartisan infrastructure law. And there are a few specific provisions around workforce development, but by and large, most of the workforce development activities and investments need to happen through the projects themselves. So how do you ensure that the, the funding uh, recipient is making those investments and engaging in those partnerships with training providers and apprenticeship programs and whatnot to ensure the development of a skilled workforce? Um, and then fourth, and this is really important, how is how are workers involved in the design and implementation of workplace health and safety plans. We know that uh, that workers have a have a specific uh, and particular perspective over what the certain risks and hazards are 
and have obviously uh, equities in the in workplace health and safety. So we really want to make sure that workers are involved in the development of health and safety plans and that it's not something uh, that where they have no no say. Um, where uh, there's there's actually, I think, six executive orders that really lean into the importance of job quality and specifically creating and supporting union jobs. The, the executive order signed last April on worker organizing and empowerment really doubles down on an existing federal commitment and law um, <coughs> from the National Labor Relations Act signed in 1935 which uh, proclaims that it is the policy of the United States government to encourage worker organizing and collective bargaining and promote the equality of bargaining power between employers and employees. So this has been existing federal law for 85 years, if I'm doing my math right, um, 87 years. Uh, and this administration is really uh, re reconfirming the, uh, the federal government's responsibility and intention in this way. So given that, and this is some language from the executive order itself, that union membership increases wages, increases the likelihood of receiving employer provided benefits and increases job security, and also gives workers the means to build power and ensure their voices are heard in their workplaces, their communities, and in the nation, uh, it is the policy of the administration to reaffirm the federal government's commitment to worker to supporting and encouraging worker organizing and collective bargaining and so that's kind of the framework for why the worker voice on the job access to union um, and worker voice uh, in this health and safety plan uh, is so important um, building off of that uh, we really, really recognize that accountability is the is is the the crux issue here. People can send us plans. We can put those into funding agreements, and we can you know ask for reporting and and track progress. But uh, funding recipients are not only accountable to DOE and the taxpayers. They're also accountable to their workers and to the communities in which these projects are based. And we want to really ensure that there's practices for that accountability as well, that we have multiple layers. And so we're asking applicants to describe their plans to engage with labor unions, tribal governments, community-based organizations representing local stakeholders, including disadvantaged communities. And those plans are really important, but we also want to see those plans lead to negotiated formal agreements that detail the benefits, the obligations of partners and remedies in order to ensure that accountability. So we're calling these broadly workforce and community agreements, but they might entail things like uh, community benefits agreements and the, the Department of Energy has a toolkit um, on community benefits agreements. Good neighbor agreements are other such agreements that we've seen um, work well. And then there's collective bargaining agreements so project labor agreements, community workforce agreements, which are project labor agreements that detail the access to the jobs for the local community, and other forms of collective bargaining agreements beyond the construction activity. These, and, and these are not um, one or the other. We, we're really looking for uh, agreements across the, the spectrum and, and making sure that, uh, that workers and communities have a voice and that these projects are in fact, in reality, leading to broadly shared prosperity in their implementation. And with that, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and hand it over to Christy uh, Jackowitz. So this is definitely, um, Zoom has its own special experience. Um, thank you, Bethany. Can you see my screen okay? Hard to tell what, what is visible. Oh, 
great. Okay. Um, I can see it. I think we can see it. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so my name is Christy Jackowitz. I am the chief of minority educational institutions in the Department of Energy's Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. Uh, I would say as a summary of what um, <laughs> of what we do in my department or division uh, is really try to increase equity and opportunities uh, for students and also the minority serving institutions. Uh, specifically, I wanted to um, just emphasize how important it is to me that uh, for this particular focus with tribal communities that uh, we are really working to be more inclusive and find more ways to bring you into the fold. Uh, last year, uh, we ran a couple of uh, opportunities that we wanted to see more tribal participation. And so we are continuing to do a lot of outreach to get you involved. Um, our, our group is very focused on uh, fostering any kind of opportunity that will open the door for you in the education field, uh, making sure we can build capacity so you can apply for these jobs and opportunities as mentioned by Sonrisa and Bethany. Uh, so we definitely uh, care about you and want to see you be successful. Uh, my team is very small right now. Uh, I do have a couple vacancies I hope to fill soon, uh, but currently our uh, tribal champions are uh, James Hendricks or Jimmy Hendricks. I have put their emails underneath their name so you can reach out to them for the areas that they are focused on. Jimmy one, runs a wonderful uh, minority uh, internship program that is paid. Uh, it is one of the programs we certainly want to see an increase in tribal participation. It has an option of in-person and virtual because we understand that uh, for some communities uh, leaving you know, the area is not ideal. And so we wanna make sure we're being flexible and removing hurdles for you to be able to participate in these type of programs. Uh, we also have a uh, financial award to ACES, uh, which represents the uh, work with the Indian Science and Engineering Society. And so we uh, are continuing, that's been funded for years, uh, trying to make sure that uh, those communities have access to those funds for opportunities. And I'll talk a little bit about that more. And then uh, we have Chester Scott, who is also our outreach and engagement person. He is hosting events quarterly uh, with the National Laboratories to ensure that uh, all communities have access to uh, opportunities in those labs, including research opportunities, uh, internships, funding, and whatever else they're doing. Uh, so I hope that you will be able to participate in those. But I'll start a little bit with MESEP, which is the internship program. It is a paid internship program. And I am looking to increase the payment um, this year, uh, working with some of the people in our office to see if our team can get a little bit more support around that. So hopefully once we launch in uh, June, you will see uh, uh, improvement in the uh, funding portion of the program. But MESEP is not just for STEM, it's also for business opportunities. Every office in the Department of Energy has the opportunity to uh, recruit a student and it's over the summer, uh, but sometimes we do extend into the fall, depending on how well the student does and uh, the interest of the organization. And so um, this, this last year, we actually moved the program to uh, ORISE, which many of you may be familiar with. And so they are our program uh, managers and we continue to work with them to uh, just really get a, a handle on what are the, the boundaries or hurdles that are causing um, not enough uh, tribal participation. It was a big focus for us the year, uh, year before in 2021 and 2022, we pushed and we did get more participation, but we would still like to see an increase. So uh, definitely reach out to Jimmy uh, or the MESEP ORISE uh, email at the end of this slide uh, if you are uh, interested in helping us to recruit more students to participate. Uh, for the financial award that I mentioned with ACES, uh, that is designed to establish a cohort of 24 native two-year students. Uh, every year, uh, they are pushing to uh, make that award its uh, best outcome. Uh, there is a mentorship part of that award, scholarships, uh, and other educational support. So if you are familiar with ACES or you would like to get 
um, more involved, I, I highly recommend that you reach out to them and uh, help them with the recruitment that they do to make sure that uh, students are getting opportunities in that program as well. And then for outreach and events, uh, we normally have the different labs uh, present. We've been doing this for a couple of years since I joined in 2021. Uh, so the ones that are coming up are the Argonne National Laboratory uh, around November of this year. Uh, that will be still a 2023. Our fiscal year starts October 1st. And I just gave a little uh, brief description of what, those, what that lab does. And then SLAC, which used to be Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, is now the National Accelerator Laboratory. Uh, we hope to have an event in February. And as I stated, these particular events uh, do provide uh, all the opportunities that are at the national laboratories, but also a little technical assistance on how to participate, um, how to get involved, and you know, how to get access. Uh, we do record these events and we also, um, you know, write some articles on, you know, what's happening. So the link at the bottom is to uh, give you access to pre-recorded events, like things that you may have missed in the last couple of years, but you're interested in. And I would also personally like to know if there are labs that you want to know more about that we can put on our schedule and, um, you know, create those opportunities for you. So that's it for me for, uh, for my presentation. I'm certainly um, interested in questions and uh, other opportunities to engage and support everyone. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, presentations were wonderful. So let's open up for questions on the, the four different items here. So go ahead. Uh, Ken Hibben from the Small Business Office. Uh, in the DEIA's um, reference was made to various types of socioeconomic uh, subcategory businesses. Um, if it could be confirmed that SDV OSBs and hub zone firms are, are actually included um, in that group. Thank you. Um, is that a question for us to confirm that there's there's more detailed language than is on the on the slides that we presented, mm. um, and so there's quite actually a long list of uh, of the in specifically named and included communities. Um, I would refer you to I think the the community benefit plan FAQ, which lives on the DOE bill implementation website about it if you scroll down that's where you'll find um, more specific language that we're in, uh, referring applicants to thanks very much and in of course we'll... right. it's in particular interest because the uh, federally recognized tribes are by definition hub zones so I'm, I'm glad to know that they're part of that uh, roster thank you thank yeah, you and if you see something and have suggestions for what could be better we're open to do that Thank you, great question. Other questions? Anybody? Uh, well, I guess while we're thinking about, I, I have a question for, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Christy, you, you mentioned your work with uh, minority serving institutions. Um, does that include tribal colleges and universities? Because there's roughly 30 plus organizations around the country. And so uh, how, many, how many have you connected with and, and are they ready to go with all the programs that you have to offer? Yes, TCUs are absolutely part of our outreach. Uh, they are on our distribution list. So everything that we do, we send out to the entire distribution list that includes the TCUs. We also work with organizations that are focused on tribal communities. And we also um, work with ORISE's um, distribution as well, which includes TCUs. So we have had participation, but we would like it to increase. And I think sometimes it's just the momentum of knowing that the opportunity is there and that it's real, <laughs> um, you know, will certainly help to uh, promote it here and also, you know, in uh, furthering those distributions of information. So 
uh, definitely uh, we want them to participate and we want to uh, remove any hurdles that, that are keeping uh, students and faculty from joining us. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, questions? Um, well, I have another one since, since we're you know, uh, trying to use some time here. Uh, on the community benefits agreement or benefit plans, you have tribal governments. Um, uh, could local tribal nonprofits, like for example, tribal chambers of commerces or tribal um, community groups, are they eligible to apply and submit plans relative to the community benefit plans for Justice 40 um, and, and the other programs that were discussed? I think this is for Bettany. Yeah, so the community benefits plans are part of the application for all of the provisions under the bipartisan infrastructure law. And the, the eligibility is, is very broad. I think the restriction is um, that they're, that it's US based. Um, and so there's nothing to preclude tribal governments or chambers of commerce from from either, you know, um, applying for some of these uh, projects or partnering on some of these projects. Um, the the trick, of course, is to figure out if there's a partnership opportunity to figure out who in the community is applying, who is planning to apply, and to try to foster those partnerships early. Um, and the program offices who put out these funding opportunities try to facilitate that in different ways. There's usually a teaming list, an Excel file that can be downloaded from the um, from the materials where the funding application, the funding opportunity is provided. And so applicants or entities interested in partnering can add their contact information to that teaming list. And that's to facilitate people finding each other. Um, also attending, often the program offices will do a webinar after they release a funding opportunity. That's probably another good way of identifying potential partners and who else is tracking a particular opportunity. Okay, because the way I see it in the country, you have, you have the tribe, tribal governments, you have tribal entities, you also have the tribal colleges and universities. Uh, you have, um, in many cases, uh, grant school associations, you know, they're the ones that help promote the uh, Bureau of Indian Education uh, schools, and then you have some local NGOs, and so, um, you know, how do they all work together, I think would be the question. And so, I think in a lot of cases, information is sent to the tribal leadership, but, you know, I know that our tribal leaders are inundated with tons of information from not only DOE, but all the other federal agencies. And so, you know, you leave it up to the, 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 the administrative support that our tribal leaders have. And so in many cases, I've seen it because I've been, I've been a part of it. You know, it's just hard to distribute the information out to all the programs. I was chief of staff for two former Navajo presidents and I'd get stacks and stacks, you know, of, of letters. But in this case, I'm sure hundreds of of emails, and so one of my jobs was, you know, who do I get this to, and do I get it to them on time? So I, I see that as, as challenges for all these wonderful programs, especially the ones that we're talking about in this session. Um, so, you know, we have to figure out, in my opinion, how do we facilitate information to the right people, you know, and all the wonderful TCUs that we have there and, and whatnot. So those, that's just commentary on my part. But I see we have a question here, so I'll throw yeah, it over I to you. To... Yeah. I'm sorry, before we move on, uh, just a, a quick comment in that other section sure. with as well. Um, one of the things that I think is really important for us to notice or, or to note is that a lot of this is being put on the project team themselves to implement. And so they're the ones that actually need to do the stakeholder engagement work to make sure that they are make, getting these benefits to flow to the communities themselves. And um, we have seen in situations for community benefit agreements and other places outside the federal government where it does get isolated with one type of community party that maybe is very much you know, for 
the, the project, whereas maybe others in the community are not. And so one of the things that we've also tried to build into these community benefits plans is being able to look across the section of all of the community, making sure that you're getting good inclusivity of different viewpoints from within that one community and so that, or the impacted community, so that we are not being, uh, you know, just one-sided in how we are approaching a particular project. And so, um, unfortunately, as you were, as you mentioned, there is a problem with making sure that that communication is is done in a culturally competent way, is done thoroughly, and gets like a broader cross section of community members. And that's a an area that DOE is focusing on. Uh, and as we move forward, that we're going to try and put a lot of effort into that space um, as we try to coach projects on how to do that effectively. Right. And, and I think that one of the issues is that, you know, on the state side, you have 50 states. On the tribal side, you have 574 different entities that you have to communicate with and then all their departments. And so you're dealing with thousands and thousands of programs and offices within tribal government. So uh, it's something that we need to work on. So but great comments. I appreciate that. Let's, but, uh, let's Yeah, I wanted to also go ahead. build off of this conversation. So my name is Jean-Luc Pirit. Uh, my tribal affiliation is the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana. I'm currently here representing the North American Indian Center of Boston, uh, where I serve as board president. I'm the, uh, so North American Indian Center of Boston, we are Massachusetts' oldest urban Indian center. We're talking about, talking about uh, tribal governments, uh, talking about, I'm, I'm not sure if that's included in the NGOs category there. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's there's some very specific uh, language around how we see ourselves and how we're invited into these opportunities. Because when we're talking about, we're not talking about community, and we're not talking about like cultural competency. We're talking about the obligation of the federal government to respect the rights of indigenous peoples. I go back to treaties. I go back to that government to government relationship. Even when it comes to my own organization as an urban Indian organization, this is a, a we're an artifact of a time in which the Congress moved to terminate our tribes. We're not just social organizations and clubs that just popped out of nowhere. Um, and so, when we're invited into these uh, into these types of opportunities uh, to help build economic development for our peoples, both on and off tribal land. I think that we absolutely have to have some sort of standard that actually shows that this is this is what's going to indigenous peoples because you know also you know we're dealing with issues of, of data equity uh, on the state level in Massachusetts we're being put into other categories when it comes to you know the the, the pandemic uh, of COVID nineteen we had to fight that for about nine months there before they started counting American Indian Alaska Native so I think. You know, data equity wise, uh, language wise, we have to be very clear about when our when our peoples are actually being invited to these opportunities. Thank you. Great, great comment. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll add to it. I think I mentioned that earlier. Uh, most of our tribal communities record each and every member. And so um, but a lot of the members may have temporary residence on the reservation, but in order to work and, you know, and to have a family, they're located off reservations. And so I think what you're talking about is the urban Indians. Um, we have, you know, many, many natives, brothers and sisters that live in and reside in cities around the country because of the the relocation challenges that the federal government imposed on us in the 30s and 40s. So, you know, we have a lot of native families who reside in in many parts of our country, but they still go home. They still reside. They still, you know, participate in their government, and they're still effectively recorded as members, and they're able to vote and participate in their tribal government elections. So, um, so we have reservation-based Indians and urban Indians. And so, but I think, you know, many cases, I think what I'm hearing is that a lot of our urban brothers and sisters may not get the benefit benefits that some of our tribes get. So, but great point. Thank you for that. 
Let's go over here to another question or comment. Um, again, uh, Ken Hibben from the Small Biz. <laughs> there are two advocacies or advocates that um, everyone here can tap into, and I offer to be a conduit. The Small Business Administration has a tribal affairs office. So as far as the federal to sovereign nation interface, there is that. Also, uh, among the network of procurement technical assistance centers, there are specifically six that are um, focused on Native American procurement techno technical assistance. So the Native American PTACs plus the SBA's tribal assistance um, programs are my direct colleagues in the, in right. the federal workspace. Well, I'll add to that comment, and I would encourage everybody here for SBA to reach out to Mr. Jackson Brossi. Uh, he is the Associate Director for Office of Native American Affairs, and so he's actually reaching out, trying to expand uh, SBA and their service delivery to Indian Country. So uh, that, that's, that's one area. On the PTACs, um, I mentioned that um, I'm the Chairman of the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development. We actually have a contract. The National Center, we provide and operate four PTACs, um, and there's, uh, there's two others in this country. So if you're interested in procurement, technical assistance, uh, reach out to the National Center, and, and it's nceied.org. Uh, for those of you that are interested in building up your tribal businesses to be able to get into federal contracting. So... Um, any other questions or comments for the group here? Wonderful, wonderful discussion. Anything else? Okay, one back there, please. Uh, just a quick question. Um, it seems like a lot of the goals, these noble goals, would have overlap with other departments uh, in the government. Um, is there a lot of coordination, uh, you know, trying to synchronize and, and uh, interleave uh, uh, you know, some of these initiatives like STEM, is it potentially bringing in Department of Education, um, other areas to, to you know, yeah, is there overlap, much overlap and, and synchronization? And if you think of ways that that could be improved, I mean, what, what can I, you know, could you give examples and then we can go home and write our congressional representatives and uh, have them request that? That's an open question. I think so, <laughs> Go ahead, Benny. Oh, I want to hand it over to Chrissy. Let, let me just say a couple of things. I think Sonrisa used the term whole of government approach, and that really is how we're addressing all of these goals. I wasn't here uh, before this administration, but I have heard that there's an extraordinary uh, high level of coordination across the agencies, more, much more than there's been in the past. And just to provide just one example of many that relates to the, the job quality, job access goal, uh, Department of Energy signed an MOU with the Department of Labor, um, and Department of Labor signed similar MOUs with Commerce and Transportation to really um, try to bring the resources, the respective resources from all these agencies together, share resources, tap expertise, and really um, try to, to, to work together on, on program implementation and design. And so we're really excited about that. It's been great and working really well. And in addition, um, reaching out to, we've been in conversations with EPA and Department of Ed and others, uh, at least on the workforce provision. So happy to have Christy take it from there. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bethany. Um, and also, I think it's important to understand that Department of Education is K through 12, and then uh, the other agencies are, um, you know, after graduation or hybrid from graduation to college, and then, you know, graduate degrees and forward. So there are a few lines in the sand as far as what we can do, but our national laboratories have a little bit more flexibility. So they are able to, um, you know, do some work with the K through 12. But as far as the work that I do in the educational um, institutions is specifically for community colleges and uh, regular colleges and graduate programs um, so that we can work together. However, I have uh, spoken at uh, Department of Education events around STEM and around, you know, uh, those opportunities that we have. And they have also spoken at our events. So we do work together to, to cross those lines and communicate with each other 
and, um, and share information. And also from the internship um, program that we have, there's a consortium of federal agencies that I am part of their membership where you learn about all the different internships out there, all the different opportunities that they're having and you're able to influence as well. So like our effort to increase tribal participation, we encourage also for other agencies to consider you know, marketing to the tribal communities and the universities to make sure that they are also um, you know, sharing those opportunities with you. So uh, yes, there is collaboration and working together, but it can always be better. <laughs> I just wanna say that. So uh, definitely a great opportunity to uh, communicate on that. Thank you. Um, I think we have David Conrad here with some yeah, I was offering just, comments. I was just going to uh, add that sometimes uh, there's collaboration uh, going on that needs to know about other collaboration. And the White House Council on Native American Affairs has an education subgroup. And uh, the, uh, the memo on the workforce development that I think Bentney had brought up uh, is one of those products that was uh, facilitated through um, that process with labor and interior and okay. other federal agencies that assigned onto it, including energy right. or maybe energy soon. So. Yeah. Well, I guess what I'm hearing is that and what I, what I like and what I see is that there's uh, high level native Americans that have been appointed to these two different uh, departments. And so they coordinate through uh, and the white house is the lead on many issues, including education, energy, and so forth. And so, I know I think a lot of the tribal leaders are, are familiar with that, but there is coordination from what David and others are saying here from DOE uh, amongst the different agencies, in particular and specifically uh, for tribes and tribal nations. So thank you, David, and thank you, everybody. Any other comments or questions before we close here? Okay, there being none, let's give a big round of applause for our speakers. We, we pulled it off virtually, so what's, okay. Okay, well, this now calls for a break. We will break for roughly 20 minutes and we'll convene at three o'clock and we'll talk then about hydrogen specifically. So we got refreshments in the foyer, enjoy, and thank you so much to our speakers. So enjoy the break, thank you.
Yeah, maybe maybe when we're here, it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> That's the only thing we can see, right? All yeah, right. plus it's sort of like, why isn't it over there? <laughs> All right. Okay, let's get this show on the road, get the ball rolling, and we are at, in our last session here before we have a joint session with all the tribal leaders. And so um, for those of you that probably know, um, the, the tribal leaders are in a facilitated session on that on the other room over there, talking about you know all the things that tribes need to be concerned with, especially when it comes to the Department of, of Energy. And so, this last session um, is titled "National Clean Energy Infrastructure Planning and Deployment," and it's primarily on hydrogen for the most part. And so, we have. Um, is everybody here? I think so. Okay. Well, everybody joined us. Great. Great. And so I'm going to go down the list here. So you're going to have to help me and with all the, you know, all the pronunciations. But uh, we have uh, Robert uh, Schrenengost, Schrenengost, Senior Program Manager, Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, FECM, for those of you that are catching on. Uh, Eric Miller, Senior Advisor, again, uh, well, actually, this is Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, EERE. Uh, Todd Schrader, Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. I'm sure what's the acronym for that? OSED. okay. I think we learned that yesterday. And then, finally, um, Mark Ikowitz, Acting Director for Office of carbon management technologies. And so um, I, I'm hoping that we save the best for the last because, you know, I, we did hear, like, for example, uh, roughly 8 billion is available for hydrogen, hydrogen hubs. And I, I believe there's been some outreach out there with uh, four or five consortiums that are in creation by the states. And I'm encouraged that uh, a few of those consortiums are reaching out to tribes, and so there is potential hydrogen development in any country. Uh, then, of course, you know, you know, carbon capture, utilization, and storage opportunities are out there. And so, um, I would like to start with first Robert. I think yeah, our slide yeah, we, we for moved it around. Okay, Come well, on. I'll throw it to you. So <laughs> go ahead, Eric. If you're if you're I'm up, closest. the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, do I have a, a clicker? Do I get to? Uh... It's fair. Let's see how that works. All right. Uh, the slides are coming up. Very good. All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting us to this important event. We've been having some really exciting discussions in the past several hours with the tribal leaders and others. Really, uh, when we start talking about hydrogen, many of you realize that this is a, a pretty hot topic in the department, but it's also a big part of our national priorities in terms of decarbonization, uh, energy, clean energy, as well as workforce development and environmental justice. So we're going to give you quite a bit of information in the next two hours here. Uh, all of my distinguished colleagues will be speaking with me. We'll be doing it in, in, in tag team. I'll start off giving a little bit of an overview of what is hydrogen. The conversations are on many, many levels, even why are we even talking about it? I'll try to give you a motivation for that. Uh, there's a lot of hype, but we, we, we want to tone down the hype and actually get real because there's a lot of investment going in there now. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of, that'll be a common thread across our, our, our talks. Like, what are we really doing now? Why do we think this is the time for, for clean hydrogen to have a huge impact on our economy? on our environment and in our, in our workforce in general. And how does that really bring the resources of the United States together, not only our natural resources, but our natural people resources that they could actually benefit from this. So this is the overarching talk. I, I probably could just stop there and, and pass it to, to Bob, but I've got like 20 more slides in, uh, on that. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see if I can get it to go. All right, um, so hydrogen. So, so I mean, just for, I mean, I think everyone knows that hydrogen is, is a pretty big deal, right? In the universe, hydrogen is, is pretty much the main element, right? It's like 75% of the, of the universe, according to our science, is hydrogen, and stars are turning hydrogen into helium, and it's turning into everything that we find on Earth. It's an interesting, really, uh, it's simple, but it's really complex in the way that, that it combines with everything. It, it, it's, it's the building block for everything. <laughs> in the universe, but in the, in, in the United States, in the world and in the United States, we find it everywhere combined with stuff, right? Because it's very reactive. It's, it's a good fuel because it reacts with everything. 
Uh, so we'll see that hydrogen is basically in all our water, right? Hydrogen and oxygen makes, makes H2O. Um, this is kind of the key to the hydrogen economy. People talked about the fact that we can actually leverage this hydrogen in the water to kind of go back and forth between energy and, and water. Uh, and so this is really interesting. And the more we know about it, the, the more opportunities we have to, to leverage it and to, to take advantage of it. Um, a couple of things, you know, I, I mentioned this as the most abundant, just at a very high level, I'll give a 101, then I'm kind of going to some of the programmatic stuff that how we're addressing some of these things. Uh, it's the most abundant element in the universe, I just mentioned that, but it's, it's, it's in water, it's in sugar, it's in, it's in all our hydrocarbons, all our fuels are, are, are carbon and hydrogen, right? Uh, but it's the hydrogen that's the active part. If we could, if we get rid of the carbon altogether, there's really an interesting opportunity to, to, to change the way we do everything. So there's that. Um, it's it, you know it's a very high energy density. We'll, we'll talk about that too. I mean, but it, this is if you're making it as a fuel, you can you can replace gasoline with it. But there's challenges to that, and we'll talk about that as well. But it is a high energy density by volume, but that's always a, a trick, right? Because or by mass, because it's the volume that you really care about. Um, it, it's and okay. We just a fun fact is that we use hydrogen all the time. You don't even know it. Um, hydrogen. Uh, there's 10 million tons of hydrogen being used in the in the year in the United States. 100 million tons being used. We're getting it from natural gas primarily. We're just taking it, we're putting steam in it, the steam turns into hydrogen and it turns into CO2. The CO2 is a lot, right? We, for every ton of, of hydrogen we make, we're putting 10 tons of CO2 in the air. That's for the current industry. This is the idea of a clean hydrogen revolution, changing that paradigm so that we can start to decarbonize our, our environment right away with what we're doing already in industry. So steel uses it, ammonia uses it. It, mostly what we use it for is, is petroleum refining, but that's, that's a whole other story. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, it, it, it's an interesting way to store energy to make electricity again. And we'll, we'll talk about all of these end uses that, the, that, that we could advantage, take advantage of. And it really is going to be regional. What resources you have to make the hydrogen and what, what can you use it for in your region? So we'll, we'll spend a little time on that. Uh, okay, so, so I already mentioned this. We do have an opportunity to do a lot of decarbonization if we move away from our current incumbent technologies, and you'll hear a lot more about this. There's one way to, to actually clean up what you're doing with natural gas by putting carbon capture on it. The other way to do it is actually just use renewable electricity to make the to, to split water into the hydrogen and the oxygen. And these are all things that are going on simultaneously to, to help us decarbonize the whole the, the whole planet, really. Uh, you know, and, and again, replace oil, replace some of the, the things that we're trying to get away from in the clean energy revolution. Uh, you, okay, there's a lot of other things I say here, reduce air pollution, grid support, all of these things are our are, are benefits. We, 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 we'll talk more about those. Um, but just to, to, to re-emphasize where we are looking to actually get the hydrogen from. Certainly, we've got the natural gas that we're using today. We know that we can get it from water, uh, but if you're going to get it from, what, from any of these, you want to be putting energy in from sources that are not creating uh, greenhouse gases or not creating pollutions. I mean, there's a whole, all of the ones that you're seeing on this slide, uh, ranging from nuclear, solar, wind, all of these sustainable uh, types of, of energy sources can be used to pull hydrogen from water, right, or, or to pull hydrogen from other things, biomass or waste. Uh, the point is that you're using that renewable energy and you're giving it away to store it as a chemical bond as opposed to electricity that has to be used right away. So, so we, we look at it that way. We look at you know, the, the versatility of hydrogen. Um, as I said, natural gas is one of the major feedstocks. We can get biomass, water. All of these things are, are, are ways to get hydrogen, in, clean hydrogen into, into the economy. Um, and there's different ways. These are processes. You'll hear more about these. There's different chemical processes or this electrolysis you may have heard about. That's basically taking two nails and putting it in water, right? And, and, and electrochemically, you can split the water into the hydrogen. On one side, gas pops up. Oxygen gas pops up on the other side. I mean, that, that's kind of the key new emerging technology we're seeing a, a lot of interest in. But we're also looking at ways of microbial reduction of waste streams. Is, you know, that'll produce some hydrogen as well. Uh, there's really interesting uh, technologies that you can actually just put some particles in a, in a bath and just sh shine sunlight on them and the hydrogen will pop off. I mean, these, these are a little bit down the road, but we're looking at those as well. And that, that's, a, that's a very, very interesting and complicated thing. What's the last one I have? The, the steam methane reforming is what we do today of natural gas, and, and can we put carbon capture technologies on that? And you'll hear a lot more about that from my colleagues at FECM. All right, what do I got here? Okay, multiple industries. Okay, so uh, I, I touched upon a lot of these before, but here's the ones that we're looking at more in the near term for decarbonization purposes. I would say that the heavy duty transportation is, is of great interest. We, there are ways we actually have hydrogen powered cars on the road today. Uh, and if you have clean hydrogen and, and you, may, you know the tailpipe is water, right? I mean, people can drink from it, I don't recommend it, but people do it as a stunt. Um, so, so, but but it is, it's a clean, if you have clean hydrogen, you put it in a car with a fuel cell or even combust it, you, you can run cars and we have commercial cars today. The more interesting play there is really for the heavy duty trucks or buses, places where batteries become more and more 
cumbersome and, and heavy and more expensive. It looks like it's more interesting to put on a supply of hydrogen chemi chemical bonds, you know, as, as a fuel. It, it's, a, it's a better, I mean, there's a lot of interest in that. So really we're looking at heavy duty applications, whether that's trucks, it could even be ships, a little, maybe even airplanes, but that's a little bit further down the road. Uh, we're looking at that, and, and there's also a lot of interest in the ammonia of industry to clean up their ammonia production. That's a, there's green ammonia, you might have heard of that. That would be either putting carbon capture on the natural gas reforming they do to make the, the hydrogen for the ammonia or using electrolysis. Uh, steel production is also, there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, what other good things we got here? Um, uh, okay, so, that's right. The, the other really interesting thing we're looking at seriously is, is in regions that could require long duration energy storage. Let's say you're in Alaska. You got a lot of sun in, in the summertime and none, none, very little in the wintertime. But you've got all that excess energy during that seasonal period when you have sun. And if you can't use it right away, you need to find, you know, you, you lost it, right? So there's an opportunity in, in, in regions like that to, for long duration energy storage or hydrogen becomes more and more attractive compared to having like a, a three buildings worth of batteries, which is really <laughs> not really practical. It's, an exp it's expensive, it's heavy, it's, it's, it's problematic environmentally. Uh, there are places where you can store the hydrogen enough to, that you can actually have months or multiple months of, of, of electricity generation from that. So there's this long duration storage is, is of real interest in certain regions as well. And again, um, let's see, da, 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 da. okay, I think I've covered most of them. There's other chemicals such as methanol. For example, you could have synthetic methanol. If you put clean hydrogen into that, you've cleaned up a big, like a third, uh, this huge sector in, in um, American uh, chemical industry. So there's, there's a lot of places using the hydrogen right now, and a lot of people are really interested in, being, in cleaning up the hydrogen. So that's, that's kind of a motivation. Um, and that's kind of the motivation for those of you who are paying attention to what's going on in the United States and in the Department of Energy that we've, we've been rolling out these earth shots. It's kind of like modeled after the moonshot, all hands on deck to get something done because it has the, the, the challenge is so great and it's so important. The very first of the earth shots was the hydrogen shot. And the point of, of the hydrogen shot was to get to $1 of a kilogram of clean hydrogen in, in, this, in this period that we're, we're working on it. Um, just for context, a dollar per kilogram of regular hydrogen is kind of where we are. You know, if you make it from natural gas reforming, you have to compete with that and you have to have these alternate technologies that clean it up that, that people will buy into quickly. So th this is kind of where the earth shot comes from. And we're really excited that the, the, the secretary announced this as the very first of the earth shots. And, we're, and it is an all hands on deck with all of our offices. We really appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm, I talked a little bit about this too. So three of the main pillars in the earth shot are this electrolysis that I talked about, which just takes water. Uh, we're looking at ways to bring the cost down. I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just saying we're doing the analysis and we're doing the technology development to be able to make it cost competitive. Uh, and, and one of the pillars is electrolysis. There's new companies coming out all the time making these electrolyzers. Um, the, the cost will come down, but there's going to be some volume. There's going to be manufacturing. There's going to be some technology innovation. This is what the department is good at. Uh, and some of that is going to be through deployment and, and scale up. Uh, again, the thermal conversion is pretty well known. It's, it's pretty actually cheap today, but when you put the carbon capture on top of it, it adds cost, and you'll hear a lot more about that later. And these other ones on the right, uh, these advanced pathways, these, these are crazy, but they're awesome. And we're really looking into those for the future as well. Uh, quickly, um, just letting you know, this kind of reiterates the fact that hydrogen is not a, a surprise, you know, in, in our country or in the world. Um, we're looking at, you know, I'm showing on the left here, I don't know if there's a pointer, but if there is, I'll probably shut down everything if I try to use it. So I'll just, I'll just say on the left, um, uh, it's, it's kind of where we're using that, that, that hydrogen today, ammonia and, and refining in some other markets. We expect the, the others to grow considerably when clean hydrogen becomes available because people want it you know, for, their, for their processes. Uh, what we're showing in the map of the United States is, is, is and, and largely the, the hydrogen producers are where there was natural gas, cheap natural gas, which is quite a lot of places. Uh, that's the little brown or the beige dots. What we're seeing, what we're showing in this plot is that the green ones are, are evolving where the electro, electrolyzer manufacturing or, or utilization is taking place. So we're seeing a competition between the natural gas usage and, and the water splitting. Uh, so we're really excited. And, and on, the, on the right hand side, it just kind of shows what types of infrastructure that the, the investments have kind of led to. And it's, and it's, it's a little bit, it's, some of them are, mar are modest, uh, but, but in the world view, it's, it's, they're growing pretty exponentially. Whether, what cars are on the road, what fueling stations are there. One of the biggest success, story, success stories um, from early days of the, of, of the Department of Energy's investments in hydrogen was this forklift. That, you know, that because we had a, a fuel cell powered car that you, people were creating this clean hydrogen at warehouses, it was quieter, it was cleaner, you could, you could, it's faster than replacing the batteries. It took off and it became a commercial success. So, you know, it was not a research thing anymore, it became a thing uh, that industry that, that promoted and, and, and continues to do this day. Um, okay, so, but, but, it's, but it's not all rosy, right? I mean, there still are challenges and I'll, I'll just talk to, in the next few slides about some of those. 
The cost, I said, is really important. We got to get that cost down to be competitive. Um, and we need to be using clean electricity, you know, for, for this to make sense. If you're splitting water, you have to have clean, it has to be clean. You can't be kicking the can down to some, some place that you're producing the, the, the pollution somewhere else. Just say it's clean where you make it, right? So, so we have to have clean costs. And um, the storage and transport is a, little, is a challenge. Uh, for chemical storage of, 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 of uh, hydrogen, if it's a compressed gas or a cryogenic liquid, there's just different ways to do it, but it adds costs and it's a little bit challenging. And the infrastructure. Um, to move it around. So, so that's why we're really interested in, in, we'll talk more about these hubs that are being developed. Can we look at regions that have a resource to make the hydrogen, but also have a place to use it right away so you don't have to be shipping it too far? And that's kind of a big concept behind uh, the, the clean hydrogen hubs that, that we talk about seven, eight billion dollar investments coming up. Um, a, a little bit about how we're doing at the department. This is a cross office thing. I'll just give a quick overview of our program, talk a little bit of how we're approaching it. Um, and I do want to put up this because this was, was a big revolution to us. We call this the hydrogen at scale bubble chart. Um, it, those in the, in, in the field have seen this for the past several years. It, it kind of encapsulates most of the conversation I've had so far. It's, it, it shows that hydrogen really is a big part on the right of a bunch of industries already. And if we can clean up that hydrogen by, by doing different processes with clean electricity, we can be decarbonizing a lot of these things already. And we're expecting those, those to grow, like, like the heavy duty transport. We expect that to be much more demand once clean op options become available. So this whole thing shows this cycle that, yeah, you can, today we can make the hydrogen with natural gas. We can put carbon capture on it to clean it up a bit, but we can also go get to the grid and, and start putting uh, renewables like solar, wind, or, or sustainable sources like nuclear on the grid or tie them directly to this electrolysis technology to produce the, the, clean electric, the clean hydrogen that can then start to decarbonize the entire system. So this is sort of a, a summary of the things I talked about so far. Um, and this is why it's so, the, the, the Earthshot came out so quickly, because we, we recognize the potential for quick decarbonization wins in the near term if we can pursue this and get our technologies um, up and running at the scales needed. Um, quickly, so it, it, we, we do this as a unified hydrogen program at the Department of Energy. I encourage everyone to look at the, the um, program plan on this website here. It really shows what we're doing in each of the offices. All of the offices here are represented. EER is the renewable energy side. We have the carbon, uh, 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 carbon energy fossil management looking at the carbon capture part. Uh, we've got uh, OSED here is actually looking at these hubs. How do we get the, the manufacturing scale up? Uh, nuclear energy is really interested in coupling hydrogen production on their facilities to be able to do value added products to their electricity and bring the cost down for that. So all of the offices and, and Office of Science is doing a lot of fundamental work needed for all of this. It's, it really is an exciting time to be in DOE in this program because we work together so closely across all offices, which is why there's so many of us here now uh, to, to have this conversation with you. All right, and I'm not going to go into any details here. That's just too much wording. But, but, so, but the, the key thing is low cost hydrogen production. That's the top one. And this is on the program plan. When you download that, you, you can actually get this as well. Uh, we have to also look at the ways that we're delivering the hydrogen around. Is that gaseous hydrogen storage, um, liquid, or, or other chemical storages? All of these things that we're, we're in the near term, we've got options, but we have to bring the cost down. And we're, we're, we're doing that as a department to make sure that we're, we're addressing all of these, all of the things that you're seeing on the left-hand side. The conversion back to electricity can be a fuel cell or it can be combustion. Or, or you can convert it just to a, meth, to a fertilizer. I mean, there's just a lot of things you can do with it once you've made it. Uh, so we're looking at all of this stuff in the near term, but we also have the long-term vision at the scales we needed. We have to do all of the above here. So uh, that, I just wanted to let you know that we are looking at the whole, the whole thing, not just the production itself. Uh, and you'll hear from our, our, my colleagues that the, the way we do this is by um, a, a, uh, working with, with industry, working with national labs, working with universities. We have funding opportunities. We've got these hubs now. Uh, basically, we, we are a creative center, but there's also a lot of opportunity to do investments through our financial systems, uh, not only through the basic research at our national labs, which are the best in the world. You know, we've got the best scientists working on every aspect of this. And we, put, we bring them together in consortia, working with universities, but we have different ways of working with industry, different mechanisms to do uh, solicitations that, that we award uh, competitive awards. We've got some direct create, what we call creators. Uh, where industry can come in and leverage what we've got at the national labs to, to, to actually start promoting their technologies to get it more commercial. This is a kind of a big deal. We've got a portfolio of mechanisms that we work with. And, and I think some of the exciting ones, I'm showing several here, but uh, in our consortia that, that we have going in, in the hydrogen field. But I think right now, one of the most exciting ones is what's happening with the, the clean hydrogen hubs that are on the road. On, on, we'll talk more about that. I will defer that to our, our OC colleagues who will give you more details on that. 
Um, just kind of go through a couple of things. It, uh, you know, our Office of Science is, is the best scientist in the world. Just to show you, I'm not going to go through this, but I will show you last year that as we were developing the, the Earthshot, they put together what they called a round table of experts and from all across the world. And okay, what do we what do we want to focus on here? And they came up with a lot of priorities around hydrogen itself, and it has to be clean hydrogen. So a lot of the things that we're working on that can be the next level of catalyst or the, or the next cheaper technology. They're in the in the trenches trying to develop those materials now, you know, and they've identified how they're going to do that. And it's very, very wonky, right? It's very science. But 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 you can tie every one of these things to an advance that we really need to, to get our, our low cost clean hydrogen. So we really work very closely with our Office of Science. They're really it's it's uh, best people in the world for, for science. Um, we offer we don't have anyone on the panel from the Office of Nuclear Energy, but we have people in the audience here. Um, like I said before, there's really interesting ways to couple uh, nuclear power. If you take both the heat and the electricity being generated, there's an interesting way you can efficiently generate clean uh, hydrogen. And, and we're really interested in looking at that technology because they've already found ways to either have an on-site synthetic fuel production from the hydrogen or, or ammonia production. They're really excited to see what they call a hybrid energy system where the nuclear power and the heat produces electricity to be sold when it's when it's the right time to sell it. But then when it's not, when it's too expensive to sell it, that you, you, you make the hydrogen and you sell that at a high, higher price. So there's really an interesting um, market play for, for nuclear hydrogen that our Office of Nuclear Energy is, is, is really investing in. Um, and this is something I'll defer to. Basically, if you look at our Office of Fossil Energy Carbon Management, they've got a whole portfolio of production, storage, and you'll hear more about that from my colleagues. So I just wanted to put it out there that they're, they're one of the, the sister uh, 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 offices that are really, really um, very active in this space. So you'll hear more about them. And I just want to just point one example. I don't know if you're familiar with RPE. That's kind of like our think tank at that DOE with like high risk, high reward type of stuff. Uh, we and they kind of come. They they create these project portfolios, and, and and they're really interested in some of the hydrogen plays. And one of one of the examples is uh, this methane pyrolysis, natural gas, where you can actually do do certain processes to split it into the hydrogen, and instead of making CO two, you it kind of turns into carbon, you know, solid carbon that you can put in cement or you could bury it. Uh, so this is kind of I don't know if, you'll, if we're going to hear more more about this, but this is also kind of a, a, the next generation technology that could actually leverage. Uh, do carbon capture for natural gas reforming to hydrogen. So we're really excited about all of our portfolio. Um, and this is kind of a, a summary of it. You know, we, we do everything from research and development in that labs at the very fundamental levels, understanding materials, how does they interact with hydrogen, all the way through the first of a kind demonstrations in the middle, looking at coupling nuclear with hydrogen, coupling clean hydrogen with ammonia production, coupling clean hydrogen with ports to clean them up. There's, these are the first of a kind demonstrations through H2O scale. And then on the right is going to be the next step is the clean hydrogen hubs. That kind of leverage that and take it to the next level. All right. And I'm kind of almost done. I, I let's see. Oh, I've got two minutes left. That's good. Um, LPL. I mean, this is good. We've got our loan program office here as well. I mean, I think I encourage everyone to uh, mingle and meet people from our department, our department's loan program office, because they're starting to have projects in the hydrogen space as well. The two recent ones that I'm showing here. One is around that methane pyrolysis I talked about. And one of them is more of an integrated energy system that looks at clean energy resources to make the hydrogen in, in sort of an, a mini hub type of an environment. So, so take a look and actually I encourage you to look at that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about this by part. I mean, two things that happened, the, the bill we call it, or the um, Infrastructure Investment and, and Jobs Act and, and Inflation Reduction Act. You've heard, right? We've got $9.5 billion specifically in hydrogen uh, in that bill. And you can see some, a lot of that is for the hub. Some of it is just for electrolysis manufacturing quite a bit. But we're also looking at uh, recycling and, and, uh, and other things as well. So that, that'll be something to keep an eye on. And these are things that are being under development right now. Uh, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is really interesting. That came out just several weeks ago, if you, I, I think, right? Um, the interesting thing there is that it includes a production tax credit for clean hydrogen. So that could change the whole landscape of how we're selling clean hydrogen. Depending on how much CO2 you're emitting with that hydrogen, you're going to get a tax credit for that, and, at least in the near term. And that could really change the, everything that could, to, to, to kickstart this economy. So we're really excited that these things came out. We really appreciate that our administration has been supporting this. Um, and again, this is just a summary of, of some of those things. It also created a natural high, a strategy roadmap that puts all of this together. I talked about the hubs already. I just want to quickly go, you know, this is, I, just, I do want to plug in for the strategy and roadmap that the DOE put out. It came out last week. It was announced by their, our secretary at the um, Global Clean Energy Action Forum. It was a really exciting time. It's online now. It's really open for public review. It's not a final draft. So if you get a chance, go into it. It talks about all the things I talked about, cheap, clean hydrogen production, delivery infrastructure, end uses, 
de developing, really addressing the near-term opportunities. What are, what are the first places that can adopt this clean hydrogen? So we're looking for people to read that and to, to give us feedback on that. So I, I encourage you to go to the website and, and, and download a copy and take a look. Um, the hubs, again, just we're very proud that the, 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 the hubs follow was released. That's really, really exciting news though. You know, Todd's going to talk more about that later on, but I just wanted to let you know that the, it's out there now. It's in the process. We're expecting proposals to come in from all over the country, hopefully all over the country that's engaging with the tribal communities and because that's exactly what we're trying. You know, the priority really is to engage the workforce development and to really address environmental justice while, while we're in, uh, addressing environment. Um, let's see. And there's uh, the other photos for the other provisions are, are also in process, too. I can't announce much about those because they haven't been announced. So just just we'll hear more about the hubs in a second. And this is maybe one of the things I want everyone to pay attention to as we're developing these hubs, as we're developing these research portfolios, these, these demonstration projects, we've implemented what we call a H2 matchmaker tool that's online and, and for everyone. Basically, you can go in and find who in your region is doing what, who's making hydrogen, who needs hydrogen. We want, we want to have this tool open to people so you can start making the network connections that would be the, the kind of the percolate the, the hubs, right? We really need a hub to have both clean production, utilization, uh, people who want to buy it and sell it. And it has to be sort of co-located in, in sort of a region. And this is one way where we encourage everyone to get on there, put your, put your name in there, see what your interests are, what types of markets you think you could use clean hydrogen, what, where can you produce the clean hydrogen, what resources do you have? And this is why you know, people are talking behind the scenes about creating potential hub proposals. So I really encourage everyone to look at that. We're really, it's, it's really a successful, exciting time. We, we, we look at it every day to see how many people are, are actually signing up. And I hope you, you'll take a look at that. Um, another way you can get involved is as these proposals come in, one of the things that are national priority, we really, really, really are focusing on environmental justice to, and these clean hydrogen hubs. It's not just the, the hydrogen, right? Um, so there, in the proposals themselves, there will be a, a whole um, proposal on DJ, or EJ40, the, the environmental justice. We're really, incur we're really interested to get reviewers on that, right? We're technology development people. We've got some experience in this, but we really want to reach out to the communities that are actually doing it or impacted by this to actually help us review those parts of the proposal. So if you're interested in being a part of that, I encourage you to go on and sign up to do that because your, your feedback is going to be vital for us to do the right thing there. Okay, um, so th that's just, so I'm going to end up on this pretty much. Uh, uh, stakeholder uh, engagement is we're looking at, we've had a lot of listening sessions. We were, you know, I have H2 matchmaker tool. We're, we're getting better at this, but you know, this event is an example of how we're trying to reach out and to get more feedback. Cause we've had some constructive feedback that, you know, we, you, you don't want to just put something out there and say, hey, this is great. We love hydrogen, we love clean hydrogen, right? But we can't go out there and say, well, you should just do this, right? We want to hear why, why is it beneficial to your community? What, what, what can you bring to us to say, wait a minute, if, if it was this, this, this is what we'd be interested in. And we need to have that conversation back and forth because I think we're, our hearts are all in the right place to do the right thing. But we have, unless we're listening to each other, we're, we're just going to cross paths. So I, I encourage everyone to, to, to pay attention to what's going on in this type of, envir of environment listening sessions, being a part of the conversation, and we're, we're, we're just growing our, our, um, our, our capabilities and getting out and doing boots on the ground to actually go to the tribes and actually learn more about them that way. So we, we, we ask for your help in, 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 in helping us. So, but, but I think by just by meeting people and getting out there. So, so this is a conversation that we need to continue. Um, and some of the tribal engagement, exactly what I said, we've had listening sessions, but we've heard that we really do need to get to the, to the regions. We need to get, get to the tribes. We need to see what the, what the culture is. We need to see what the needs are. And we need to, to tell you what we think. You know, we need to, to exchange that information to see where there's a mutual benefit when there is one. So there's that. Um, I'm not going to go into this. Uh, this a like, huge portfolio. All that $9 billion is being done in, in multiple levels, multiple labs, multiple ways. Um, this is a very wonky thing saying that how, how we're feeding back and we're trying to learn from each other while we're moving forward in time and in, in, in technology maturity. Um, a couple of things on my office and I'll hand it off. I think I have, I have a little extra time because I'm doing two things. <laughs> so, and then I'll hand off to my, to my uh, the, the second thing I do is basically the hydrogen fuel cell technologies office. It has been like the flagship um, it, at the department for many years doing this. And it's, it's, it's kind of the, the central coordinator for a lot of the activities I described. And we look both at hydrogen technologies and fuel cell technologies and everything from production to storage and all of the things that are needed to, to get to the hubs. But, but, but you know, not only what we're doing today, but what's the next generation that could be cheaper and better. So everything in our office is, is everything I've described before. That's our mission, uh, clean energy, you know, all that stuff to, 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 to address national priorities and done it only in, in environment, but also environmental justice. Um, and, and job creation economics. So you know, we, we think that there's a big play here for hydrogen. And like I said, I've already talked about electrolysis. Fuel cells is, is opposite, right? You can actually combine 
the air with the, with the hydrogen and turn it into electricity. I just, I've mentioned it before, but just kind of let you know that they're kind of reverse processes of each other. This is a way you can turn the, the, the energy and hydrogen back into water. So that's kind of an interesting uh, play as well. Um, and, and we just have a lot of really good people working on it. I'm, not, I'm just gonna show that it only works when you bring people together from, from diverse communities and, and, and work on the problem. So we have these consortia. This is one example of these really great people working on specifically like some of the solar water splitting. Some of the really the best people in the world are, are getting together and actually collaborating. This is kind of a, a model that's really important to us. And I'm just going to throw an example. There's an electrolyzer consortium doing the same thing. And we're really trying to accelerate the, the progress there. There's a, there's a fuel cell consortium doing the same thing. And, and these are these, you know, if, if you're interested in any of these technologies, these are the people you go to. So they, they're the experts there. They're willing to talk to you and teach you about their technology as well. And, uh, you know, basically, we're, we're seeing the really the beginning of, of what we think is we would call the um, hydrogen. I'm not going to say explosion. That, that's, that's just a bad, bad, bad expression. <laughs> um, uh, the, so the, the, uh, you, you give me a word. <laughs> Anyway, but, but I mean, we're seeing what the, the, the successes to date are really starting to take off. We're seeing exponential growth, not only in the, in the, the suppliers, but also the demand. So we're, you know, we're, we're really touting a lot of the things that we've done, but there's just so much more to do. And that's why we're here. We work with the international community. Uh, it, it's not only in the United States, it's all over the place, right? This clean, the, 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 the GCEF, the Global Clean Energy uh, uh, Action Forum, I would say 80% of the discussion was about clean hydrogen when you went, when you went to like the 6,000 people that were talking about it. So we were really engaged with that. Um, in workforce development, we've got, we've got an international community that's bringing up the next brightest people and getting them excited about hydrogen, clean hydrogen. Uh, we expect, you know, if you're interested in this too, I think we want to reach out to all communities to get involved with this. Um, yeah, and I guess that's it for me. I do want to highlight that this October 8th, that's what, Saturday? is national it's officially national hydrogen and fuel cell day it was a congressional thing um we've been doing it for years now and, and i mean they, they they make me say this um the reason they picked up this date is because the atomic weight of hydrogen is 1.008 okay so that's 1008 is like the national hydrogen day and that's been that we're sticking with it um but anyway there's a lot of activities we actually started celebrating yesterday at work you know we had coffee hours we had happy hours we had drove you know ride and drives um it, it's going to go on through the whole week so if, if you're if you're not if you're really not doing anything on october 8th saturday you can take a take a moment to celebrate hydrogen day <laughs> all right uh and there's just a lot going on um we, we really appreciate that and, and in our office michelle fox has been brilliant uh in terms of reaching out to the communities i hope you've, you've talked to her uh she, she's in our office but she's also kind of broadly doe tribal um, uh, tribal contact and i'm going to turn it over now to bob who who has to do his 20 slides in like three minutes <laughs> so thanks bob no problem thanks eric here you go all right thank you hi i'm bob shrinking uh my division is called Hydrogen with Carbon Management in the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. And uh, so really, you know, we became the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management last year to emphasize the carbon management part of our portfolio. Um, we do support all the decarbonization goals shown, but really our mission is to minimize the impacts of fossil fuels and while we're working towards a net zero emissions economy by 2050. Uh, so we have a lot of technologies in our office. Uh, my colleague Mark Akevich will talk about all the carbon uh, management technologies. I'll be talking about the hydrogen technologies, but we do have point source carbon capture, hydrogen with carbon management, methane mitigation, uh, critical minerals production, CO2 transport storage, CO2 removal, hydrogen transport and storage. Uh, and CO2 removal is really a special uh, thing that we're working on to try to uh, address the accumulated CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. Um, we've published our strategic vision as well within the last year. Uh, it's available online. Uh, these are some of the main themes in it. I'll just talk a little bit about the uh, hydrogen and production investments we're making. So, so everything that we're looking at for hydrogen production from carbon-based feedstocks, it has to be coupled with carbon management. So we want to use responsibly sourced carbon-based feedstocks, so that could be responsibly sourced biomass, that could be uh, municipal solid waste, it could be unrecyclable plastics, it could even be legacy coal waste uh, to clean up uh, old uh, coal plant sites or old coal mining sites. All those are great uh, feedstocks to use for uh, producing uh, hydrogen from carbon-based feedstocks. 
Um, so uh, we're looking at some specific goals there. We're trying to, uh, we're doing a bunch of feed studies on uh, hydrogen production techniques. The goal there is to add CCUS uh, and, and achieve 95% uh, CO2 capture from those processes. Um, we're working on achieving the hydrogen shot cost goal of a dollar per kilogram hydrogen. Uh, one of our big efforts is looking at retrofit systems for hydrogen combustion in uh, gas turbines, uh, whether they're a simple cycle or combined cycle. Uh, gas turbines still make about 40% of the electricity in our country. Uh, Short-term decarbonization opportunities there with either carbon caption or, or hydrogen uh, combustion or, or combining both of those, to tell you the truth. Um, we're also looking at geologic storage of hydrogen and subsurface formations. Uh, there are, uh, I think, three existing salt caverns and two under construction in the U.S., but really so far that's the only geologic formation that's uh, been used for hydrogen storage. Eric talked about uh, how it's a very appealing long-term grid scale, 24-7 dispatchable energy storage medium, uh, but the uh, geology for storage doesn't exist throughout the U.S., so we're trying to characterize other uh, formations such as depleted oil and gas wells and determine their suitability for uh, hydrogen storage. Um, also looking at uh, transporting large volumes of hydrogen for, for these types of things will be used uh, pipelines. We have about 1,600 miles of pipelines in the U.S. right now, mostly in the Gulf Coast. So there is some experience with that. We have like 300,000 miles of natural gas transmission pipelines and like over a million miles of local distribution uh, networks. So we're working on what's the compatibility of hydrogen in those uh, natural gas grids. Uh, can we blend the hydrogen? How much hydrogen can we blend? What will we have to do to convert those over to 100% hydrogen capabilities? That's a big effort in our office as well. Um, so we do have two main programs in fossil energy and carbon management. Uh, the Advanced Energy and Hydrogen Systems, that's the division I am uh, leading right now. So our, uh, we, we have the advanced gasification program, advanced turbines, working on solid uh, oxide fuel cells and solid oxide electrolytic cells, and especially reversible architectures where they can do one or the other depending on, on grid systems. Our uh, natural gas technologies office is also looking at, uh, has a program for natural gas uh, to hydrogen right now. Um, and so they have, uh, they're, they're the ones that are looking at the natural gas pathways for, for clean hydrogen production and then to transport and storage of hydrogen source from natural gas since they're the office that looks at uh, pipelines right now. Uh, so briefly for the advanced turbines program, we really want to uh, achieve low NOx combustion, firing high, high quantities of, of hydrogen, you know, blends up to 100% hydrogen. Uh, we've made multiple awards within the last year on these uh, to OEMs. Uh, we're investing a lot of money here. We're, we're trying to find retrofit systems for existing units, whether they're the large utility scale gas turbines, uh, the smaller uh, aeroderivative types that are more typically simple cycle backup power. Uh, and even the small industrial gas turbines that, that might serve at refineries or compression stations and so forth. So we're working to decarbonize all of those through hydrogen firing. Um, I do want to mention we had a H2IQ hour webinar on hydrogen combustion with low NOx emissions in, hydrogen, in gas turbines. Uh, there's a link there. That uh, webinar will be available as a recording. Uh, I checked I don't, yesterday. I don't think it's quite live yet, but it will be posted in the upcoming uh, days or week. And so uh, if anyone's interested in hearing about that, they could uh, take a visit to that website. Uh, for gasification, we're really looking at modularization to achieve uh, fast construction schedules, to hopefully reduce capital costs. Um, and we're looking at a lot of waste feedstocks. Um, we're not, uh, we're not really looking at uh, coal gasification per se, but legacy coal waste. There are uh, hundreds of millions of tons of legacy coal waste, uh, millions of tons, not hundreds of millions of tons, sorry about that, uh, throughout the US, uh, Wyoming, uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, large deposits of coal waste uh, that are actually environmental hazards right now. Uh, so we could do some environmental cleanup and produce a useful uh, product by uh, by using those as a waste feedstock. Uh, unrecyclable plastics, you've seen the big uh, floating plastic island in the Pacific Ocean. That's a huge problem worldwide. 
Uh, so we're working on gasifying uh, those feedstocks. Uh, we're also looking to utilize biomass, uh, uh, regional opportunities for biomass, uh, what, what might be available, corn stover in the Midwest, forest residues in California, lots of different feedstocks that you can use to uh, get to a net zero carbon uh, footprint for your hydrogen produced from um, carbon-based feedstocks. Uh, solid oxide fuel cells, uh, we've done a lot of research on those in the past. Right now, our main goal, we're focused on field prototype testing of uh, reversible solid oxide fuel cells so we can demonstrate uh, operation in both directions, producing hydrogen and producing electricity. These are great for uh, data centers, uh, backup for hospitals, uh, various, uh, various applications. Uh, very good uh, application there for solid oxide fuel cells. Um, we do have some open hydrogen uh, FOAs right now in FECM. Um, we have this FOA 2400. I think this is the fourth release of it that's open right now. So we've made rewards under the first three releases. Now we're looking at advanced air separation uh, to reduce uh, gasification costs, uh, clean hydrogen production from natural gas. Uh, we're looking at uh, transport in pipelines, and we're looking at the under subsurface storage. So these are all open FOAs right now uh, that we're looking to uh, make awards under. Uh, we've made awards of uh, roughly $70 million uh, so far under uh, in the last two years for hydrogen, um, uh, solid oxide electrolysis cells. Uh, I mentioned the hydrogen combustion systems for gas turbines. We're also looking at ammonia combustion in gas turbines. Uh, it's a uh, easier to uh, transport uh, chemical. We do a lot of ammonia transport right now. Uh, not the uh, most, uh, uh, not the greatest fuel, uh, but we have uh, a lot of uh, really good researchers looking at ammonia combustion fundamentals and uh, some promising results already coming out on, on combusting those with uh, reasonable NOx levels. Um, we're looking at uh, doing uh, pre-feeds and feed studies for uh, hydrogen uh, production at uh, SMRs and even at autothermal reforming plants. Uh, and again, uh, various, uh, various opportunities for uh, waste materials. Uh, and then uh, we also uh, just made uh, awards for uh, turbine components to enable hydrogen firing and the higher temperatures within the turbine from that. Uh, my university turbine system research program, uh, we made eight awards on hydrogen fuels, ammonia fuels, and rotating detonation engines. Uh, again, even uh, last year we had a small uh, awards for, uh, for gasification of blended uh, waste feedstocks. And uh, we did make a large number of awards for solid oxide fuel cells uh, a little over a year ago. So we're working through those projects right now. Uh, $34 million. There are lots of developments. Those results will become available in the next uh, year and a half or so, and we'll be able to use those to guide our future investments in solid oxide fuel cells. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, this is just the one main thing I wanted to highlight from that. We've heard talk about the tax credit. Um, there are provisions for clean hydrogen up to a four kilogram of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen produced uh, Carbon intensity can qualify for this tax credit, so uh, so, so this will jumpstart both uh, the renewable-based and the uh, fossil-based hydrogen uh, system in the in the U.S. I believe uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law. We will have re uh, people talking about that later. Todd will talk about more detail about this, so that's just there for your retro reference. Uh, for our natural gas and hydrogen decarbonization technologies office. Uh, that's our uh, Office of Resource Sustainability. So they're the other side of the Office of uh, Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. Um, so they are looking at natural gas uh, confers and transportation and storage, as I mentioned before. Uh, so these are kind of the, the three pillars of their program, uh, bulk scale underground storage, large volume transport through pipelines, and then transformational concepts for uh, clean hydrogen production from uh, domestic natural gas resources. Um, a big part of this is the methane mitigation uh, program. That's a new division in FECM. Uh, methane is a very strong greenhouse gas and uh, a large part of the carbon intensity footprint of any natural gas based technology, whether it's a natural gas combined cycle power plant or a hydrogen producer from natural gas is based on the upstream emissions 
venting, flaring at the site of production, leakage from the pipelines and from compressor stations. This is a really big effort. This is going to have a large impact on uh, reducing the carbon intensity of any natural, uh, natural gas-based technology. Uh, they're looking at the different pathways other than the traditional steam methane reforming methane pyrolysis shows a lot of promise. Eric mentioned that earlier. Uh, we're even looking at some uh, chemical looping reforming uh, type concepts, uh, microwave or plasma assisted uh, conversion, whether gasification or reforming. So a lot of work going on in, in these future technology pathways. Uh, that will uh, need in the, need to be uh, implemented in the future to maintain uh, a low carbon uh, production of hydrogen. Uh, there's the natural gas pipeline transportation network I'd mentioned. You know, 300,000 miles of uh, of long distance transmission. Uh, we're looking at the materials there, their impact, uh, hydrogen's impact on those materials. Uh, if we're blending, how much blending can we handle in the existing system? What changes will need to be made if we were trying to convert the existing system over to uh, full hydrogen transportation? And then uh, a lot of it is uh, uh, leakage. Hydrogen, uh, there are some studies saying hydrogen is also potentially a greenhouse gas. So we're looking at advanced sensors for leakage uh, so that we can uh, quantify and uh, correct any leaks of hydrogen from, uh, from the infrastructure. Uh, and again, this is another slide there on just the goals and objectives of that in the interest of time, I'll skip past that. And our last uh, thing I wanna talk about is the subsurface hydrogen assessment, storage and technology acceleration program, Shasta. Three national labs are involved in that. Um, this is our, our big effort to open up the geology suitable for long-term hydrogen storage beyond uh, the existing uh, salt domes. Um, and we already talked about the open funding opportunity announcements, so I will now hand off to Mark. These are uh, links in this are all live, so there are plenty of resources in there for uh, people to find out more information if they're interested. Thank you very much. All right, let's make sure I can... Uh... Manage the clicker here. All right, great. So um, thanks, everyone. And uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is our carbon management technologies program uh, and just kind of give a general overview of some of the work that we, we have ongoing in this area. Um, just really quickly, uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. And these are just the provisions that are specific within the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. But we have it broken down into three areas. Um, one is on carbon dioxide removal. Uh, the other is carbon dioxide utilization and storage. And then finally, what we have is front end engineering design studies uh, specific to uh, it states carbon capture technologies, but it's actually transport and infrastructure. So um, that, starting with that one first, uh, it's 100 million for feed studies. Overall, cumulatively, this is 6.5 billion uh, coming through our office. Uh, on carbon dioxide removal, uh, there's a number of provisions for direct air capture, uh, three and a half billion for regional direct air capture hubs. And these are four hubs, uh, million tons per year uh, each. And uh, at least two of those have to be in uh, fossil energy uh, producing regions. In addition, we have a technology prize competition for direct air capture, uh, 100 million for commercial uh, technology prize and 15 million for a pre-commercial prize. And then finally, on the carbon dioxide utilization and storage um, area, we have our carbon storage validation and testing, which is two and a half billion. And this is primarily looking at kind of creating those carbon storage hubs uh, and really characterizing that resource um, and looking at it from, you know, large scale, not, you know, say maybe uh, a million tons or so it's, but it's looking at 50, at minimum 50 million tons um, over a, over about a 20 year or so time frame, uh, and, and that's just the, the minimum size of it. And then finally, a carbon utilization program, uh, 310 million, which uh, some of that is uh, R&D, but then also uh, looking at grant programs. So how can states, uh, other agencies um, that are interested in procuring products produced from CO2 uh, to really help drive and, and innovate that market and create that market demand side. So 
Um, so a number of different areas uh, in our program, but what I'll start doing is just kind of going through uh, our, a high level for the research within our within our portfolio. Uh, really breaking it down into a couple different areas, uh, reducing the cost of capture and increasing capture rates, uh, and looking at a broad number of sectors, uh, power industry, carbon dioxide removal, um, and looking at you know various design studies and, and demos. Uh, looking at the low carbon supply chains uh, through conversion. So how can we take CO2 that we've captured either from the atmosphere or from point sources and turn that into some type of product that has value, but also durably stores it for the long term. So, for example, can we create aggregates or building materials through mineralization processes? Um, can we convert it, say, coupling it with with uh, low carbon hydrogen and produce fuels and chemicals? Um, can we think about solid carbon products? You know, the the one uh, slide I think Eric showed with on the methane pro, uh, process, creating hydrogen, but then creating this solid carbon product. Are there things that we can then start thinking about how we're going to utilize that solid carbon product uh, as well? And then finally, looking at ways to optimize geologic storage operations. Um, and we have a number of areas here spanning all the way from R&D on modeling tools and capabilities, uh, monitoring technologies, all the way up through field scale work uh, through our Carbon Safe, which stands for Carbon Storage Assurance Facility Enterprise, and uh, our infrastructure partnerships as well. So uh, just kind of breaking these down into to, uh, areas, uh, looking at our point source capture, um, most of our areas that we've been focusing on historically had been lab and bench and small pilots, but we're really starting to graduate some of these technologies into uh, larger pilots and feed studies and really moving it towards uh, demonstration. Focusing on a diverse number of technologies uh, available some technologies that might work for power say may not work uh, as well for the industrial sector. So what are some of the those other technologies that might have applica application for specific industrial sectors are really looking at driving down the costs um, to really make this uh, uh, competitive out in the marketplace really looking to increase the capture rates as well. Uh, historically, most of the technologies today can do 90, 95%, but can we drive that over 95% to say 98, 99% uh, capture rates? Uh, are there, are, can we maximize co-benefits? Oftentimes when you're deploying these capture technologies, they require really low levels of things like sulfur uh, socks, nitrous oxides, particulate matter, mercury. So can it actually help address some of these other issues that you that you may have by driving down some of these other other pollutants? Um, looking at engineering based simulations, are there things that we can do uh, applying advanced tools such as artificial intelligence and machine learning to really help facilitate the, the deployment and optimization for these technologies uh, as well? And then finally, just looking at low carbon supply chains. So if we say couple with couple carbon capture at a cement plant, decarbonize that cement, but then create an aggregate material, say utilizing direct air capture, and then combining that aggregate and that cement, can we then go into say a negative concrete product? Um, so really trying to think about how we're thinking about uh, some of the supply chains. Uh, carbon dioxide uh, removal, uh, just some of the areas of, of interest. Uh, we're looking at biomass removal with carbon, uh, biomass with carbon removal and storage, direct air capture, uh, direct ocean capture and mineralization, really looking at things that are more on that science, uh, on that technology uh, based side, uh, as opposed to say some of the nature based uh, approaches. I think we need all of those approaches. There's other offices within DOE that we're collaborating on um, in some of our other areas. For example, uh, Eric mentioned the hydrogen shot. We have the carbon negative shot, which uh, launched, uh, I believe it was earlier uh, this this year, or it may have been last year too, I'm not quite, don't remember exactly. Um, it might be on the slide, but uh, but what we're really focusing on is less than $100 uh, per net metric ton CO2 equivalent um, for both the capture and storage. Um, looking at robust uh, accounting methods, really trying to understand and validate and verify and the the accounting for the for removing removal of co2 from the from the atmosphere 
um, high quality storage, uh, and looking really to advance this up to the, the gigaton scale. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at carbon removal today, uh, it's a very nascent industry, but are there things that we can do to really drive and, and, and move this forward over the next decade? Uh, looking at our carbon transport and storage R&D, and it's really an iterative process that we have towards uh, deployment where we have our storage infrastructure work, uh, which is shown on the left, and then our advanced storage R&D on the right, where we're applying some of the modeling tools and capabilities up front to understand what the geologic resource and capacity and capability is, uh, facilitating that into pro uh, projects that will do CO2 uh, injection testing some of those monitoring technologies that we developed, and then taking the data and information from these field operations uh, and, and, and feeding that back into our R&D process to really understand, are our tools uh, validating and, and, and providing the information uh, that, that we need uh, early in the process? So really looking at this, this iterative process, but I wanna focus a, a bit on our infrastructure because this is where we're really looking at some of the deployment work. Um, we have, as I mentioned, Carbon Safe, which is looking at validating these uh, large scale storage opportunities. Uh, we have regional initiatives, which are working within their particular regions and could be a resource uh, to some of the, the, the tribal entities here. Um, to really understand the storage opportunities and, and uh, capabilities uh, within their particular regions, leveraging some of the data uh, that's available. Uh, we're looking at offshore storage opportunities as, as well uh, in areas such as the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, brine extraction storage tests. Are there things that, say, if we bring brine uh, from a subsurface geologic formation, can we upgrade that brine into some type of usable uh, product? and even maybe extract some of the minerals from that, that brine that may have um, some potential applications or opportunities, whether that's say lithium or, or others that uh, might, have, might, might, might be available for some of the other technologies that we're thinking about uh, when we're thinking about the clean energy transition. Uh, and then finally, are there ways that we can transition some of the existing oil and gas infrastructure and assets, whether that's uh, pipelines, uh, facilities, wells, um, are there things that we can think about in terms of transitioning uh, some of this infrastructure? So uh, just to look at the regional initiatives uh, that we have, um, this it's very broad swath uh, that we have today, but these are some of the, the uh, organizations that, that are involved in. And these are the lead organizations. Many of these actually have dozens, say even hundreds or so uh, other entities and organizations involved um, through their, through their uh, regions. But really looking at promoting regional tech transfer, uh, addressing the certain technolo technological challenges that might exist within their regions, facilitating that data collection, sharing and analysis, really trying to identify what are some potential opportunities uh, within the regions themselves, and then also evaluating what the infrastructure needs might be. On our carbon conversion and utilization program, uh, mostly focused on R&D, uh, there's four um, areas here that we have, uh, looking at uptake through uh, algae and bioproducts, catalytic conversion, mineralization, and then a fourth one called physical services, which if those of you who are familiar with enhanced oil recovery, um, or CO2 carbonation for beverages, that's more the physical services. That's not where most any of our R&D is focused. Our R&D is focused on the three other areas because that's where we feel that DOE can, can actually have an impact with our, with our resources. Um, but really looking at a broad swath of, of challenges associated with uh, all of these areas, life cycle analysis, really important. Um, you know, trying to understand that the CO2 that we're utilizing in these processes, is it actually having a net climate benefit? Um, understanding the energy needs uh, for some of these pathways, for example, the catalytic conversion pathways, CO2 is a relatively stable molecule, really hard to uh, crack and convert that into other products. So really trying to understand and make sure that um, you know, the, understand the technologies and the approaches that we need to deploy if we're thinking about some of these pathways. 
So I'm um, going to dive into some of our funding opportunity announcements. But before I go into that a little bit, I just want to talk about the maybe the process flow a little bit in general. Um, and, you know, I think the first thing is just kind of, you know, follow the money. Uh, you know, all our all our opportunities uh, when we're thinking about our budget, uh, we put our budget requests out to Congress um, every year. And I know it's not the most uh, uh, sexy thing to do reading, you know, hundreds of pages of DOE budget documents, but it actually provides a lot of helpful and useful information um, on what DOE's interests are. Um, when we get the congressional, the reports back from Congress on our budgets, those provide a lot of insights uh, as well. So I think if you're really trying to understand where are, are the areas where DOE is potentially headed, say over the next year or two, uh, read the budget documents. Um, from that, we start our, our process of developing our funding opportunity announcements, uh, going through some of that might be releasing uh, requests for information or notices of intent, really trying to start build what we're thinking about in terms of our funding <coughs> opportunity announcements. Um, we put out the announcements, we go through a, a review and evaluation process, uh, really pay close attention to the merit <coughs> review criteria that, that are uh, included in those announcements. Then once we uh, go through that process and make selections, uh, selection, negotiation, um, and award, we understand working with the government, especially if it's the first time, is not always the, the easiest thing to, to do. But, you know, we, we definitely work. It's for, for us, we call them cooperative agreements, uh, which we work, work through uh, for a reason. It's because we want to work together um, on moving the, the projects forward that we're selecting. Uh, and then finally, advancing the technology. Um, you know, once we have all these uh, the agreements in place, it's really moving forward on the on the technology, monitoring progress, uh, reporting on progress, understanding if there are issues and challenges. What are the options on how to address those? Or, you know, it's if it's R and D, we know it's R and D. Maybe maybe just stop at that point too. So, um, just to kind of give a sense of what the the process and flow looks like. Uh, how to apply, uh, and, and again, this is just specific to our office uh, within fossil energy and carbon management, but I have, uh, we mo run most of our FOAs through the National Energy Technology Laboratory, uh, link to the website uh, is there. Uh, they're all listed. Um, there's certain requirements that you need to uh, register on certain sites for, uh, to, to be able to access and submit information. Um, but then ultimately it's uh, prepare and submit the, the applications. So uh, just looking at some of the, the uh, current FOAs that, that are out and, and some of these, um, yeah, these are the FECM. Uh, we have one on carbon management, looking at a number of different areas of interest. Uh, we have, uh, it's, it's looking at carbon dioxide removal coupled with conversion and then also uh, carbon dioxide removal from uh, ocean 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 based systems. Uh, we have a storage validation uh, and testing uh, carbon safe uh, FOA that's out right now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is showing the areas of interest that that we currently have. Uh, we ran a previous FOA earlier th uh, this in F fiscal year 22 that looked at carbon safe phases one and two. Uh, when we're thinking about the phases of carbon safe, phase one is really trying to look at, you know, just general feasibility. What's your plan? Uh, not really going to do any drilling of wells or anything, but basing it off of existing geologic data. Phase two might be some drilling of, of wells, collect data, expand upon what you had in phase one. Uh, phase three is really starting to move and move it down towards that permitting process uh, and working with EPA on um, getting the authorization to construct the injection well. And then finally, phase four is looking at, okay, we've done all the work, we have the authorization to construct the well, we construct the well, and then ultimately getting to the EPA authorization to inject uh, CO2 within that well. And then uh, the final FOA is a front end engineering design studies uh, for CO2 transport. Um, right now, uh, that FOA is uh, currently uh, available and it's primarily looking at pipelines uh, for, for CO2 transport. 
Uh, these are some of the FOAs that we've, or the FOA that we've worked uh, in collaboration with OCED. Uh, just highlighting the areas of interest uh, that, that are in that FOA. And then uh, I'm not going to go through through this one in detail, but I just wanted to show it uh, for everyone. It's basically just kind of a nice table, I think, summarizing the FOA, the open and closing dates. I think most of these are closing end of November, beginning of December uh, time frame, and then, then just showing some of the DOE funding that's available. Um, and again, all this information is within the, the funding opportunity announcements, but I thought this just might be a nice way to, to kind of show it uh, succinctly uh, the, the work that we have going right now. So uh, just talking about some other resources and opportunities for engagement. Um, Eric mentioned hydrogen matchmaker. We have a DOE carbon, we have a carbon matchmaker. Uh, you know, we like their idea so much, we said, hey, we need one of those. So uh, it's really trying to, um, a very similar uh, approach, self-identify, uh, include your information, but really trying to match up those CO2 sources, whether those are point sources, carbon dioxide removal, the infrastructure side of it with pipelines, the carbon storage um, participants. So really trying to kind of pull this and create that community um, together and uh, looking at ways that we can maybe help facilitate some of the connections uh, between point sources and, and sinks. Uh, we have our annual carbon management meeting, great opportunity to really engage with those uh, uh, in the DOE portfolio. Every one of our projects uh, that's currently active presents. Uh, we've had over 700 registrants for the event this past year uh, that occurred in August. Um, but it also gets a lot of interest from other federal agencies, uh, international. Uh, it's excellent opportunities to network and build relationships. Uh, we have all the information posted on the website. So if you want to see uh, what sort of projects have presented, or who might be, say, working in particular areas that you're interested in. Uh, all of that information is uh, available on the website. Um, before I get into the Mickey Leland, I do want to, uh, Eric mentioned the, the hydrogen day. We did actually do a carbon management day last year, and in true fashion, we did the atomic weight of carbon, which is 12.01. So <laughs> take a guess what day that was on. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but one final uh, thing that I want to mention is um, an opportunity is something that we call the Mickey Leland Energy Fellowship. And it's a, it's a 10 week summer uh, program where we have students come in, work at DOE. Some of the national labs are involved as well. So some of the students will actually work in the national labs. Uh, it's a 10 week uh, hands-on experience uh you know really looking to complement the field of study that students are working in and to try and give them that you know that experience of you know working in this type of environment working in you know the field that they might be interested in um and you know just uh building building some of those connections uh within the department as as well and helping build some of their non-technical skills uh they have to give a presentation at the end uh, of the of the um, at the end of the summer, at the end of their their uh, uh, internship, uh, they're presenting to all of their colleagues that they've been going through the program with. Uh, there's typically weekly uh, engagement and reporting that they'll do with whoever their mentor is. So it's just a really good opportunity, I think, to to engage uh, the, the the next generation. Uh, stipend to it. Um, it's open to undergrads, uh, master's students. Uh, and the great thing is uh, it's open right now and the deadline to apply is uh, January of 2023. So, uh, and I have the contacts listed there as well. So again, just another opportunity uh, to, to engage with the department. And uh, just some contacts uh, for myself, Bob, and our tribal point of contact, uh, Joe Giovi, who I know was here uh, earlier, uh, um, yesterday and I believe uh, earlier today as well. So with that, um, we'll move on and uh, thank you. Good to be here. My name is Todd Schrader from Office of uh, Clean Energy Demonstrations. 
and I am in the enviable position of last presentation before the end of the day, so I understand the pressure associated with that and only have a few slides to go through. Um, so a little about how we are formed. Brand new office within DOE, um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in general, the, the International Energy Agency says we need $90 billion in infrastructure to reach the goals of decarbonization, zero emissions by 2050, $90 billion in demonstration projects across the world. Uh, I believe there's been international commitments to get to that were announced by the Secretary a couple of weeks ago at the uh, Global Clean Energy Action Forum. So it's good news. This is a, uh, an effort being taken not, by, not just by this country, but by uh, the entire international community going forward. Uh, as we mentioned, a, a couple of the key legislation pieces, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act uh, set up many of the activities uh, we're talking about. I believe the department as a whole uh, received uh, over $60 billion spread throughout all of our programs. Uh, about $25 billion of that came to the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations uh, for, for different projects I'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, our job is to accelerate market adoption of these technologies uh, moving forward. Uh, you know, to get to these goals of decarbonizing the electric grid by 2035 and, and, and net zero emissions by 2050, uh, $60 billion, $90 billion, $25 billion, all sound like very big numbers. They're dropping the bucket. It, it probably will cost something like $2 trillion to get to that point. Uh, and, and that means industry, that means everyone, the government alone can't do that. And so we're very much trying to understand how to spur industry forward and, and our office in particular is trying to address uh, those issues as we move forward. Our mission, uh, we're a government agency, so we have to have a mission statement. I think it's, I think it's in the constitution maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it's pretty straightforward, deliver clean energy, uh, technology demonstration projects at scale. Uh, and so these are big, large projects uh, we're moving towards uh, in partnership with the private sector. Again, these are, you heard the term earlier, cooperative agreements. These are cooperative agreements. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, accelerate deployment, market adoption, uh, and, and a very important piece, equitable transition. Uh, too often in the past, uh, communities have been left behind uh, when, when these efforts have been undertaken and you know this was touched on earlier it, it's very much a focus of our office very much a focus of the administration uh to ensure everyone uh, benefits from these uh efforts going forward and frankly all hands on deck are needed we need everyone involved in this um just a little bit more about our mandates a little bit of an eye chart but uh just kind of the things we we look at uh, within OSED. uh we serve as project management center of excellence, uh, and I should say specifically project management oversight. Uh, the projects themselves as they're being built will be managed by the applicants or, or the developers. Uh, once chosen, uh, the government will be doing project management oversight. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, what that means um, going forward. Uh, clean and equitable, clean energy, equitable transition. Again, uh, Justice 40 uh, initiative uh, and efforts very much apply to what we're doing. It also means understanding the needs of, uh, and um, um, questions from stakeholders, engaging stakeholders, uh, uh, engaging tribal nations. Very important piece of what we're trying to do uh, moving forward uh, as we develop these different projects as they go through the different pieces of the uh, development process. Uh, again, I mentioned unlocking uh, scale, the trillion dollars of private equity we need, uh, de-risking technology, you know, how do we keep moving it forward through uh, full commercialization, uh, and engagement and outreach. Uh, I think earlier today, or perhaps it was yesterday, our new director, David Crane, I think was here uh, very much. He is uh, uh, talking about how do we engage uh, all who are, can benefit from these and all who we need to partner with in taking these projects forward. Um, you, you heard a little bit, uh, there was a couple of slides on technology readiness level. Uh, so where do we fit in and, and how do we partner with the rest of our, uh, of the agency? You know, we, we very much are partnering with FECM, with EERE, uh, with Office of Nuclear Energy, Office of uh, Electricity. Um, it, it's gonna take all of DOE to move these efforts forward. 
uh, as was mentioned earlier, and, and I, I fully second, we have world-class labs, absolute world-class labs uh, and cap capabilities. We are extremely good at moving things through uh, TRL one to two, three, four, five, up through the pilot scales. Uh, we haven't ever invested heavily in the demonstration levels. There's been some demonstration scale projects and in different, different parts of the department has have done some of that work, but, but there's never been an office specifically focused on that. And so that's where OSED was formed to kind of keep moving the projects through TRL six, seven, through the demonstration scale up to uh, potentially commercial uh, or just under commercial scale. Loan program office is a, is a late TRL program within the department to, to bring them over the line to full uh, commercial operation. Uh, that's this area, this market risk area is often called the valley of death. Uh, by an investment community you know the technology is is w understood enough that you know we can build a pilot plant but <laughs> private industry doesn't fully trust that it can be scaled up into a profitable entity at the end and so they're hesitant to fund it so that's where we come in in this market uh, to eliminate this market risk or address it again 50 percent cost share no expectation uh, that the money get paid back uh, due to cooperative agreements, I should say up to 50 percent. Uh, it, it depends, um, you know, how negotiations go and things like that uh, for our program. Uh, Move forward, uh, and then oversight of those as they as they move through the process. Uh, again, a bit of an eye chart, and, and I, I won't go through a lot of this, but the way we're approaching project management oversight. Um, is trying to define what we expect for good projects. You know, these projects uh, will be upwards of two and a half to three billion dollars. Uh, I would not be surprised when it's all said that in some of our some of our different technologies out there. So uh, these are expected to be uh, very well run projects. You know, strong um, uh, project management oversight, strong project management teams, and frankly, strong financing that comes behind it. Again. We may be providing up to 50%, but that means an applicant has to come in with, in some cases, upwards of a billion dollars uh, on their side. And so uh, we're going to look across the board uh, at, at uh, the projects. Um, you know, if you look down that line, th these are on the, or the uh, vertical side there, uh, fa fairly common project management type areas that get looked at throughout industry, engineering procurement, business development, I mentioned permitting safety, uh, the bottom one, technical data analysis, does it meet uh, your, your carbon reduction goals, you know, is it viable? The new one there is community engagement and impacts. Uh, certainly, again, very important piece of what we're doing is understanding the needs of, of the communities where these projects are going and understanding how those communities can benefit from these projects as they move forward. Uh, and so there's a, quite a bit of requirements within the um, forward that talk about this, various fellows. Uh, other piece we have, of course, going across the top is uh, funding will not all go out at once. There'll be some go, no go decision points. Uh, you know, my uh, sort of my experience is the vast majority of the funding is actually in that third phase construction. As you can imagine, it's design permitting to get to that point. Uh, you also note an operations or a ramp up an operations phase, we would anticipate being involved for a few years of operation. Uh, one, to um, sure we, ensure we get through the ramp up piece, and two, to understand what data we can collect and, and lessons learned. Uh, you know, earlier you saw uh, the, the virtuous circle, so to speak, of uh, going through the FOAs, the feedback in R&D. We very much want to do that. What can we learn at the demonstration scale that we realize we need some more research and development on? And so we feed back into the applied programs, uh, the, the information we learn, and vice versa, what can we feed the industry? What can we give them to ensure that these are um, uh, profitable uh, entities moving forward? So hydrogen hubs, uh, I can't talk huge amount of them because the FOA is out, but uh, the FOA itself describes these six to 10 regional clean hydrogen hubs uh, across the country. The bill language itself had requirements about feedstock diversity, meaning it had to come from, the power had to come from a number of different sources, nuclear, fossil, renewable, uh, in use diversity, uh, different uses for the hydrogen on the backside uh, as it's produced, uh, geographic diversity, you know, spread across the country uh, as we, uh, as these are developed, and employment and training, and this in particular gets at this community benefits. 
is the community benefiting, the local community benefiting? Uh, and, and local, obviously, with very big projects, uh, is, is, can be a very large size, so to speak, uh, going forward. Current status, again, the, the FOA was announced uh, by the Secretary at the Global Clean Energy Action Forum a couple weeks ago. Um, you can see there the uh, concept papers are due November 7th, full applications April 7th. Uh, and then the awards, six to 10 awards uh, ranging, and this is the government cost share, 400 million to $1.2 billion. Again, that would translate into the high end, a two and a half billion dollar uh, project cost uh, as we move forward. Uh, last thing I'll mention, I, I'll just second a couple things that were said earlier. Um, you know, this is the department as a whole working together. Uh, and so all of these pieces are, are fitting together and coming together. You know, the, the draft clean hydrogen production standard uh, is out. It was issued last week, too, and that, that has goals for driving down uh, the amount of CO2 related to the production of uh, hydrogen, I believe the initial goal is four kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of hydrogen, driving down to an eventual goal of two uh, moving forward. And so we see all of these efforts as, as working towards that. And then of course the draft national clean hydrogen strategy and roadmap that was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, there are open comment periods for each. I think the comment period on the hydrogen production standard closes October 20th, I believe it is, um, uh, moving forward. So. Uh, again, you know, we, we each have our, our jobs and we each have our own offices, but we're all working together ultimately on these uh, efforts moving forward. Um, I'll mention one last piece here. There's, there's the contact information. You know, I, 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 I talked about clean energy, or I'm sorry, uh, hydrogen hubs. Uh, and, and that is, you know, up, you know, $7 billion FOA up to $8 billion uh, appropriated to us. There are other opportunities uh, within the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, uh, other FOAs that are under development, under funding opportunities that are gonna come out, uh, rural and remote uh, lands, how, how can we uh, improve energy in rural and remote areas, uh, abandoned mine lands, uh, carbon capture was mentioned earlier where we're working in partnership with FECM and, and NETL uh, on some of those uh, uh, efforts, uh, industrial decarbonization, how do you make processes at different uh, industries cleaner. I think we talked about cement earlier. Uh, there's opportunities there. Uh, we're in the reactor business. Uh, two of the projects we're working on are, are small module reactors, advanced uh, reactors out, out west, one in Wyoming, one in Washington, uh, moving forward. Uh, and long, dur long duration energy storage. There, there's going to be opportunities for that also. So, um, you know, I encourage you to look at the OSED website. Uh, there's numerous different, I think, funding opportunities coming. Uh, I would I, Encourage to look at all of DOE. I, I, I think there's probably slots that everyone can fit in. You know, certainly some of the perhaps OSID pieces are, are, are fairly large financial commitment. Not everyone's going to be able to get into that area. Um, but I think the uh, you know the continuum that we talked about, the R D D and D. I think there's opportunities across that uh, to bring this together. Um, so uh, my last point I will make is. Uh, and I should have put the old uh, picture of Uncle Sam with the finger saying, we need you. Um, we have lots of opportunities for reviewers. You know, one of the things we have is merit reviewers. I think it was shown in the forward development slide earlier, uh, the need for outside experts to come in and help us. So there's going to be lots of opportunities for that. Exchange has that. And, and we want people, you know, with all different skill sets, with all different backgrounds to come help us. Uh, review the uh, the applications as they come in. Um, there are also obviously the application itself. You can apply there. And then lastly, and this is a personal plug, uh, we need to hire people. Uh, OSED itself has a uh, headcount of uh, upwards of 300 federal employees. My office, project management, has 135 slots to fill. I think I'm at 20, 25 now. Uh, so uh, uh, we have some direct hire authorities. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunities. We do have some remote work uh, uh, possibilities out there. Uh, so I, I think it'd be exciting, uh, you know, and, and I think I'm speaking for the whole department. Lots of what we do is exciting, but uh, I certainly encourage if you're interested in this area, either merit reviews, uh, perhaps employment opportunities, uh, certainly uh, let us know and uh, maybe we can move forward. So with that, I will turn it back over. Are we doing Q&A, a little bit of Q&A? Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, gentlemen. That was uh, very enlightening. I'm, I'm Jim Reed with National Conference of State Legislatures. We're the group, uh, the team that's helping DOE put on this conference. And uh, uh, Derek Watchman had to step away for uh, another commitment. So I'm going to run the Q&A. But uh, I know we're getting near the end of our day. At, at 5, we're going to have the closing. So I would really encourage everyone to stick around for that. We're going to have the uh, uh, retiring of the colors. We're going to have a traditional uh, closing. And uh, we're also going to get a summary of the meeting uh, from uh, Director Johns, so please stick around for that. And I know you, you all are the, uh, um, the the hardcore attendees, so I appreciate all of you sticking around. We do have a few um, some time for questions, and so uh, I'll um, uh, I'll call on folks. And if you would uh, state your name and affiliation, and you know which uh, panelist you'd like to uh, hear from. So, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Harris. I'm with uh, KFOX Corporation and Connecticut New the tribal community in the Wasilla Anchorage area. I understood that helium made people talk higher, but I had no idea hydrogen made you talk faster. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to keep up. Uh, that said, uh, we're sitting on a, in, in the Wasilla area, we're sitting on a very unique uh, geological structure. And that is a subduction zone uh, with 12 layers of coal that are turning earthward at a uh, fault line site called the Castle Mountain Fault. As a direct result of that, we have compressed coal fields going down 8,000 feet plus that are uh, saline and uh, driven as well. Uh, in 1970s uh, and earlier on, they discovered that this was the highest concentration of coal bed methane uh, in Alaska. And it, every earthquake that we have, it gets uh, more, more uh, profound. That said, um, we are in discussions with a company that wants to do an ammonia plant on the site. It's got road corridors, rail corridors, power corridors, and access to four deep water ports. Uh, and the largest population in the Alaska is directly adjacent. Uh, we're uh, thrilled at the opportunity of it being a, a, an ammonia plant for a number of reasons. One, it allows us to do direct injection uh, of uh, that coal, or excuse me, the carbon right back into the field. What can we do to make this, uh, and obviously we're not going to get an application in by November 7th of 2022, but how, how do we as a community work with your agency to uh, bring this project forward. We, we understand that they are, there's interest in uh, this ammonia from Japan to uh, Los Angeles. So I'll leave that question to you. How do, how do we make ourselves available to your resources? Gentlemen, who start? I'll start. Thank you for the question. And I, I, I don't know if this works, but I think it does. Um, you know, one of the things is you, you've described a really kind of a unique situation and environment, and, that, and that's kind of where, you know, from the hydrogen point of view, that's what we're really looking for is those unique regional opportunities that have opportunities for, for resources, but potential storage and potential, like you say, corridors for markets. Um, I, I think ammonia, as, as I mentioned, is one of the early takers that we're seeing a lot of excitement in the green ammonia field, uh, not only for, for fertilizers, but like, but I think you've mentioned also there's a potential for Bunker fuel replacement, there's a lot of discussions around large application spaces for clean, clean ammonia, right? Um, and, and we're also seeing, I think you mentioned some of the corridors, but the international trade opportunities as well. So I think I'm really excited that, you know, that your, your particular uh, geological location and, and resources kind of are amenable to that concept, right? And, 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 that, and that's a paradigm we want to, we explore not only within our uh, DOE, but also with industry to see where those markets are opening up and see who do we get the shippers to actually start buying into these communities. And so, so I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying, and I wanted to pass it off to the FECM in terms of the unique ge geology uh, that you described. I think that's more in your in your field, but I think in terms of the actual market opportunities, I think you're in the absolute right space in terms of the green ammonia because that 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 field is is, is growing and it really does depend on on the clean source of hydrogen that you use to make that ammonia. So I, I just want to offer you with that encouragement and then hand you off to the technology people who know more about the subsurface work that you described. Yeah. So so maybe um, a couple thoughts. Uh, you know, if you're and I don't know what scale or 
that you've done the project that if you've done like feed studies already, um, you know, for the for the project or not, or have actually done like a lot of the geologic storage characterization. Um, but what I mentioned with the carbon safe um, initiative, like that might present opportunities for you, if not now, potentially in the future um, as well. Uh, I think loan program office is is another uh, if, if you're thinking about the funding part of it, um, there's a loan program office, but there's also um, US, the US Department of Agriculture has um, some of their rural programs actually have a loan uh, authority as well. And there's some differences between the DOE loan program office and the scale and the TRL level for the technologies or like if, if it's serial like one, two or three and there's people from LPO who can probably speak more to this but. Um, but like USDA has I think more flexibility in looking at commercially available technologies and what they can provide loans to um, as well, so those are just some of the general thoughts and ideas I think that came to my mind on what if you're looking at the financing side of how that could potentially help with the project. Yeah, I'll just add that um, only concept papers are due November 7th, so it's not a full application. Uh, so I encourage you to, to think about that as well, because this seems like that might be a nice, uh, a smaller hub opportunity. Again, um, very uh, regional and, and very specific. So those are the kind of things we're looking for. Um, so so don't, don't dismiss the hub application just yet. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, yes, question here. All right, thanks. Um, I'm Angel Wildman from Southwest Research Institute, and I've been following your FOAs and the other opportunities that have been coming out and um, listening to you walk through them today. They, they don't seem maybe as accessible to the tribes as some of the other types of FOAs, and I was wondering how do you envision the tribes getting involved with these opportunities or maybe directly benefiting from them? I'll start. You know, yeah. that's, um, but this is, I mean, that, that's actually the, the essential question for today, right? Um, as, as we started um, developing our, our solicitations and we started developing our, our cross office programs uh, and, and addressing the EJ40 priorities that are our national priority, that, that's what we realized that we, we needed to have these soliciting sessions. It's not only um, that we have to build communities up to understand what a solicitation is i mean and how to apply to them there, there are people who do this all the time that have gotten good at it because they just have had that opportunity we recognize that this is a unique time that a part of our listening session a part of the, what the boots on the ground has to be to educate the tribes how we do stuff you know how do we what's expected in a solicitation how can we help with that in some in some ways the national labs are set up to help that as a, as a technology assistance, we're looking at every opportunity to get into the field to make sure that that's well understood. I mean, it's, it's, it, we have, it, it is a, um, a sort of a chicken and egg thing, but we really need to crack that up front. We really need to get into the communities and, and make them aware of the opportunities and how they apply to it, but also get them excited about the technologies and the resources they bring to the table. So uh, everything you said is, is, is really kind of near and dear to our hearts. And that's why we're having these sessions and the listening sessions we've had with the tribes. How do we do that? How do we how do we set up education technical assistance to get people up to speed to where other people have been doing for many years? So you know, any help that we, we can be uh, you can provide us educate us is, is really greatly appreciated and much needed at this point. Other other comments from the panel. Thank, thank you, Eric. Um, Dottie. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dottie Lee with Trans-Pacific Communications. Uh, my question has to do with anybody who's on the panel who has a footprint in the international space, Todd and others. Um, as, as you work in the international space, my company uh, handles cross-cultural communications work by providing translation and interpretation, including 200 plus languages, uh, tribal and uh, indigenous languages included. So how could we be of service to you all as you work in the international space, um, trying to overcome cross-cultural barriers and linguistic barriers and, and through translation and interpretation? We're at an 8 a firm, women-owned, Asian-owned, uh, EDWOSB, all that good uh, government uh, 
um, acronyms. Thank you. So that's a that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I and and I don't know about the 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 other panelists. Um, most of our work when we're deal, working internationally is very focused on the technical side. Um, when we're thinking about yeah, so when when we're thinking about the um, those like translational type services, it's probably something that we actually work more through like the embassy or State Department. Um, so I don't know. It's not necessarily like where DOE I think has like if we're if we're going to need that type of service, we're, we're, the first place we're going to go to is State Department because they're the ones they're the the lead for our our foreign engagement. Um, so I don't know if that's uh, that might be the primary direction that I would that I would look at as opposed to say DOE itself. Fair enough. State Department is a client of ours. We translate for the State Department, and we just provide a translation and simultaneous interpretation for the departments just this week, uh, okay. not too long ago. Okay. Thank you. Can I add? Uh, you know, thank you for the comment. Um, it, it it occurs that. To me that the cultural translation that you mentioned you know i have, certainly there's an international play there and we do work internationally but i think maybe that's really more relevant to the cultural translation for the tribe engagements i just described recently or in the previous question so i think we need to be looking at that because we understand that that's a barrier to even applying to these and to being a part of our, our research community as well so you know i, I look forward to, to future discussions on that thank you Great, thank you. Um, follow, yes, sir. Follow on questions yes, and comments. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to imply we were looking for financing. But we, we have investors ready to go. Uh, since it's it's a naturally fracking, uh, the site is, um, we're looking for how to uh, do the decarbonization side of the equation. The market's already there for the ammonia. Uh, but uh, the question would be, um, we want to, we saw many in your 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 presentation of things we hadn't thought about before that could add further value and since the the, the nut is already covered um it, it uh it appears that there is some natural completing interests here and uh so uh, i'm hoping that we can visit with you and we'll turn our our, our attention to your team say okay how can we uh, make this uh a, a more exciting project for our entire community. So, and uh, in terms of size, it's one T plus. So it's a fairly large resource, much more than we can use locally. Thank you. So, so our Office of Resource Sustainability has, they're the natural gas based technology, hydrogen conversion uh, people. They're just starting to look at coal bed methane. So. Uh, this might be good timing, so I want to talk to you after this. Okay. Uh, oh, in, in addition, it's a, a geothermal source as well, so as you can imagine. Well, sounds like a potential yeah. hybrid energy system. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you for that discussion. Um, I think we'll leave it there for this panel, um, but I would um, encourage you, we'll, we'll take a break here shortly, but I would encourage you to come back and, and be in the room at 5 o'clock for our closing uh, there are more cookies in the back of the room and, and coffee uh, is still uh, running so please avail yourself of that but before we go let's give our panel of eric bob mark and todd uh, a big hand thank you thank you, thank you. see you at five o'clock thanks well you guys you guys drilled down. I was waiting to say that. A lot of good detail. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yes, hello.
Giles. Oh, 
All right. We're going to get started with the closing. So um, just want to say my deep appreciation for um, our relatives that uh, began this uh, the opening has got away and even the um, Anna Costin and many other uh, tribal nations that whose land we're on and just want a um, deep appreciation. Uh, I recently moved here to Washington DC and it's always I, I tell um, our staff too to learn when we do travel uh, to you know it's good to know whose land we're on and and that's like that all over the world. So I just want to say yeah um, to that and then that opening. And then we're coming to the end of our uh, two days here. And it's been such an honor to be in dialogue with all of you and to hear the conversations and to hear the excitement that came from the different sessions um, in the tribal leaders track and then here in the you know public a stakeholders track that there's a lot of information that was shared um, again just the panel right before it's very technical this 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 information and it's there's a lot of investment in in what they were discussing and to me i was trying to figure out what is how do we translate this so you know uh, even in, if we're working with uh, nations that predominantly speak in their own language and and this is you know something that i'm really advocating for is that communication that translation that understanding because i know we can do better as a federal government and i i think being in the tribal leaders caucus just what i heard um there's still a lot of action and follow-up that uh, we have to do as a federal government. And so I just want to say thank you, uh, tribal leaders, for traveling very far from your home to be here these past two days and give you um, good blessings to go home and that to your family and your land and your community. And that, um, you know, this is the beginning of a partnership, a relationship, and hope that um, we, uh, this will seed so many beautiful. Um, uh, projects, beautiful, uh, sustain um, economy and jobs and uh, also energy and all the things that we're trying to attain. And um, but I, I just reflecting on the past two days and hearing so many good responses from people and saying that they appreciate the, the agenda and how it was structured and also indigenous collaborations. Can we get a round of applause for them? You know, we, we really want to support indigenous led businesses too and native businesses. And so they've been working in the community and um, nations facilitating. And it's unique to see how their process is. And, um, but also want to give thanks to Derek Watchman, who facilitated this room today. He's back there. Round of applause for him. And uh, NCSL uh, as well, I want to acknowledge all the staff. If you can stand up, we can give you a round of applause. All right. They've been supporting many of the summits, and so they, they taught me a lot, even as we were pulling this together. So just appreciate all the work that you've put in 
to make this a, su a success. Um, and then also want to acknowledge my team. Could you stand up, stand up please? The Office of Indian Energy is here. We have three offices, one in Alaska, Golden, Colorado, and then here in DC. And then I also acknowledge David Conrad, Deputy Director, he's back there. And then Congressional Inter Intergovernmental Affairs, Matt Dannenberg, and Jennifer Cram. Um, yes, and, and then so many others, but I think the, um, it's been such a pleasure working with you, Matt, and, and David, and Jennifer, in pulling this together. And um, I can't, yeah, I'm really happy. And again, we have a lot of uh, follow-up that we need to do. and and how to get this done quick. Um, you know, we're here, I'm here for uh, less than two years. So, you know, and we want to see these seeds grow. So I, I'm wanting to continue. I think if you don't have my contact information, I'll make sure to give you my card after this. And um, yeah, so let's, uh, I wanna welcome uh, Bobby Gonzalez. He's the chairman of the Caddo Nation to give the traditional um, blessing, and if you can come up here, I'm not sure where you, I see you. There you are. And also, thank you for um, leaders for stepping up and offering words of encouragement and blessing. So that's something that um, gives us uh, a lot of hope and continuation and, and makes us feel good. So thank you for the ones that did offer prayer and that we did not acknowledge to. You can please stand. I'm just glad to be here. I just wanna say something before I say a word of prayer. Um, you know, we have these flags here and this POW flag in our warriors and our people, regardless of what ethnicity you are. Our Native American people has put on this uh, warrior shield and went to battle more than any other group in, in North America when it comes to protecting our lands, and we know that. But at the same time, brothers in arms, you know, regardless of ethnicity, they've always uh, battled together, died together, came home together. So we wanted to leave these flags and we have, uh, uh, the color guard that's going to retrieve these flags after I pray. And I just ask that you can continue to stand until the flags are retrieved and and uh, and, and taken back to where they're going to be in an inappropriate way. So just bear with me for a moment. <clears throat> I'm going to pray in uh, uh, our native language and finish it up in English. And so I uh, appreciate being here again. Almighty God, your Lord and Savior, Almighty God, you have a lot of names. All these souls and these people here, Almighty God, from the soles of their feet to the crown of their heads, wherever they go in their life, however they make their life, Wherever they uh, go from here, the second, the moment that they leave their soul, their heart, their mind, their spirit, Almighty God, that you can be with them and uh, take care of their prayers, their loved ones, their uh, folks, Almighty God, their prayers, the people that they left at home. Maybe there's something that may not just be right in their home, that when they get home, that it, it'll be better than uh, when they left, Almighty God. The creator that you are, that you brought us together, we have to understand that in this world of things that we do among people, that this is your land, this is your the earth that you created. You only created one earth, Almighty God, Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ. You have a lot of names. A lot of people call you different things around the world, but there is only you, Almighty God, that we know of. Gwanakai, the great doctor, Ahio. Look at us. 
As we make decisions related to this land, let us give back to it. But at the same time, we know that we take without asking sometimes, God, Father, you be with everyone in here, their souls, their minds, their spirits. Let us go back to our villages and our homes and our places and our elders and our children and grandchildren and those that we love. Share with one another the good things, something to eat, something to drink, and, and stay positive in our ways, Almighty God. Bless our traditional people and those that take care of our traditional things. Those that are in harm's way, Almighty God, and these soldiers, Almighty God, around the world, you can bless them and watch over them and bring them home to their loved ones so that they can be okay and they can live a happy, humble life, Almighty God. This building here, Almighty God, all the people that has worked at putting this conference together, Almighty God, from the ones that serve food, from the ones that took the trash out, even all the, everything that went above, took place here, Almighty God. You must bless them in a good way, take care of them, be with them, watch over them. Help them, Almighty God, to understand your will. And Lord God, when we don't understand and we walk away from you, pity our prayers and help us to understand you. If I said anything wrong, done anything wrong here, Almighty God, you take care of it. And these things, all I, all I say, Almighty God, is holy. I have a lot of love and compassion to understand to be a human being on this earth. Almighty God, take care of our Alaskan tribes, our villages, Almighty God, our people, our people here in the lower 48, Almighty God, all our tribes and all our people around the world, in this world, that it can find peace and it can find harmony and that we can love to learn and love one another as human beings across the world. And these little orphans and these children in this water, you take care of it so it can always be here for our children. Through your son, I pray. Amen. And that concludes our 2022 Tribal Clean Energy Summit. Thank you so much.